Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Trust the Day of KDD 2021. My name is Fei Zhu. I'm the co-organizer of this uh, Trust the Day. I'm the conference and the conference co-chair for KDD 2021. I'm here with Mike Zella and Prof. Jen Pei. We are both the organizer of this conference of this Trust the Day. So um, welcome to this uh, special theme day of KDD 2021, which is new this year. And let me share a little bit background why we want to organize this special day. Now, um, increasingly in today's world, we are feeling that um, today's computing is characterized by you know, a great level of complexity and the comprehensiveness and the collaboration. You know, when we look at complexity, we are talking about huge machine learning models with and the billions of parameters and very complicated structures that is very hard to understand and interpret. Now, if we talk about comprehensiveness, we are looking at, we're getting data sets from all sorts of um, the formats and the sources and increasing complexity. And then if we look at collaboration, uh, the computing today is in very uh, collaborative and decentralized in nature. And uh, we need to uh, pull in uh, computing resource from many different entities to achieve something great. So underlying all these, there is a common theme that is uh, attracting more and more attention, which is trust. How can we establish trust in the, all these intelligence? And how can we deal with the trust in other aspects of human life? For example, we're talking about public trust, we're talking about trust in healthcare, we're talking about trust in data, in surveillance, and all these things. So that gave us the motivation to start this special theme day, which is this trust day. And we hope we can bring in, um, as you can see from today's speakers and the great panelists, uh, experts, practitioners, researchers, uh, people in academia to discuss and explore how data science in particular can help we establish trust and how trust issue would affect our research, our projects and other efforts. Um, so this is a little bit background of uh, uh, this trust today. And I want to thank all of you for attending this special day and, and uh, I and, and hope you have a wonderful day uh, at, uh, at this uh, occasion. Now, let me pass on to Mike to talk a little bit about, about him, he himself and his effort uh, at Tomasic Singapore. Thanks, Veda. Um, yeah, welcome everyone here to Trust Day, our very first Trust Day for KDD, uh, which uh, has been very exciting for me to organize together with uh, Jian Pei and, uh, and Veda Su. Um, this is a very sensitive topic for many companies and uh, Feda just mentioned all the industries that this has impact to. So it's even more encouraging for me to see here um, all of our industry participants that have actually been able to step up, uh, be able to contribute either a talk or be part of our panel discussions. Um, at Tomasic, uh, I lead AI strategy and solutions. Uh, Tomasic is a global investment firm headquartered in Singapore. We've recognized that certain mega trends like AI, cyber security, blockchain, and digital transformation really need a special attention. Um, and, and you probably uh, may already know that Singapore has also been at the forefront of today's topic, um, responsible AI, uh, AI ethics, and trust in that context. Um, as a team, we, we have recognized that we need to put the highest priority on the ethical adoption uh, development and delivery of AI technology and solutions. Um, and in that context, we have been uh, really much uh, a, an active contributor to the Singapore model AI governance framework, for example. Um, if you haven't looked at that, uh, I really encourage you to look at that overall framework because it gives a lot of context to some of the topics that we are covering today. Um, and likewise, also to bridge the uh, trust gap that's uh, required for industry adoption of AI, uh, especially adoption at scale, uh, we have also joined the Singapore Computer Society's corporate pledge to promote the responsible use of AI and data. Uh, it's a really another important initiative here uh, based in Singapore that uh, we figure is our, you know, it's very important for, for industry to participate. Um, it's really also around government certification and uh, um, uh, encouraging the certification of professionals and the training of your teams. 
So I think from my perspective, this shouldn't be an afterthought. So hopefully this will be uh, not just uh, our first uh, KDD Trust Day, but uh, the first of many to come. Um, and I'm very excited to, to listen to all of the talks today. And with that, uh, I'd like to pass it on to, to Jian Pei, uh, who has been for the last eight years, the uh, CKDD uh, chair um, and uh, a leading expert in AI. And so I'm very excited for him to help us organize the uh, day today as well. So Jian, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you, Feida. So uh, indeed, uh, the Trust Day is a new initiative in uh, CKDD. And also uh, it is implemented in this KDD conference. This is a great uh, starting point. As we know, uh, no matter how smart uh, machine learning model, AI models we have, no matter how smart the data science we can be, the ultimate success will be measured by the trust. This trust is not only uh, the trust from the users, uh, but also from the contributors, from the uh, you know um, people uh, working on different kinds of models, uh, different steps in the data and um, AI um, supply and demand. So this whole process, as Mike and uh, Feda commanded, is uh, so important and so critical that uh, uh, we cannot overemphasize the importance of um, uh, AI, of uh, trust. And uh, I'm a, as a professor at Simon Fraser University, my research is also uh, on trustworthy uh, data science and uh, applications of AI. So it is really great honor that uh, we several people together to have this forum. And we, we are sure that uh, uh, you'll find these uh, talks really rewarding. We are so grateful to uh, all the speakers uh, sparing their time to give their, uh, to share their insights and visions in this uh, forum. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so since, thanks Jane. So things we have a little bit of time more. So maybe I can give a very quick uh, introduction about the whole day's program for our uh, yeah. uh, audience. Um, so actually today's program has been broken into May two categories. One category is the invited talks. And uh, we have two sections of the talks, one in the morning of four wonderful talks. And the other section of the talk, we include three talks in the afternoon. So in the morning talks, in the four talks, let me give you a bit of background. And as you can see from the program, we have a really a mixture of uh, great speakers from different domains. And we have in particular, uh, Michael Lee from Coinbase. And, um, and we have um, you know, people from other uh, 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 companies like uh, uh, N Group, uh, Dr. Yuan. And then we have uh, professors from uh, um, the University of Sydney Professor Chang Tang, and we have also a professor from Singapore, David Chen. And David Chen is a professor in social science, and he's gonna talk about public trust. So we put these people from very different backgrounds together to illustrate the point is that trust is really uh, a, a topic that could glue people from different domains together. And it is one topic that can inspire people and, and, and putting uh, our wisdom together. And uh, um, it, it is my honor to have actually uh, Michael Lee here today from Coinbase is because uh, blockchain, as we all know it, has now become uh, the foundation of many of the trust things we're talking about. Uh, I, I just went and mentioned one news recently. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, all of you are aware of that. So recently there is this uh, blockchain project called uh, Poly Network. And Poly Network got hacked with almost a billion dollars loss in cryptocurrency value. Now, um, you know, we, it's not a new thing that a, 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 a blockchain project got hacked. But what is interesting in this case is after a few days of uh, uh, negotiation and after a few days of, uh, uh, of, of, of back and forth, uh, eventually the hacker actually returned uh, most, if not all, the stolen the cryptocurrency back to this project. And uh, of course, you know, underlying there is a lot of technology that has made this happen. But uh, the, the key thing here is with the improvement in all these uh, regulatory um, mechanisms, with all these uh, analysis of this crypto transaction network, it is nowadays possible to trace down to each and every transaction of such kind to define detail so that um, such a transaction network 
uh, has become actually the safest transaction network in the world because everything is crystal clear and everything is open. So uh, people used to, you know, uh, blame blockchain and we used to blame Bitcoin for many of these illegal and so-called this uh, anonymous transactions. But nowadays we actually seeing some hope that uh, the cryptocurrency network and, and all these things are no longer a black box. And actually we can regulate, we can monitor it. So that's why I feel um, we are, are and, and that's actually why we have invited uh, quite a few people uh, with a background in, in blockchain, a decentralized organization to join today's talk. Uh, and this afternoon's talk, we have invited our professor Wei Zhang uh, from School of Law. He's the associate dean of School of Law and expert in corporate governance uh, relating to trust. And he has published the two uh, very popular books called the the Rule uh, the Order of Capital. Uh, uh, they are in Chinese, but it's very uh, popular. And he's going to talk about especially how to establish the public trust with a private corporate environment. And uh, myself, uh, together with uh, Prof. Wei Zhang, we're going to teach a course called Blockchain Governance in SMU in the coming fall. So that also, uh, you know, uh, illustrate how important nowadays for technology and the legal uh, domain to, to come together to address some of the very interesting questions uh, in, in the trust domain. And then we have Prof. Uh, Han Yu from NTU to talk about uh, a trustworthy federated learning system. Now, many of you are familiar actually with federated learning, which is a, a topic with very much growing attention these years. Um, and federated learning grows from a setting where we need to separate the data and the computation such that you know, uh, every local entities can uh, get, maintain the privacy of the data while achieving some of the great things that only achievable when you put uh, those data together previously. So um, Prof. Han Yu is going to talk about how we can uh, uh, endow more trust in such a learning system. And then we have uh, Yu Chen Wu from Singapore Blockchain Innovation Platform to talk about um, secure and interpretable vertical better learning. Now, Singapore Blockchain Innovation Platform is a great support also for today's uh, trust day. Let me get, a, get a, a little bit background of this organization. So basically this is uh, Singapore government's first sponsored uh, blockchain innovation platform, try to connect academia and industry uh, 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 in uh, blockchain technology. And uh, it has connected all the four major universities in Singapore and uh, National University of Singapore, NTU, SMU and the SUTD. Um, and together with uh, lots of the major companies here in Singapore from different industries. So it, it's good to uh, have SBIP supporting us and uh, present here. And then maybe uh, I think Mike can give a little bit uh, overview of the three panels uh, that Tomasi has, uh, you know, uh, uh, helped to uh, uh, gather. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Feda. Thank yeah. Um, yeah. In, in, in the uh, panels, uh, we actually were, were emphasizing the business applications and a lot of the uh, business domain experts on, on uh, their contribution to trust. And we've, uh, We've covered uh, very different angles in each panel, um, kind of from the uh, responsible management at scale all the way to what it means for small and medium business enterprises and uh, you know, how do you build responsible solutions around that and bridge the, gov uh, the, the trust um, gap between the uh, consumer typically and then the, the business, what is possible and what you should do and what you have to really uh, um, uh, take care of upfront uh, as core uh, design decisions in your in your um, in your system design. So we've uh, put together three separate panels. Uh, you will see uh, business participants from smaller companies uh, that are more on the startup side, Basis AI, Credo AI, for example. Uh, we have large uh, financial institutions that have joined us: DBS, Bank, Standard Charter, OCBC. 
um, and uh, also government regulators. So um, out of MAS, the Monetary Authority um, of Singapore. And then in that uh, panel number three, at the very end of today's day, we have uh, 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 participants out of uh, Facebook, Salesforce, and Lazada. Um, and, and that's the panel that I mentioned earlier about uh, you know, the, the impact to businesses, small and large enterprises alike. So very important, uh, I think, to, to span the, the entire end-to-end -end, uh, uh, scope of trust and how it can play uh, into the different applications uh, between data, um, AI, machine learning. And then um, Feda mentioned earlier, a lot of the topics uh, branch out into blockchain uh, as some of the technologies that impact what you do um, in, in the processing and the back end with your data. Um, I think a uh, very broad topic, but uh, I think we're almost ready to go with uh, our first speaker. So Jan, back to you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mike and uh, Feda. Now, uh, it is my great honor to um, introduce our first speaker, um, Michael Lee, Mr. Michael Lee. Uh, Michael is currently the VP of data at uh, Coinbase. Uh, his uh, professional interests have been uh, always on empowering people with data and technology throughout his whole career. His work has been focused on defining and op uh, op um, operationalizing big data and AI in practical terms for enterprises and figuring out how they can drive business value through the EOI, meaning empower, uh, optimize, and innovate uh, framework. His industry experience spanned across financial services, e-commerce, social network, and now the blockchain industry. Uh, Michael holds a master's degree in engineering from UIUC and a bachelor degree uh, from uh, science uh, for, at Fudan University. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for your time, uh, please. Yeah. Cool, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Professor Jinpei. Um, I need to present from my com computer, I believe, right? Uh, yes, please. Uh, you just keep okay. on share screen. Uh, let me just do that quickly here. Um, screen. Uh, yeah, if you uh, share, uh, if you... Can, can you see my screen now? Uh, not yet. Let me see. Uh, maybe then. Uh, uh, share uh, content. No, you just uh, you you look at the bottom. It uh, uh, says share screen, right? Do you find the uh, bottom? You click on oh, share see. screen. Oh, 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 share screen. I did that and then start broadcast. Um, can you see my screen now? Oh yeah, now you can see it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let me switch over to my browser and then uh, here we go. Cool. Yeah. Can you guys great. see the screen now? All right, yeah. thank you guys. Um, so I'm very excited and honored to uh, join the, uh, the KDD 2021 Trust Day. My topic today is into the blockchain data. As you can see that uh, this is meant to be, I guess one of the very uh, few force sort of introduction sort of for blockchain data. It doesn't go very in depth, but my hope is uh, this can lead to a lot of the uh, great work uh, coming out of in this field. I'm looking forward to see more and more participation in this field as well. So as uh, Professor Jim Pei just introduced, uh, pretty much covered my career so far. Um, I would say just one more time that uh, my career interest has always been empower people with data and technology. Uh, this started essentially from my um, um, graduate study at the University of Illinois at Bernard Champaign, where I studied climate uh, change uh, using modeling approach, uh, which combines mathematics, data programming uh, all together. Uh, which set sort of the direction. And then later on, I worked in various industry. And then uh, now I have been uh, at the Coinbase, uh, which is the first public uh, crypto company in the blockchain industry, as you guys probably know, uh, and for the last three years. So before we get started, I, I don't know if we have a way uh, to sort of get uh, a uh, sort of basic understanding uh, about the uh, audience, sort of uh, the knowledge about the blockchain space. So uh, the question is, uh, if you were to rank these four concepts from large to small, they are Bitcoin, blockchain, smart contracts, and Ethereum, and how would you rank them? Uh, I don't know if there's a way to, uh, to do it. Um, maybe just do it in your head uh, and then uh, get an answer. 
And uh, I will announce the answer here. Uh, so blockchain is the largest concept here. Um, and then Bitcoin and Ethereum are essentially impl special implementations of blockchain. And smart contracts essentially is a functionality for uh, Ethereum. Um, so the concept would go with two as the largest, and then one and four are essentially at the same level, then three is the, uh, the smaller concept. Uh, this is just to establish some of the basic sort of uh, knowledge level uh, for uh, blockchain, which I'll go deeper in the later of the uh, presentation. So before we get started, uh, let's talk about what that's they to do. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, have a, a uh, level understanding on that. Uh, this is based on my years of experience in this field, where I think uh, essentially data does three things uh, uh, from a you know, high level. One is uh, uh, providing clarity, right? That keeps us informed and being honest. And uh, it provides insights, which uh, help us make better decisions. It also um, uh, holds us accountable, right? So we always uh, create uh, nor true north metrics and then use that to hold everyone accountable. So the importance of this is um, on the uh, clarity side, we all know, you know, if we have wrong data, it's actually worse than no data. So clarity is super, super important. Uh, on the inside side, uh, if uh, data is not timely and relevant, it's actually not useful. And then on the accountability side, uh, we all know this famous saying from um, the uh, Peter Trucker around uh, management that if you, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. The reason that I mentioned is all three aspects is because I think blockchain industry, although new, data is going to play all these three roles in the industry as well, as we have seen in other uh, technology companies. So let's zoom in uh, to take a quick look at, at the data at Coinbase. Uh, we actually just uh, released all these uh, metrics to the public uh, in our second earning call as a public company just the uh, past Tuesday. So now we have more than 68 million verified users on our platform. We have more than $180 billion worth of assets on the platform across retail and institution. And our services are available more than uh, 100 countries. So not only that, there's a huge amount of data that we have, but also uh, there's many different types of data at Coinbase. So one thing that our CEO, Brian Armstrong, got asked a lot is what, an, what kind of company that Coinbase is? Are you a financial services company? Are you a technology company? And our CEO's answer uh, actually through one of his blogs is that we are a crypto company, effectively we're both, meaning uh, we're providing both financial services, but also that we're creating technology in the meantime. But to me, actually, with that as a context, we are dealing with three major types of data that uh, if you look at it, maybe we are one of very few companies are in that situation. So, the fact that we have our financial data, there's a payment transactions, uh, there's uh, balances, there's accounting tax related data. So all these things are very, you know, uh, traditional financial data, if you will. They're very private, very sensitive. There's also another category, which is the product data. Uh, so that essentially is generated as uh, our users are using our products. Uh, this is a uh, uh, very uh, popular now in the technology industry already that uh, the product data being uh, used uh, in all kinds of different places. Uh, and lastly, uh, which is the focus for today is the blockchain data. So the interesting thing about blockchain data is, uh, it's basically publicly available. We'll touch upon a little bit about this thing, um, but you know, which also means that uh, technically speaking, all the usage here we have for blockchain data can be shared uh, essentially with the whole community. But the thing also interesting is we're in very early stage in terms of leveraging blockchain data. Although that we know there's a lot of value that we can uh, essentially discover from it. So uh, the reason that I want to point it out is uh, the fact that all three major types of data, they kind of play different roles where financial data is highly sensitive, private, part of data is mostly proprietary to the company, but blockchain is totally available, which opens up a lot of new opportunities. Um, and then another thing that I want to mention also is uh, when I joined Coinbase, we set up this data 3.0 strategy, uh, which essentially is working as the uh, infrastructure to enable all these different data that we have. Um, I wrote a uh, blog on uh, Coinbase blog site. Uh, feel free to give it a read. But on a high level, you can see that uh, we have three stages in my mind that for, for data from a data 1.0, where it's very reactive and uh, mostly being seen as a manual service 
all the way to data 3.0, where we have all different data systems work seamlessly together to create value at scale. Uh, this is a, a very important foundation that sets up uh, Earth for uh, the future success when it comes to the uh, data infrastructure side. Just to mention that because this is a foundation that is critical for our current work. So now let's uh, actually um, started to focus on like you know the today's topic about the blockchain data, right? So let's start with uh, blockchain. Um, this actually is a description about blockchain that I effectively that site uh, from Investopedia uh, website. So credit goes to uh, the Investopedia website. Uh, I actually bolded out the portion that I think is super interesting that is very relevant for this presentation as well. So as you can see that uh, blockchain effectively is a specific type of database, right? Uh, and the reason is, uh, as I mentioned in the next bullet point that effectively the blockchains, they store the data in blocks. Each block contains the data and then all these blocks are chained together, right? That, that's how the data are being stored on blockchain. And all these data, when they are chained together, the fact that they're in chronological order. So if you have a block number, you get the idea around that uh, when this data is created, there's timestamps, there are uh, you know, information essentially you know, right? This is happening at, at a given time period. And uh, you can essentially store different type of information. Now people know, mostly know uh, about cryptocurrencies. Uh, the fact that the data stored in the blocks are ledger of transactions, but that's not the only type of data you can store in blockchain, right? So it's, it is like, you know, what is uh, blockchain is used mostly at this point, but definitely there's a lot of other opportunities as well. So, you know, if you take a look at the case of Bitcoin, uh, essentially uh, blockchain is used in decentralized way and then it's not controlled by anyone or any group. So it's like the whole network, right? the whole community that decides like how uh, the, uh, the network works. So decentralization obviously is a super, super important attribute as well for blockchain. And lastly that all the blockchain data, because it's decentralized, they're also immutable. So it's, it's very, very interesting that the fact that when the data is stored on blockchain, they're there forever. It's a permanent record and it's uh, available essentially to everyone. So if you were to summarize it, right, a few key things for blockchain, in fact, it is a new kind of database in my mind. It's decentralized. Everyone has universal access to it. It's in chronological order and it's immutable. So as people uh, who are familiar with data, this is kind of the, the perfect database that you would imagine. Um, and you know, as we all know uh, in the industry that most of the company wouldn't want to share their databases, but blockchain essentially breaks that assumption from the very, very beginning. And that also means that all the work that we do based on blockchain can be easily shared because all these data from the very beginning are publicly available essentially. So uh, where is uh, and how is uh, blockchain data is being used today, right? Uh, actually it's still in very early stage as I mentioned. So they're mostly used in four aspects. Uh, although even in these four aspects, they're still uh, early stage, I would say. So the fourth category is risk and compliance management. Uh, so this part is mostly as um, uh, Professor uh, Feda uh, Zhu just mentioned that um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about blockchain right now that people are saying it's highly risky, there's, it is a wild west, uh, but the fact that we can use blockchain data to help manage risk and, and uh, you know, help uh, the, uh, the government and regulate uh, agencies to understand right, like how the blockchain works. And then really where the risk is, where actually uh, you know, people are using it for all legitimate reasons as well. So that's a first, that's actually a really big category right now. That's because uh, apparently uh, regulation become really hot topic as blockchain become more and more mainstream, uh, which is a good thing in general, but uh, the data is being used to facilitate all the conversation. The second part is what we call the business intelligence, essentially is how blockchain data is being used to help make business part of strategy and make critical decisions. Uh, that's mostly like internal use case for different companies. Um, and we have seen that a lot of companies take advantage of that data. Uh, the third uh, use case is uh, we have seen that blockchain data being used as market dynamic signals, essentially traders, uh, institutions, they can use uh, these signals to make uh, trading decisions and uh, you know, get business profit from it. And the last one is blockchain analytics, which is something that I personally got really, really uh, excited that uh, essentially it's more in-depth right, research around blockchain data 
and then uh, uh, discover insights and do research around it. So that's the part that I actually, I believe that uh, will take uh, more and more uh, momentum uh, in the industry, which is also that uh, I will use an example later on of this presentation. So uh, again, Professor uh, Fei Dadu actually just mentioned that uh, we have seen a hack recently with Polygon, right? And uh, I didn't get time to prepare for that one, but I did take an example uh, for a very famous crypto change uh, exchange hack in May 2019. Uh, you can check back news around that hack. Uh, but what we did essentially is uh, we visualize how this hack actually happened. Uh, let me explain quickly that what this chart is about. So the red dot in the middle is essentially is the wallet for the uh, crypto exchange that got hacked. And all the red dots surrounding that big red dots are the uh, blockchain addresses that belong to that crypto exchange. Then all the gray dots outside are hackers' address. Whereas right? you can see that all the uh, red dots, they have arrows pointing out to the gray dots. In fact, that means that uh, the cryptos got hacked and got transferred out, out, out to the hacker's address. If you look at those lines from the red dots to the gray dots, it also has amount on it, which is the uh, essentially the amount of cryptos that got transferred out. So this chart clearly illustrates that how the exchange was hacked and how much uh, cryptos goes out to which addresses. Now, this visualization is part of a product that we built called Coinbase Analytics. Uh, and you can visualize a hack very easily, just like um, you know, uh, this very famous crypto exchange hack. This, I just use it as an example. The reason I want to point it out is exactly, right? This visualization is based on the data behind it and how did we do it? So uh, we need to talk about the basic mechanics uh, for blockchain transaction first, right? To help people understand this. Uh, by the way, all these charts are cited from Satoshi's famous Bitcoin white paper, right? I think when the paper was written, it's meant mostly about mechanics uh, around how Bitcoin works. But I think that they actually can be used uh, for a blockchain data purpose uh, as well. So I can, as you can see for the chart in the middle, that there's a illustration of two blocks. It's essentially each block within each block, uh, you can see there's a, a hash uh, and there's uh, multiple transactions. TX essentially is a transaction. And like uh, we just talked about uh, just now that blockchain, essentially each block has all the data that is chained together, right? As you can see, mostly in a the block, there's a hash, like essentially that how the block is encrypted and then all the transactions that are combined into one block for a given timestamp. Now, and then all these blocks are chained together. And if you look into each transaction, you can see that, which is the, the box on the right in the middle, that you have in, essentially these are inputs, right? Inputs are addresses that are sending cryptos out. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the out essentially outputs. These are the addresses that are receiving those cryptos. You can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs for each transaction. But typically that you will see more transaction that has one input, one output. So this is a really important concept. Essentially, this is how transactions are formed. And we'll talk about exactly in data how they're um, stored right, in, in a database. So as we talk about uh, the uh, transaction data in the blockchain, I think one thing that is uh, interesting to point out, given that this is trust day, is a very different dynamic, I would say, with blockchain data. So if you look at the chart at the bottom, the traditional privacy model, right? We all know that transaction, financial transaction data, they're stored today in trusted third party, you know, typically institutions or banks, and all users' identities their transactions effectively, right? Uh, the transaction happening between the, uh, the send and the receiver, and all these data are guarded by this trusted third party. And the public doesn't have any access to this transaction data, which is a good thing in the sense that uh, all your data are stored with a trusted party. So as long as this trust party can protect your data, then you're, you can be confident that uh, you're in good hands. However, we do know, right? When some of these third, uh, third parties, their website, their database got hacked, then all this information got leaked. And at that point that effectively that you cannot protect yourself uh, from a data privacy perspective. But uh, you know, if you look at the blockchain, right? Which is this new privacy model that's described, 
effectively that except for identities behind the addresses, all the other information about transactions, effectively they're available for the whole public. So that's the interesting part about blockchain data, if you will. So you don't actually know the people, the true identities behind these transactions. However, you can know everything else about this transaction in terms of the amount of the transaction, the sending address, input address, or the receiving address, or output address. And you can use that data to do all kinds of different research. You can understand the economy way better, actually, using all these data exactly probably available on the blockchain. So these are the, a few important traits, and I just want to point it out uh, as the basic mechanics for a blockchain transaction. Now, let's, let's take a, a real example, right? So this is a one transaction during that hack that happens. So uh, essentially is how uh, USDT, which is Tether, uh, which is a token created on Ethereum chain. So let's took out, took, take a look at the chart in the middle of the slide that you have the transaction hash, remember? Uh, Hash is a big part of the, uh, the, the blockchain data. And then the status is success, meaning this transaction is confirmed. And the blockchain height, that's the number of the block. So essentially, you can think about this is the number of blocks that have been generated, right? Which, which is the, uh, the number in, for the sequence of that particular block this transaction is in. And then you see the timestamp when this transaction was created in that block. From is the, uh, the input address. Interacted here is a contract, um, a contract uh, name because this is Ethereum. That's the smart contract uh, concept. Uh, and then you have the transaction amount, right, which is uh, nine hundred eighteen point oh seven USDT. Uh, and you can see that this is uh, from which input to which output. Now. The thing that's also interesting is, is you look at every transaction has a transaction fee component because on blockchain, how transaction was carried out is um, essentially you have miners, right? That mine new blocks. And then we need to create uh, incentive for the miners to uh, create new blocks. And uh, we pay transaction uh, awards or fees uh, for these miners as well. So this is basically a particular transaction that's described in a um, you know plan, tax, if you will. So if you look at this uh, transaction in the database, right? how do they look like, which is the, the table at the bottom that you can see, especially for this transaction, there are two records that we have. Um, the first one is always the timestamp is the same. We have two records here. The block height is the same. The currency is different. As you can see, the first row has a currency as USDT. Uh, it's on the chain uh, Ethereum. And input is the input address which is the, uh, the fourth data element in the inputs field. And then uh, the next two fields are the amount. And outputs has also the output address and amount uh, associated with it as well. So that's, that's describing essentially the, uh, the transfer portion, the send, and, the send and the receive. The second row describes essentially is the transaction fee. So you can see that it doesn't have output. So that's how we know that is a transaction fee. Uh, because it's paid out to the miner and it only has input and also the amount that is paid out. So essentially that is the data points, right? So obviously this table is, is much, much bigger than what we described here, but I just want to use a uh, unit uh, sort of transaction example to illustrate that how this actually works uh, behind the scene, right? So when you have a big table like this, then you can use that to create a visualization as I just show you uh, in the example just now. So that's just a very simple illustration, uh, like an example around how we're using blockchain data to visualize right, a, a very famous hack. And we can use that as information to work with uh, people to identify, right? How do we um, prevent uh, certain things from happening in, in, the, in the future? Now, what's the uh, broader vision that we have on this? Uh, and the thing that we're working on, uh, this is essentially where we spend a lot of time as a team right now is what we call the crypto data foundations. What we believe is uh, the data foundations in this uh, field is gonna be the best facilitator for all kinds of research that we wanna do and all kinds of applications that we wanna create in the future. So if you look at this slide, we wanna start from the bottom where we have on-chain data, essentially these are all the data that you have from uh, blockchain, right? So 
we have that, like essentially everyone has access to it, but it takes a lot of time to actually uh, collect the data, process data, and put them all together, as you can imagine. We also have our product data that is specific to uh, Coinbase products. We also have third-party data that we have wonder that uh, 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 you know, who service third-party data and cross source as well. So with all these different data come together, we want to create a knowledge graph on top, which essentially is a data infrastructure that uh, describe blockchain, right? As you can see that uh, all these little people uh, logo, essentially these are the addresses on the blockchain and the, the edges essentially relationships between them. And also we have a time component to see how this graph evolves over time. And on top of that, we'll build all the machine learning systems for personalization, recommendation, risk management, search feed, all kinds of like essentially machine learning system that we, we want to empower right on top of this uh, uh, on top of this data. And ultimately that we can create applications for all the user segments, institutions, retail, ecosystem, partners, government, uh, academia, of course, as well. So this is a super uh, high priority that we're working on, and we're hoping that we can bring more uh, knowledge sharing in the future. And the one good thing about this, as you can see that even blockchain data is uh, decentralized, uh, is essentially uh, available to the public. All these things that we built, uh, a lot of these things we're gonna build as, as services, and because the data essentially is publicly available, we can make uh, hopefully a good portion of this available to the industry so that we can have other folks to build on top uh, of this amazing data much easily, much more easily. So uh, stay tuned, and then uh, hopefully that will we'll, we'll, we'll bring more uh, you know, uh, great news uh, to this community. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we are just getting started on blockchain data. So we have very uh, limited uh, data infrastructure uh, for blockchain right now. Uh, and also obviously because of that, we don't have a standard way of storing, computing, consuming uh, the blockchain data. And we have limited use cases as I just covered. So you know, I'm calling for more in-depth research and we need more academic um, participation for sure. Uh, so hopefully like KDD uh, could help us uh, facilitate that the momentum uh, in, the, um, in, this, in this space. Um, also, you know, we have seen that there's a lot of startup working on it. Um, so the next slide I show essentially a industry landscape. Um, as you can see, these are the various <laughs> areas uh, in blockchain, if you will. And uh, you see some big names, uh, like some big companies are jumping into the field already, as you know. But there's also there's a lot of startups like working on various areas uh, for this industry, which um, you can you can see that uh, uh, we, we will have a lot of momentum, and this this industry has a great future ahead. Now, just to uh, recap, um, essentially, um, blockchain is uh, a new kind of database uh, in my mind that um, is decentralized, is a chronological, is immutable, uh, is a, a great uh, database to work with. Uh, just we're just in very early days uh, in terms of development and consumption, but it got a huge potential uh, ahead of us. Um, there's so many opportunities. Uh, so you know, if you like to work on it, you know, we have a, a lot of job openings uh, in the company. Hopefully, that will see more people uh, come join us and work in this uh, very exciting field. So it's a link for our job site, and you can uh, see all the, uh, the openings that we have. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to open up for questions. And uh, if you have any uh, specific questions, uh, follow up, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn as well. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, so um, we are now open for questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, use the Q&A function to type in your questions so that I can ask on behalf of the audience. Maybe I let me uh, start from uh, one question. This is very interesting, and also um, uh, you have a lot of sensitive data. Uh, so one question here uh, is that uh, how a company like uh, uh, the Coinbase can uh, ensure the data is used uh, in a proper way. Particularly, we know um, the second use of data is a magic. Is a magic in good way and also maybe in uh, 
negative ways. So how do you control that to make sure uh, your collaborator, your contributor, your users will have trust on uh, your company? You continue having the trust. So I think that's the, the part I mentioned is the beauty of a blockchain data, right? The fact that uh, everybody can have a copy of the blockchain data if they want. They can uh, spin up a note, uh, they can set up a, a node themselves, and then in fact that they can have the data. What we're doing essentially is uh, create the services on top of it, and we do a lot of the hard work right behind the scene, and hopefully that to make that data a lot easier to use so that people can build uh, direct applications on top of it. Um, in terms of how people are using blockchain data, um, I believe that, uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly how that is gonna play out, but in my mind, because of the data is decentralized, then you have more ways actually people can validate, can cross check, right? Their results in a much more easier way because data from a, from a like, you know, per basic layer, right? The data is accessible to everyone. Yes, okay. Uh, but uh, a follow-up question is that uh, this is, uh, more or less is like a, a post uh, processing, post uh, like auditing. I, I see that uh, this guy is using the data in a, a good way and that guy may be using the data in a, in a proper way. But how can we be more uh, proactive or preventive? This is one thing. Another thing is that, uh, well, as the uh, blockchain data is open to everyone, some people may just take the data, but do not uh, record their uh, every behavior on the blockchain because they can read the data, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the part that is interesting that, uh, I, again, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. this is based on my prediction, right? For the future, mm -hmm. we want to actually provide a different level of access of the data that you can go to uh, the most uh, like raw level data if you want, right? In fact, then mm -hmm. uh, you probably don't really need anyone. You can just download a copy uh, yourself. Uh, but we also want to provide it at different level that make it very easy for people for different uh, various uh, purposes. Um, to be candid, that I don't think that we can stop people from using data in different ways, right? Given the data is factually yeah. available to everyone, yeah. what we what we can do is to guide people around what are the use cases they may be able to use the, the data for. And I think over time, the legitimate use cases will will prevail, and then the the, the bad use cases will go away, right? I think people have good judgment, um, you know, ultimately uh, in the, uh, you know, when, when, we come, when it comes to applications. Any further questions? Great. Thank you so much. This is a very uh, inspiring and uh, a visionary talk. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, now, uh, Let's move to the next talk. Uh, we are uh, very pleasure to uh, have uh, Professor Chang Tan from the University of uh, Sydney to uh, talk about um, um, the Dumbo uh, particle family uh, making a synchronous uh, consensus field. Uh, Professor Chang Tan is currently a senior lecturer at as the uh, in US system is associate professor at the University of Sydney. Um, before he moved to Australia, he was an assistant professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology and the director of the JD NJIT IS uh, CAS Joint Blockchain Lab. Before that, he was a, a postdoc at Cornell uh, IC3. Uh, professor uh, Tang's research uh, produced a very a broad impact. His research spanned broadly in cryptography and blockchain technology, and his work mostly appeared at flagship values of security, crypto, and distributed computing. His recipe um, uh, of the MIT Technical Review, uh, 35 Chinese Innovators Under 35, uh, 2019, and he also received a Google Faculty Award and the uh, NJIT Research Award uh, 2020, and also uh, many other awards. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor uh, Tang. Yeah, you have the stage. Uh, thanks, all the Professor Pei. Uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> uh, could you see my slides? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, so let me get started and uh, let's see. It works. 
Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the very nice introduction uh, from Professor Pei. And, and I'm, ver I'm very delighted to, to join virtually join this uh, nice event of Trust Day at the KDD because uh, trust is actually one central theme of my research. And uh, today I would like to give a very high level overview of our recent work on how to reduce trust assumption in a central tool that actually is used to build trust, which is asynchronous consensus. And I'm Chang from uh, University of Sydney. Uh, as we all know that our life have become more and more uh, digitized, especially in this uh, pandemic, and we essentially create a parallel a digital world. But behind the screen, as we all know that it is, uh, all those uh, large platforms actually help us to get these uh, nice services. On one hand, we get good services, but on the other hand, uh, several pressing issues uh, become more and more um, evident that gets more and, uh, public attention. On, on one hand, uh, we are actually, and those platforms actually know us better than our mother. On the other hand, we have no idea what's going on behind the curtain, like when we receive a certain post or, or when we didn't receive anything. So essentially we put, we kind of rely too much on this uh, platform to give us very nice service. It's a kind of, we put too much trust on those platforms. And it, many recent instances actually raise kind of alarm that uh, make public aware of this. So on the first thing we should do is, uh, since we know that we generate a large, a massive amount of data. So those data like uh, is our digital asset, like any of our physical property, we better protect them, right? So cryptography is uh, one very natural tool to, to help us doing this. But more interestingly, and uh, not only we want to protect just at one single hop, we might want to protect our, our digital asset at every single hop from like uh, cre the creation to transmission, storage, and even processing. And uh, modern cryptography can, can really go beyond from just secure communication and actually can facilitate this. Well, the unsatisfactory is that uh, there are still large gaps between the crypto theory and, uh, and the practice. But even if we have the best possible protection of our data, still we rely too much, we, we solely rely on the platforms to respond to us, to give us service. A recent very interesting incident actually directly related to Australia is that Facebook actually completely banned the news portals from, uh, from Australia for, <clears throat> for a few days. Well, this might, might not be a, a frequent event, but at least raise some alarm that platform might choose to not respond to us in some in some settings, at least a, a direct alarm to Australians. So this course reminds us to maybe we need to look more carefully on this uh, very promising new technology called blockchain that might help us to reduce the reliance on a single entity. What do we mean? Blockchain essentially enable a large amount of internet peers to jointly simulate a virtual uh, platform without actually relying on one single entity. And people may wonder uh, like the cost of the distributed system um, are much higher, but actually if we do it correctly, the, the transparency of, uh, of, uh, of blockchain actually may reduce the cost from the consumer side which was shown actually in one of our recent results, um, even, even though the overall cost might be higher. But of course the, the blockchain technology itself is still not that mature yet, uh, still in, in its infant stage, but it gives a lot of promises. So as I mentioned in the very, uh, very beginning, trust is one central theme uh, of my research. Actually my research directly focus on applied cryptography and blockchain. So on the crypto end, we we try, I work very hard to try to design secure and usable uh, multi cloud uh, system, which normally security and usability is sometimes antagonistic, antagonistic to each other. And also, we consider to use cryptographic tools to enforce accountability, like which might not be the conventional use of uh, crypto. At the same time, we may care about privacy. And uh, <clears throat> another interesting I would like to briefly mention is that um, before the the backdoors in, in AI got uh, uh, super popular. We also <clears throat> initial uh, initial line of study 
called cryptography, which we want to design crypto against the backdoors similarly, uh, but in a different uh, fashion. And uh, on the blockchain domain, we kind of categorize the core layer into three different layers. The, the most important one, of course, is the consensus protocols, which also will be the focus today. And uh, on the upper layer, we, we can design all kinds of new uh, decentralized applications, given even the restricted uh, consensus layer. Well, at the bottom layer, we also want to design all kinds of new supporting cryptographic primitives. So um, today I will focus on a very high level of idea of the consensus protocol, protocols, which we call a Dumbo protocol family. So as um, many of you probably quite familiar already, the, the, the consensus problem is really the base of the blockchain technology. Well, the definition of consensus is fairly, actually fairly simple. A bunch of internet peers each have some input transaction, they communicate, they want to reach agreement on the digital lock. Now using the more, more fashionable term is called digital ledger. Well, safety basically requires all the ledgers are essentially the same. Basically, we want the honest guys to look at the same view. Right? We don't have an inconsistency, we don't have a, a disagreement. Well, Limeness basically requires every honest transaction will be recorded sooner or later. That, that basically intuitively means the service will be continue, continuously available. We don't want someone's request will never be responded. But what the, the scientific problem or consensus problem or the variance actually have been studied by the distributed computing community for many, many years. But it is uh, Bitcoin that uh, first lifted this problem to a qualitative different scenario, which is the open internet which raised a lot of a completely new challenge, which we haven't faced previously. So as in many of the computer science research, normally the most fundamental or maybe the simplest, the most uh, direct challenge is we want to make the system as fast as possible. And at the same time, we want to make it as robust, as, uh, as resilient or as secure as possible. Right? So today I would like to focus on about one kind of arguably the most ro robust consensus protocol. And we want to push the boundary of the efficiency to finally get it from books or papers to the real world. So the, what do we mean by the, the robustness? And this directly re relates to a timing assumption that is actually used by all those consensus protocols. So, it, the timing assumption basically means what do we assume about the under ne underlying network? So the most of the consensus protocol you use actually some kind of synchronous protocol that assumes the underlying network will deliver all message within some uh, known time D. Well, th this might be okay in the, when the consensus was deployed in a data center or within a, a well-connected machines in, in, within an organization. But when we talk about the deploying consensus in the open internet, this assumption might be too optimistic, especially considering the nodes might be widely spread across the globe in different, uh, different continent. I still remember when, when I have uh, three party meetings, like one partner from China, one from the US, I always see the, we, we have a share screen and do some drawing. I always see the drawing one second later than the other, other two guys. So the latency across the globe is not, the network across the globe is not really that stable as we thought. Also, when we deploy across the globe, all kinds of devices might be like uh, the edge nodes or IT nodes maybe get come and go and up and down. So we don't really have a, a less stable uh, globally connected internet, uh, as we may assume for synchronous uh, network. What's worse is that actually people, uh, researchers have shown that for large class of those synchronous protocols, if we just launch denial of service attack on a small number of nodes, maybe two or three nodes, then, or maybe just a network connection for just a small number of nodes gets very, really bad, then the whole consensus network will get stuck essentially the service will basically get, get paused and um, the, the whole consensus network got influenced. So those calls for um, our, our thought is, can we have a consensus protocol just built on top of, uh, without relying on any timing assumption, just deploy on the current internet, right? As long as it eventually delivered a message. 
So this type of consensus is called asynchronous uh, consensus. Uh, despite asynchronous consensus might uh, provide the most resilient uh, fashion, actually they also have uh, a lot of uh, practical benefits. Uh, one of them is uh, if you ever build a, uh, uh, if you really build a uh, distributed system yourself, you probably remember the, the suffering or the bad memories when you try to manually tune all those time up, time out parameters to, to make all those events right. But in asynchronous protocol, it, it really saves engineers life because we, we don't need to set this uh, manual timeout at all. We just, just whenever the network delivers, we just go. But the surprising fact, or maybe the sad fact, is that most of the existing platforms, they deploy, at least in use, they deploy kind of synchronous protocol. That means they might be vulnerable to all those network attacks. But it is not that um, those uh, platforms don't want to deploy asynchronous consensus simply because it's complicated. <laughs> Well, one, one, one of probably most famous result in distributed computing is called the FLP impossibility. They, they stated already in the 80s that there's no deterministic protocol can work for asynchronous network. It doesn't rule out the possibility of asynchronous protocol completely, but at least hints it's difficult. So over the years, people spend a lot of efforts trying to design all kinds of randomized protocol to circumvent this impossibility. But those protocols are theoretical in nature, uh, are highly complicated. Actually, essentially, none of them has ever been implemented, let alone to be deployed. But because of the, the pop popularity brought by Bitcoin, then we want we, the, the urgent need of deploying consensus over the open internet, people start to seriously wonder can we ever get this asynchronous protocol practical at all? And uh, in 2016, probably the, one of the most visible results is called Honey Badger BFT. They optimized a classical protocol and gave a, 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 a nice implementation and they show promising results. Uh, and recently, very recently, we give a more affirmative answer to this question and we call this protocol family uh, Dumbo protocols. But yes, we can. It's not as easy as, a, as just a political slogan. It do needs to take some efforts. Uh, I will try to give a very high level of view in the next, say, 20 minutes. Um, first, I would, would like to give a very uh, a big picture of the, the, how the Dumbo protocols got involved. So starting from Honey Badger BFT, they, they optimize the classical protocol in a very nice way that they first get, they get the first per transaction optimal communication. So originally many from the, the, the asynchronous protocols actually have a large communication complexity. So too many communication obviously makes the, the network very uh, frequently stuck. So our first uh, Dumbo protocol, let's call it a Dumbo Classic. Uh, on top of uh, op optimal tra per transaction communication, we also get the optimal running time. So squeeze the, the optimize the how say the protocol structure so that we don't need to wait potentially quite a long time to get the protocol proceed. Well, at the same time, we also design a theoretical protocol that achieves asymptotically optimal everything. On the practical side, we continue pushing the boundary of Dumbo and uh, uh, on, on, on top of uh, Dumbo Classic, we design speeding Dumbo. And uh, besides uh, the same benefits as before, we also bring down the message complexity, basically the number of messages uh, we need to send out or the, the number of message links we need to build <coughs> for the whole protocol. We also bring that down to optimal. And more interestingly is we, we start to go open the box going out of the asymptotic domain to squeeze out the, the real concrete number of rounds to improve the, the, the latency. And uh, very recently, we also pushed it uh, to the essentially limit that we optimize the protocol structure in the sense that we, we essentially we use a bandwidth limit. We, we make no waste of the bandwidth so that the, the, the throughput can really get maximize in, in certain way. And besides a uh, throughput, another critical thing uh, normally, cri normally criticized by uh, for the asynchronous protocol is the latency. 
And <clears throat> so we designed another protocol called Bold Dumbo Transformer that uh, we want not only get all the other benefits at the same time, we want this asynchronous, asynchronous protocol, which is normally much more complicated as fast as the state of the art uh, synchronous protocol. One of them is a uh, hostaf, which is deployed in the Facebook Novi platform. <clears throat> So in this talk, I would like to focus on the, the beginning of the Dumbo theory and uh, hope, and also the most, most uh, advanced one, and hoping to give a rough idea how do we push this thing from textbook to real world. <clears throat> so the first uh, in, in the insight, uh, the, the first let me very briefly overview the, the major insight from the, the first uh, major work from Honey, called Honey Badger BFT that they say uh, normally this, we can design something called asynchronous common subset. Uh, basically, not, instead of outputting just one uh, party's transaction, we output a set of them. So this obviously is a good for, for batching to output uh, a lot of things all at once. And also very interestingly, this uh, common subset <clears throat> is um, actually can be built from the simplest possible uh, protocol is actually the binary version of Bazinia agreement. So if we peel off all the unnecessary difficulty of the honey badger BFT, actually the backbone of it is very simple in structural sense. So first, everybody basically broadcasts this value using something called reliable broadcast. Here is the RBC. So everyone broadcasts its own value using a certain tool called reliable broadcast. Then after a while, then everyone gonna run a binary agreement to decide whether we should output each individual transaction. For example, ABA here is a async binary agreement. So they all jointly participate in n versions of a binary agreement to decide should I should we output transaction one, should we output transaction two, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, essentially, the, if we think abstractly, the whole procedure just goes like a broadcast and the voting procedure, right? And then everybody just vote to see whether we should uh, output them for each individual transaction. Very simple structure. But since we want, we want to make it more closer to practice, let's first identify the, what's, what's wrong in this uh, seemingly already quite simple structure, right? Well, the inspiration comes again from the FOP impossibility because all asynchronous protocol are randomized. It cannot be deterministic. So this is gonna be the same for even the binary version of it. So binary, especially when we concurrently executing a large number of binary agreement or randomized protocols, the whole procedure will only stop at the slowest instance. Importantly, uh, a very simple observation is that when the number of concurrent execution is large, they is deemed to be a slow one. If you do a calculation, actually the, the running time will be, of this concurrent execution of n instances will be actually depending on n. So with this uh, simple observation, we also set up to do some experiment to, to justify our conjecture. Um, not only the experimental result ver validates our conjecture, more importantly, it's kind of a, a little bit surprising that the blue column here is actually time cost of the binary agreement, while the, the red column is the broadcast phase. So the, 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 the concurrent execution of large number of binary agreement actually takes the dominating fraction of the, the whole cost of the, the whole protocol. Now with this picture is it becomes very, very simple and very obvious. Our task is to shove off this blue column to save a lot of uh, cost and uh, get the efficiency done. So the question is uh, how we can shove off this blue column, right? The, the, the reason is because we concurrently execute too many binary agreement at the same time. So can we, in order to push, reduce the number of binary agreement, and if we think again at the beginning, so the binary agreement essentially is a voting procedure, everyone jointly to decide whether we should output what particular transaction, right? But, um, so we have to make this voting procedure more effective. Well, if we think, uh, think for, for like 30 seconds, after the broadcast phase, actually everyone have a, more than I have a bunch of transactions from 
every people, right? For at least for the honest people. So everyone is not only have holding one single transaction anymore, it's actually having a vector values. So at the end of the day, we just need to output one vector. So in order to make this uh, voting procedure more effective, actually, why not just choose one of them to output? But the challenge here is we have no idea who is the honest guy, right? If we choose the, the bad guy, then maybe he will hold his value and no one can, can receive the real value. So this uh, reminds us of an, another primitive, actually, we will briefly mention his name called MVBA, which is not a full, <clears throat> fully powered uh, Bethany agreement. It can handle multi-value, but it cannot guarantee the output is coming from an honest guy. It, it only satisfies a certain prediction, a, a certain predicate. So the idea here is that we need to augment this broadcast procedure uh, the, the broadcast procedure with certain cryptographic proofs that ensures whenever anyone receives this proof, he's going to be sure everyone else will receive the same value as all, uh, at the, uh, also at eventually. So with this uh, proofs, then we can simply reuse this, uh, use this mode, uh, mode MVP primitive, which only executes binary agreement like uh, two or three times. And with the power of this uh, augmented proof that we, we can be sure that even if the output is from a malicious guy, but as long as we see the proof, uh, everyone else will receive the same vector. So we are happy to get the agreement again. Uh, one interesting quick note is that this MVB primitive itself is quite complicated. It's easy to get communication blowed up. So that's why it's ab explicitly abandoned by, by the previous works. Well, why we can even pick up the a heavy tool while still kind of sound a little bit uh, contradicting, contradicting to our goal to making efficiency better, right? Uh, uh, a very interesting, actually very simple note is that <clears throat> the actual input we are, use, we are using to invoke this heavy tool is actually very succinct, just index. It's not the actual, actual data, actual payload. Well, after the broadcast phase, we only, only use the indexes and the very succinct proof to invoke this MVB protocol so that the overall communication will not be blow up. And uh, <clears throat> this is a very rough idea of how we push down the, the number of uh, binary agreement to, to constant. And uh, let's, since we are talking about the practice, let's examine it in, in, in experiments. We did experiment we deployed the protocol in, in uh, across the globe in, in the 100 nodes uh, really across different uh, continent. And we did a pair to pair comparison with Honey Badger. And we can easy, easily see that the, the black line is, uh, <clears throat> if you can see my cursor, the Honey Badger goes much, much slower when the, the number of nodes gets larger while Dumbo gets slowly gets slower. On the other hand, the throughput also clearly the Dumbo gets much, much faster, uh, much, much larger. And actually the throughput here is already quite uh, promising even compared to synchronous protocols. Mm, one thing we have learned so far is that from design philosophy point of view, so we know that the ACS is good for a consensus for the general consensus, and it can be built, there are two different passes, one is from binary agreement and another one is from historically also from this heavy MVB protocol. And uh, the Dumbo protocol explicitly choose, uh, the, the Honey Badger explicitly choose the binary agreement because the MVB was a bottleneck. But we show that actually while smarter use of this MVB, despite the large complexity of MVB, the, the, the ending protocol still much, much better. And actually we also open up the box of MVB to, to check it might not need to be so complex. So the first uh, takeaway or maybe lesson we learned from the Dumbo protocol is actually the seemingly heavy MVB protocol, it might be still the right way for constructing a practical asynchronous consensus. Now we kind of get um, push the <clears throat> the word uh, substantially further. And the question is, are we there yet? Are we happy already? Well, that's the, the improvement of latency. And seems like the Dumbo protocol goes quite flat, right? But if we enlarge the angle here and 
instead of comparing with a, uh, with a honey badger, we, we compare with the synchronous protocol hot stuff, then the situation become completely different. Well, this is Dumbo actually still grow with the number of scale, even though here is much, much slower than, than the previous state of the art. But compared to the synchronous protocol, the latency is still very, very large. The, the intuition is fairly simple because um, a large number of randomness, many not a large number of rounds involved in the complex asynchronous protocols. So basically, Dumbo is still only useful in a very small scale, or we only care about throughput. But latency, sometimes you, you don't want to submit a, a, a transaction request, but and, uh, and wait like two minutes to get it done. Yeah. We will, people want the instant uh, feelings. Um, so essentially, we are actually in a, put us in a, in a trust or performance dilemma <clears throat> that for the deterministic uh, synchronous protocols, they are really fast, but they might they might not have a safety. Maybe the pro the whole protocol may, may get stuck if like, the network is not uh, synchronous, right? Well, asynchronous randomized protocols they are very resilient; they can never get stuck, but they are very slow. So kind of uh, put in a dilemma of trust performance. Either we have to choose trust on the network, or we have to choose a low performance. <clears throat> it's kind of a, not a nice situation we want to be in. Uh, so can we, so our next question is, can we actually get the best of both? We want as fast as the synchronous protocol, but as resilient, resilient and as robust as the right. And answer again is yes, we can, but that takes a different view. <clears throat> so this calls for something called optimistic asynchronous consensus. Basically, we will first run a fast deterministic protocol. And when things get gets wrong, we run asynchronous uh, view change or fallback protocol. The, the, philosophy, uh, the <clears throat> rationale is that the real world network might not be always bad, right? It could be good for most of the time, but sometimes it's bad. We don't want to sacrifice efficiency just for the sake of uh, like one day downtime or maybe one hour downtime. So this idea actually exists in the theoretical in the theory. Basically, the flow, let me quickly go over it. Um, the key idea is that whenever things go wrong, then people need to complain and we try to restart from somewhere we got stuck, right? <clears throat> so we call this decide where to fall back called pace synchronization. So I'm at block 100 and Professor Pei maybe at block uh, 1,000. We, 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 we need to agree where we're gonna restart. <clears throat> and then we recover to run some other pro procedure. But uh, if we think more, think for a little more carefully, so decide where to fall back, this seems, the task itself seems very familiar, right? Basically, we need to agree on the index. This already calls for an asynchronous multi-valued BA. While multi-valued BA in asynchronous network simply doesn't exist. So that puts us again in another difficult situation. So what they do in the, in the previous theoretical result, they use this, use this heavy MVB protocol to approximate. And uh, <clears throat> even though we have MVB protocol approximate, even though we have a progress to use the latest MVB protocol, but still the MVB protocol itself is highly complicated. Um, this picture already tells a lot of things and many of them are state-of-the-art protocol, even with a very recent progress. Even though we optimize all the asynchronous, uh, asymptotic complexity, the, the overall protocol structure is highly com complicated. You don't want to learn it in now in five minutes. So the consequence is that even though we do the optimistic asynchronous protocol, the reality, the performance is that a lot of uh, bandwidth, a lot of time will be wasted simply because of the slow um, space synchronization, etc. So the only effective block is like optimistic blocks. And uh, overall, it's still much, much slower than the deterministic protocol. So we want to, that's why we designed something called Bolt Dumbo Transformer. The, the key requirement here is that we want the, tr the, the transition or the pace synchronization to be super light. And the key observation is that we want we provide a new abstraction of the deterministic protocol. We call it fast lane, and we call it bolt. 
this is uh, we want something like it is very easy to get, but at the same time it enables the cheapest possible transformer or pace synchronization. So what is the cheapest possible thing? We, we can think of it's still some kind of agreement, right? The, the chief, the really minimum, minimal agreement, if we still remember at the beginning, is a binary agreement. How can we do that? Uh, that's the actually the, the cute part of the abstraction. So the abstraction will provide something called a notarizable consensus in some way. So it's a full-fledged consensus in the optimistic case. The leader are honest, the network is good, but is is a handicap otherwise. Otherwise, if the network is bad, it doesn't guarantee anything. The only thing it can guarantee is something called a notarizability. If one even malicious guy output a, a, a certificate, that means enough honest guy already received a previous value. So this simple stuff can actually be realized very easily by simply have something called a provable multicast or something. But the key thing is it, this kind of abstraction prepares very nicely structured inputs for a, a cheapest possible transformer or, or syn pace synchronization. So uh, how does it prepare? Because of this uh, simple notarizability property uh, after uh, a multi-hop of, uh, uh, of a mathematical proof that we can actually show that if we deploy such kind of uh, abstracted and nicely abstracted the boat uh, the when we enter the pace synchronization we call uh, pace transform tran transform uh, <coughs> as the transformer actually the everyone going to be either input uh, uh, index v or v plus one so now we really this already reminds us some some version of binary agreement uh, so the nice thing is that originally we waste a lot of uh, bandwidth or network or time on, on the just for the pace synchronization or view change. Now with the very super light uh, asynchronous view change, essentially most of the, the work, the, net, the physical resources are used in the best way. So we also did the experiments. Maybe I should go it very quickly. So and as our as as we predicted and the, our latency really can be as fast as the hot stuff while our throughput actually even outperforming them <clears throat> so to quickly summarize um we we start with a bunch of uh, asynchronous protocols in the jungle really complicated now honey badger raised this big question can we push it to practice as a running animal now we kind of prove that Flying is faster than running, and then uh, flashing maybe even faster than the uh, flying. And uh, if we look at the trust performance dilemma there, uh, the the BDT framework or, or maybe the overall Dumbo thing kind of provides a bridge that gives a clear answer that trust assumption can be reduced without really sacrificing the performance. And maybe broadly we can because this is trust day, maybe you can think about reducing trust more broadly in the distributed uh, sense, like asynchronous distributed cloud or asynchronous federal learning. In general, maybe asynchronous secure multi-body computation. We want it to be go out of uh, theory and can be useful. So I would like to conclude that uh, even though now we put too much trust, we might be able to, we want to rebuild trust on this uh, current internet. And of course, we do need a cross-disciplinary, sometimes maybe bold ideas, for example, from a social scientist. And, uh, but the nice thing is crypto and blockchain might provide technical tools to help make those nice ideas come down to the earth, make it real. Uh, thank you, that's my talk. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so now we are open for any questions. Yeah, again, uh, if you have any question, please feel free to type in the Q&A function. <clears throat> ah, sorry, maybe I run out of time. <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. So probably I, uh, just uh, one quick question here. Uh, well, uh, cryptography is always something very really challenging. Uh, and also it has theoretical uh, bound. Uh, so what do you see the most uh, important uh, challenge in the way on the way uh, for view applications of the, uh, your uh, new progress uh, here uh you mean you mean the asynchronous protocols right yeah yes uh so uh, well uh, how, what are the challenges that uh, we can implement those uh those in practice yeah oh actually the implementation is very very simple 
so we, we already implemented and the, I mean the 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 real world experiment those code of course maybe not the industry level but actually can be used easily because that's actually one nice part of asynchronous consensus because uh, the one challenging aspect engineering challenge in the consensus protocol is actually tuning all those uh, manual timeout mechanism in the synchronous setting but now we are in the asynchronous setting the pro what the protocol is what you see is what you're going to implement like wait uh, uh, one half of the message something like that actually much easier Glad to know that. Thank you, Ken, for the talk. Yeah, thank you for. Um, yeah, for thank you. The Thanks a lot for the, thank you. the invitation. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So now uh, let's move to uh, last but not least. We have uh, Professor David Chen, uh, Professor of Psychology at Singapore Management University and the adjunct uh, principal scientist and scientific, scientific advisor at the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, uh, ASTARS. Um, mm star in Singapore. So he will um, uh, give a talk next. His works uh, published in top psychology management and methods journals have been cited over 13,000 times in various uh, disciplines. He has authored or edited 13 books published by uh, various uh, publishers in uh, many different areas of social and behavioral sciences. And um, Without uh, further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Chen. Uh, thank you, Jen. I hope you can see me. Uh, we're still all trying to get used to Zoom conferences. Uh, very good morning to all of you and a good afternoon or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are in. Uh, as uh, Jen has said, I'm David Chan, a professor of psychology from the Singapore Management University. I also wear many hats, uh, which uh, we can talk about some of these, uh, uh, depending on the nature of the interactions we might have uh, later. But uh, let me first thank the organizers for inviting me to address you at this global conference on data science, uh, and also to share with you, of course, on issues uh, concerning public trust. I understand that we have a diverse audience here and uh, many of you, I assume, uh, would like to get an overview of the issues uh, involved in the trust process. So what I'll do uh, in uh, 30 minutes that I'll have, uh, I won't take all 30 minutes, I will keep my remarks uh, short, uh, general and non-technical uh, instead of giving an academic lecture, which uh, I guess most of you have uh, sat through quite a few uh, this morning. So here we go. Uh, I think there'll be no slides for you today, uh, no notes, uh, just an informal sharing with you. Uh, on the science and the practice of public trust. And then I look forward to responding to some questions that you might have, uh, which you can also type them, I understand, briefly into the Q&A box uh, anytime during the session. Uh, first, let, let, let's, let's begin with the basic goal I think that many of us here have as researchers or practitioners in the data sciences, uh, or as policymakers and leaders in organizations that I'm sure some of you are uh, at this conference today. Uh, when what is that basic goal? I think it's really to gain insights from the large amounts of data that we have, uh, the data that are often uh, often disparate, often dynamic, uh, and very different in formats and so on. And the goal then is really to discover knowledge about some phenomena, right? To gain insights, discover the knowledge, uh, and then try it with that better understanding to make predictions, uh, to make recommendations, uh, make decisions uh, that's going to affect people's lives in important ways. And uh, now we know all, we all know that the data come from various areas, right? Areas that you are very familiar with, I'm sure in the data sciences, uh, we talk about the social media, we talk about any online communication, uh, digital transactions, uh, or any spatial temporal information that we might have through sensors uh, and uh, various kinds of say visual analytics and so on. And then of course there's artificial intelligence, there is uh, the big data analytics uh, of different sorts in the different sectors, be it public, private or people sector. <clears throat> I think what we have seen is uh, how these technological innovations, uh, these technological applications in these areas, they have actually transformed the ways that governments or businesses uh, or organizations and individuals, uh, the way they operate, uh, the way they deliver their services. Um, but I think what is important is that this transformation in terms has really significantly affected uh, and will continue to affect uh, people's lives, uh, livelihoods, um, the way of life, uh, and also the quality of life. And we also know that these technological effects are very important because they translate into practical impact on people's well-being, uh, people's functioning at various levels, right? Be it at the individual, the group, uh, the organization, or the society. 
So my point here is really this, that given all these impact, right, it is quite clear that we really need to be trustworthy. Uh, and that's why we have uh, the KDD day today on trust. Uh, I'm sure that's uh, what the organizations have in mind when you plan this uh, a special day for this conference in data scientists. Um, but let's take a step back. I think researchers uh, and technical practitioners like most of you are in data sciences, um, I think we tend to think about trust in very operational terms. Uh, so what do we do? We try to increase the reliability, we try to increase the validity of our measurement. <clears throat> uh, the purpose really is to enhance the accuracy of the inferences that we make uh, from the data. Um, and this could include the technical trustworthiness right, of the techniques that we use, uh, the technologies that we use, the models that we use, uh, the systems that we use, and so on. Um, I think my role here is really to just remind all of us uh, that uh, there's really much more to trustworthiness and public trust uh, than the technical and operational issues that uh, we in data scientists spend a lot of time uh, in. Now, if you think about, think about the context of research, the context of public policy, or the context of practice in organizations, well, it's quite clear, I think all of us know that you can apply your data sciences effectively only if there is high public trust, right? For, uh, as you interface or as you interact with the people who are actually providers of the data or people who are users of the data, uh, such as uh, making their daily decisions or making big important society decisions like policy makers and leaders. Uh, just take, for example, the COVID uh, crisis management, right, in which uh, the leaders' actions, leaders' words, leaders' uh, decisions, uh, they need to be highly trusted by the public in order for things to work. Uh, trust was very critical in problem solving in the crisis. Uh, trust is still critical, uh, especially in crisis moments, uh, because a baseline level, a baseline level of trust, right, I think, is foundational uh, for people to decide to believe their leaders, uh, decide to cooperate, uh, decide to perform actions uh, towards uh, achieving the intended outcome. Now, when your trust is low, uh, we all know that your effective functioning is hampered. Uh, that sounds like a motherhood statement, uh, but in practice, do we really know that enough and do we actually apply that into our daily decisions and lives? Uh, if you look at our leaders uh, of any country or any city, uh, and you look at uh, leaders in the businesses, leaders in the nonprofit organizations, uh, they can tell you that uh, it is very difficult uh, when there is no trust or low trust uh, to implement any control measure uh, during the crisis or during any other uh, major incidents. Uh, to initiate an initiative uh, to, to sort of uh, change a decision that you have already made and now you because of various uh, in the light of new information you need to make changes uh, and people think about it as making a u-turn uh, people thinking about uh, i've done something and yet you're going to change uh, what you have promised and so on and how are you going to then explain that change how then you're going to galvanize people to try to collectively uh, move towards a particular action because the information has changed there is something that I think all of us uh, as leaders or all, allow, all of us as researchers or, or policy makers face all the time. Now, what the research in social and behavioral sciences have uh, told us is very clear. And that is it consistently showed us that uh, the trust in leaders is very difficult to build, but it is easily eroded. And uh, once it is lost, it is uh, very difficult to restore. Uh, I should also add another important uh, social psychological findings that uh, some of you might not be so aware. Right, leaders are also human beings, and the research has shown that the leaders are susceptible to the same human biases of overconfidence and the low self-awareness. Uh, what that really means is that uh, many leaders not only actually think that they are better than they actually are, right? they not only think that they actually they are better than they actually are, uh, they also overestimate the degree to which, they are, which their followers uh, perceive uh, their trustworthiness. Uh, so that is very important. Uh, however capable you are, or you think you are, remember to bring it down a little bit. Uh, that's what people think your capability levels. And when you think the people trust you, bring it down a little bit. That is the actual levels that uh, people actually trust you, right? That's what the research has uh, shown us. So I think what we need is really an evidence-based approach uh, to build trust. Uh, uh, for those of us, all of us here, I think in data sciences of one sort or the other, uh, to take a step back and recognize that uh, whatever we do, we have to understand how humans think, how humans feel, and how humans act uh, in the very context of the issues that they care about. Uh, and when we know that, then it can help prevent your trust erosion. Uh, you can repair any trust violation. Uh, you can uh, enhance uh, trust development. But for that to happen, of course, we need some humility, uh, some objectivity, uh, perhaps some learning orientation, right, to learn uh, draw some lessons on trust uh, from the research that we already know. Uh, in the case of Singapore, 
uh, the COVID crisis actually has taught us, right? We know that, but it has really taught us and uh, brought back home uh, how important public trust is. And uh, uh, we did well in certain things. We didn't do so well in others. Uh, I wouldn't have time to go through the uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, but I've written a book on the psychology of a response to COVID crisis. Those of you who are interested uh, can take a look at my uh, school's webpage. Uh, and by the way, in my CV, there'll be uh, various uh, links to videos and articles that you can take a look uh, on trust or other issues. So what I want to do is really to, because of time, uh, to contextualize trust for you, right? Uh, and to do that, I think we need to define the specific issue at hand. Uh, what is the situation? Uh, what is the time period? And a very useful framework, I thought, uh, at least I, th I think so, uh, to think about trust is in terms of what I call the three M's, three M's of trust matters. Uh, and, and that is to look at trust as a multi-level, that's the first M, as a multi-dimensional, uh, that's the second M, and also that trust is malleable, right? That's the third M. So let me very quickly go through these three M's with you. Uh, first, uh, trust is uh, multi-level. Uh, and by multi-level, it really means that there are different aspects of trust at different levels uh, from individuals to group to organizations or institution. And it's quite important to distinguish those levels because we tend to talk about trust as if it's a homogeneous construct. We tend to use the word trust very loosely. Right? But when we know, uh, recognize which level of trust that we are talking about, and then things become uh, much clearer. Now, first, of course, there is the individual level, and that is fundamental, right? Because uh, trust is really essentially a psychological construct. Uh, it is really about the perception uh, uh, of trust that really matters. Now, what we need to recognize is that a leader uh, may have all the capabilities, all the information. Actually, a leader could be objectively trustworthy on an issue, uh, but you do not perceive that the leader is trustworthy. Why? Well, because there could be other factors, right? Such as uh, poor communication, poor coordination, and that has affected, uh, could affect negatively affect the perception of the uh, uh, of the leader's uh, trustworthiness. So it is important to separate the objective trustworthiness, which we all need to strive towards, but uh, that is quite different uh, from the subjective perception uh, of uh, whether a leader is trustworthy or not. And that level of trust, of course, is important because when you don't trust the leader, uh, it affects uh, not only how you feel, how you think, but it affects uh, the particular actions that you might do, uh, which may be contrary to what the leader would uh, try to influence you to do. Uh, there is, of course, also the trust at the group level, right? Uh, and, and, and what is it about this group level? And uh, some of the things that we might not be so used to, uh, perhaps need to uh, remind ourselves. Now, if I ask you this question, uh, do you trust the national leaders in your country? Or do you trust the national leaders in your country? Now, when you're answering this question, I think you are thinking of the leaders as a team, right? And as an abstract trustee, so to speak. Uh, you are not necessarily thinking about a particular individual leader, uh, but it may just take one individual leader in the team to behave in a certain way uh, to increase or decrease your trust uh, for the leadership as a team, right? So at the group level, it is quite important that while you are looking at a group or a team, uh, just one individual in the team could actually affect uh, how your perception uh, uh, of the team and so on. And this applies, of course, not just to national leaders. It applies to the CEOs, right? It applies to a senior management team in an organization. It, take, it just takes one individual in a senior management team to affect our, our perception of the entire senior management team. Uh, in the case of Singapore, we don't only talk about trust at the group level. We, I'm sure in other cities as well, we focus a lot on intergroup trust. And there is something I think uh, we may not have given in, uh, enough uh, uh, thought right, in our data sciences. Um, in Singapore, for example, we are very used to talk about uh, social harmony, social cohesion of trust between groups, right? And uh, often we talk about different race groups or ethnicity, uh, different religious groups and so on. But like many other cities, I'm sure, and countries, um, Singapore now uh, finds itself having to pay attention uh, to a lot of uh, emergent group differences, right? Such as a trust between uh, different segments of the population, right? Between locals and foreigners uh, within a very cosmopolitan city or country. Uh, there could be other emergent groups that we should be concerned with, right? Uh, that are categorized according to demographics, uh, age, social economic classes. Uh, and I would venture to say even uh, groups between uh, people who have different roles, right? Do we have trust between, say, the scientists and the policy makers? And COVID, this was very clear in many cities. Uh, scientists say one thing, policy makers say another, but it's not just vis-a-vis -vis the public. It's also about the intergroup trust uh, between these two groups of people. We can go on and on, talk about groups in terms of values uh, and, and so on, uh, but I won't have time to do that. 
Now, most of us uh, are more familiar with trust at the institutional level, right? When we talk about public trust. Uh, in Singapore, you talk about public trust, everybody says, oh, it is about trust in the government and so on. And that's important uh, because it is very clear who the specific uh, trustee is, right? That's the government uh, or that could be the public institutions such as the enforcement agencies and so on. Uh, people who hold on to your data and privacy is an issue of trust, for example. Um, but while the trustee is quite clear who that you are directing the trust towards, I think the what is less clear is the various dimensions of trust, right? And that leads me to the second M, right? And that is trust is actually multidimensional. Uh, by multidimensional, we have to look at the dimensions uh, for both parties, right? In the trust relationship, uh, the truster, the person that is trusting, and the trustee, the, the person that's trying to get your trust. Uh, let's talk about a dimension, say, uh, about beliefs, right? Um, now, if you are a citizen, uh, your propensity to actually trust your government uh, is very much affected by your personal beliefs, your perceptions about the government. As I have said, right, this is a subjective, but it is very important because it is uh, sometimes uh, independent of the of the government's uh, objective trustworthiness, right? Because uh, uh, the government might have a, a trustworthiness that might not be evident uh, to the citizen for various reasons, uh, such as uh, you, you, the, as a citizen, you might not have the relevant information. Uh, you also may not have uh, an idea uh, of what is going on because of poor government, uh, public communications, uh, coordinations, and so on. And that happens in many, uh, I would say, all uh, countries and all cities. Uh, of course, we all know now that uh, people could also very easily misinterpret some facts or some data or you could be misled by others, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and assume that some factual inaccuracies or falsehoods are actually the truth. So you can be objectively trustworthy as a leader, but subjectively the persons, uh, people that is, uh, you're trying to get the trust might not think so. But I think that disconnect is something again that we need to uh, realize. And of course, people come with various expectations and so on. But let me just very quickly uh, talk about three dimensions of trust uh, that in all my writings uh, uh, and in the entire literature across uh, various disciplines uh, uh, are always talk about. In fact, I, some time ago, I've done a literature review about sent on literature in 17 disciplines. And we find that uh, across the disciplines, uh, people focus on these three important dimensions of trust. Right? So just a reminder uh, that trust is really not uh, homogeneous. Uh, first, trust, uh, there is about trust in competence, right? That's something that you and I are very familiar with. And this is the perception of whether your leader or the professional or the researcher, whether they actually have the ability to solve the problems that you care about. Uh, in the case of governments, of course, this trust dimension in uh, competence uh, probably refer to uh, whether they could uh, 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 solve problems that affect your lives, right? It could be things related to infrastructure, the digital society, public transport, uh, delivery of services, and so on. Then the second dimension of trust that we all care about is trust in integrity. So you often talk about not just competence, but you talk about character, right? And that's the perception of whether the leader, uh, the person that you're dealing with is honest, is incorrupt, uh, is impartial, and so on. Uh, that's important because uh, integrity involves your perception of the person's character, and character often uh, drives uh, a lot of things. Uh, I just want to say that uh, it is not possible to have a perfect character. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, when you are when you breach integrity at one point and you forever will not be trusted, right? So in Singapore, for example, we are very careful on how we handle. Uh, people who have done some wrongdoing, right? Uh, it is quite well known in Singapore that it doesn't matter who you are, uh, once you have done something wrong, and it is quite clear there is evidence uh, the government, uh, and in fact, uh, the various parts of society uh, will expect uh, enforcement of a vigorous action. And that's important because uh, that to some extent uh, could reinforce uh, the position of zero tolerance uh, for wrongdoings, and that could help you to enhance uh, trust in integrity. The last dimension of trust that I just want to talk about because of time is uh, uh, trust in benevolence. Uh, this is a bit difficult uh, in the sense that we are not used to thinking about uh, trust beyond character and beyond competence, right? Uh, benevolence is not about integrity per se. Uh, benevolence is this uh, public confidence uh, that the leader is authentic, right? In other words, uh, do you say what you mean and do you mean what you say? Uh, do you have good intentions? Do you have good motivations? when you are making a policy decision or when you're undertaking a particular action and so on. Uh, this trust in benevolence is very important because uh, when people believe that you are doing something out of your own interest rather than uh, motivated by a genuine concern for people uh, who's, uh, who are, you are trying to serve, 
uh, then this trust in benevolence gets eroded. Uh, and when it gets eroded, it is really very difficult uh, to, to bring it back. Uh, and that's something I think that we need to uh, realize, right? That it is a, a very hard, a very difficult form of trust to gain. Uh, this trust in benevolence, do you mean what you say? Do you say what you mean? Right? It means a lot to the public, uh, means a lot to the followers, but it is often, uh, research has shown, uh, to be neglected by leaders. So all of us who are leaders here uh, do remember that it's not just about your competence, your integrity. Uh, you need to mean what you say and uh, what you say, you uh, say what you mean and you must be perceived as such. Uh, because when you are perceived as not sincere, uh, a lot of things just uh, doesn't work. Uh, let me just go to the last dimension of trust, and that is uh, trust is uh, malleable. Uh, this is the idea that uh, most of you are probably quite aware. It just simply means that trust levels can change. It seems very obvious, uh, but uh, we often fail to, I think, appreciate uh, its implication, right? When we think about trust as being dynamic and the fact that trust can change. Uh, what that really means is that trust takes times to build. Uh, it is very easy to lose. It is uh, once lost, very difficult to restore. Uh, but the point here is not to talk about how fragile a trust is and uh, we lament about it. Uh, the point here is really to appreciate the dynamics of trust, right? And what does it really mean when we say trust can change? So what is it about changes uh, in trust over time that we all have to bear in mind, right? In all our research or our policy making and so on. Um, first, I would argue that uh, trust is uh, very dynamic and sensitive to the context, right? Uh, a level of trust uh, at any point in time uh, we must not take it for granted because the level of trust can change gradually, but it can also change abruptly. Uh, it may increase or decrease, uh, not just gradually, uh, it can actually increase very quickly or decrease very rapidly, uh, depending on the prevailing factors uh, that impact trust. And then you get a pattern or trajectory of check, uh, trust over time, which of course, as scientists, we can model, we can analyze, and so on. Um, but what that really means for leaders uh, and for those of us who are supporting leaders uh, in various advisors uh, and so on. And that is, it's very difficult to predict actually future levels of trust based on the historical trends of trust. Now, we all know about the various kinds of uh, trust barometers, uh, trust surveys and so on. Now, they are not useless, they are relevant. Uh, but I just want to uh, make all of us think that, you know, it is possible that you have trusted your government, whichever country you are from for the past 20 years. Uh, but then they did something that really violates your values and then you will stop trusting it, right? What that really means is that uh, the trust need not change gradually and the historical trends, the trends analysis that you try to do, it may not be very useful. So whenever we try to project trust, uh, think about the trends as something just a relevant piece of data that you have. Uh, what is really more important is to think about uh, the, the prevailing factors and so on. And, and what will happen next year depend very much uh, on what you as a leader do this year, right? rather than what you have done in the past five years in terms of trends and so on. So with that, right, I just want to uh, maybe pause here and uh, take some questions. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are interested in the science of trust, the practice of trust, uh, uh, you could uh, take a look at some of my writings, uh, some of my talks, which are in videos that I mentioned that you can access uh, on my webpage uh, and try to think about uh, addressing trust in various ways. Uh, I'm a member of the Singapore's uh, Social Science Research Council, and I also, uh, I'm also a scientific advisor to ASTAR, that's the Singapore's uh, National Agency for Science, Technology and Research. And one of the things that we try to do is to bring social behavioral sciences together with people in the more technical uh, computing technologies and social sciences, because we actually have the same problems, right, that we are dealing with uh, when you talk about the issues of trust. Uh, and it's quite important, therefore, to understand what research has already told us uh, about trust, what it is, what it is not, how you're going to access the various dimensions of trust, be it competence, uh, be it integrity, uh, be it benevolence, and so on. Uh, what is it about low trust? What is it about distrust and high trust? Uh, what is it about mistrust, right? That's trusting people when you should not. Uh, how do you monitor the different levels, uh, different dynamics and all? All these are possible uh, research questions uh, that we can do together. But in order to do that, we have to get some kind of a framework, some kind of understanding. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel, right? There's, a, there's basically like 50 years of research on trust that you can get from various disciplines. Uh, and we should actually uh, borrow from those uh, uh, those works uh, to try to understand how trust can erode, uh, how you prevent the erosion, uh, and when there's a trust violation, then how do you repair it, how do you rebuild it, how do you develop the trust, and then so that we can all create the trust climate that we all need uh, for the data sizes to be applied effectively, right, in order to realize the data society which has uh, so much 
uh, promise. And in order to do that, uh, recognize that your trust is not random, but neither is it predetermined. Uh, and to some extent, we can influence it. And so that trust, while it is fragile, uh, trust is also very powerful. And I think uh, with that, uh, we can work together, uh, whether you are a researcher whether from any discipline, whether you are a policymaker or whether you are a practitioner, right? It is really quite possible uh, to develop uh, an even stronger uh, as we apply our data sizes uh, to change society for the better. I think uh, that is enough for my time. Uh, I am doing okay. I still have five to 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if I can uh, pass it back to Jen and uh, to take any questions that uh, you might have. Jen, over uh, to you. Thank you, Raj. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, David, for the uh, very uh, visionary uh, talk. Indeed, uh, you represent a very un from a very unique angle because uh, you know um, you are both uh, connecting social science and uh, um, you know uh, technology. So uh, now we open for uh, questions. Uh, probably I can take the first one and. Um, yeah, you talk about the researchers and practitioners in data science should work with social and behavior scientists to um, work together to uh, connect. And can you give two or three points, uh, suggestions that how uh, data scientists can uh, better understand the trust issues um, and learn from social and behavioral scientists? Um, sure. Uh, instead of going uh, probably to specific uh, research questions and so on, uh, being in a, a scientific advisor and being on a grant mm -hmm. agency uh, and having a chance to talk to people in data sciences all the time. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, chairing a selection panel uh, for mm -hmm. ASTAR looking at various grants. Uh, uh, so, so on one hand, uh, we have actually strategic uh, directions uh, moving right among all our leaders. Uh, not just in STEM research, but in social behavioral sciences. It is very clear that we all recognize that the world's problem is not compartmentalized into the disciplines that you and I are organized into. And what that means is that there's a lot of funding now, uh, at least in Singapore, uh, for scientists, mm. for practitioners to come together. Uh, but the danger of that is that uh, as researchers, uh, they are very much trained in our graduate school in a particular discipline. We have a tendency to say, uh, to engage in what I call grand grabbing behaviors, right? Because you know that, oh, everything's supposed to be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. So what do you do as somebody from data sciences that in computing technologies, you quickly go to your school of social sciences and you grab a psychologist or a sociologist and you put the person's name onto the grant uh, at the last minute and you say, now I have an interdisciplinary team. Uh, for good grant givers, uh, they are very quick to be able to capture that. Right? In other words, I would argue that what we need to do is to, from the very onset, when you decide to put together a grant proposal, bring in all your people uh, that are relevant to solve the problems, right? Don't put in the person's name at the last minute and make your team appear interdisciplinary because that's not going to work. And even if you are lucky and you get the grant, you will not be able to deliver, right? And there are, we have seen many a times that people from one discipline uh, or the other, whether you are from the social behavioral or from the more computing technological ones, the problem is when you bring in the person from other discipline at the last minute, you end up actually uh, just borrowing the person's name uh, assuming that you bring in some good people. Uh, and then your grants uh, proposal is written in a way that is actually very rudimentary and elementary about the other discipline because it is not your expertise. And that comes across very clearly. So I would argue that the most important thing for all of us is to learn to go beyond our own discipline. And that requires humility because we need to recognize that we don't have all the solutions to all the problems that we actually care about that we want to investigate as a researcher. Uh, in my experience, uh, uh, I work a lot with uh, data scientists people. I know a little bit about computing technology, but I'm not a technical expert. Uh, so I have to also uh, learn their language. Uh, and that wasn't too difficult for me because I'm in psychometrics and statistics and research methods, right? So we are quite familiar with many of these things that we don't have to pick up from scratch. But not all social behavioral scientists are, are like that, right? And conversely, when you work with a social behavioral scientist, uh, you need to have that humility to understand, uh, to try to learn from what they already know. Uh, the difficult part is to uh, question our own assumptions, so the humility to say that, you know, we could be wrong. I think that's the most important thing, uh, more important than any other substantive example or issue uh, to bring people together, to work together and so on. Uh, I hope that address uh, some of the questions that uh, maybe at the back of why you asked that question. Yeah, great, uh, wonderful. Yeah, very um, insightful. Uh, any other questions? Um, 
given the time, uh, maybe we just uh, move on to the um, the panel, um, Mike. Yeah, thank you, David, uh, for your uh, really insightful talk. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Thanks, everybody, and have a good day. Thanks, Stacey. Now thanks, I hand Jen. over to Mike. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, so now we're coming to our first panel discussion of the day, which is titled AI Governance Solutions for the Responsible Management of AI at Scale. And uh, as a moderator, we have Stella Kramer, uh, who is the global co-head of technology at Norton Rose Fulbright. And she has with her four distinguished panel members, uh, two from startup companies, two more from a government organization, um, I will allow Stella to introduce the panelists, but I'm already looking forward to the dynamics between kind of the startup point of view on governance and the government's view of uh, gov uh, governance. Uh, hopefully we'll have some interesting tense discussions here. Um, but first allow me to introduce Stella as our panel moderator. Stella is a um, partner at the global and the global co-head of uh, the technology practice at the international law firm Norton Rose Fulbright based in Singapore. She specializes in complex digital and transformational technology and commercial transactions, including AI and disruptive technologies, outsourcing related regulatory issues and global compliance programs for financial institutions and major corporates across all industry sectors in the region. She also leads cyber and data breach issues for clients, uh, again, related to our trust uh, topic today, uh, coordinating the management of the breach and regulatory investigations across multiple jurisdictions. Stella is recognized as an industry thought leader on disruptive technology and data issues and regularly speaks at client and industry events. Notable legal publication chambers and, and partners ranked Stella as band one lawyer and legal 500 APAC have named her as a leading individual since 2015. She was also awarded Asia TMT lawyer of the year in 2020 by Asia Legal Awards. Stella, over to you. Great, many, many thanks, Michael, and also delighted to be here this morning and um, to be participating in this very exciting um, discussion around AI and trust. And thank you, Michael, for the very generous introduction. Um, today, uh, we are going to be focusing on AI governance for the responsible management of AI at scale. And during the next 50 minutes or so, um, me plus our distinguished panelists will be having a discussion around three key topics. Um, the first area that we will sort of dive into is the need for responsible AI and what the imperatives and risks are around the use of AI. Secondly, we will consider the role of regulation and in particular, the differing approaches we're seeing different regions take and the inherent tension with innovation. And then finally, the last topic, we will consider the tools that companies can implement to help ensure the risks that we've highlighted are addressed. I'm delighted this morning to introduce our distinguished panel. And as Michael has already highlighted, we've got a fantastic diversity of perspectives this morning, including from our regulator, data protection regulator here in Singapore, CEOs of AI startups, and the private sector uh, view as well. So first of all, I'd like each of the panelists just to give us a few minutes introduction. And I will start, first of all, inviting Mr. Yong Zee Kin to say a few words. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Stella, for letting me go first. Well, uh, good morning to everyone uh, uh, joining us uh, online. Uh, 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 I'm Zikin, uh, Deputy Commissioner for the Personal Data Protection Commission. And one of the things that uh, we do uh, is really uh, to look at how data is used, not just uh, to perform a regulatory function, but really to see, uh, looking ahead, right? Uh, what are the uh, regulatory and compliance guardrails that we might want to uh, suggest and put in place, test them out, right? To see how data-driven technologies can develop in the right tra trajectory and the right pace. So that's why we end up um, working on the, this area of our AI governance, right? Uh, and have been doing so over the last few years. I'd be happy to talk a bit more about our work in this area later, but uh, uh, Singapore uh, has been privileged to be able to put forward a model governance framework to add to the global discussion in this area. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. 
Great, many thanks, Zikin. Um, Ms. Liu Fiongyan, over to you for a few words. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stella. Uh, great, uh, really glad to be here. Uh, my name is Feng Yuan. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Basis AI. Um, Basis AI was co-founded with, you know, leaders from data scientists who worked in Silicon Valley companies, as well as uh, those with an experience uh, with uh, uh, governments and, and corporates. And what we're building is essentially a, a, a ML ops and AI governance platform to help enterprises uh, scale AI responsibly. In our view, the, the innovation that comes with AI needs to come hand in hand with, with the right governance. It's, it's not something that should be an afterthought. Uh, really excited to, to join the panel today. Many thanks. Um, and then Ms. Narina Singh, you were That's great, it. thank you. Thank you so much, Stella, and so nice to be here with everyone. Hello from San Francisco. Um, I am so excited to be here. I'm the founder and CEO of Credo AI. Uh, we are an early stage startup funded by some of the top leaders in artificial intelligence, including Andrew Ning, uh, which I'm sure many of you here, uh, you've done his AI coursework on Coursera. Uh, Credo AI is really on this journey to enable enterprises to build artificial intelligence uh, with the highest ethical standards. And very similar to Basis AI, we are building a comprehensive and continuous end-to-end uh, -end AI governance framework so that you as an enterprise uh, can really build these technologies in the most trusted, fair, auditable uh, way. Uh, we've been on this journey now for about a year and a half. And I'm bringing in my experience and expertise uh, from um, not only building AI at companies like Microsoft, Qualcomm. I'm a young global leader with World Economic Forum, so have collaborated extensively with the Singapore government in the past. And also I sit on the board of Mozilla, guiding their trustworthy AI initiatives. So really looking forward to sharing more uh, and uh, very proud and privileged to be part of this panel. That's great. Thank you, Navrina. And then finally, over to Jason tomorrow, which, uh, for a few words. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, my name is uh, Jason, and I'm a director of uh, artificial intelligence at MSD. Uh, some of you might know MSD as uh, with the US name, which is uh, Merck & Company. And I'm also a, a global SME on uh, responsible AI for the company. Uh, besides that, um, our team has been contributing to Singapore's uh, AI governance journey and uh, one of the quarters of, uh, the, of the AI governance uh, body of knowledge uh, recently released in Singapore. Uh, looking forward to the panel. Thanks for having us. Great. Many thanks, Jason. So now over to um, the first topic for discussion for the panel this morning. And today's focus at the conference is trust and some of the key areas of concern in respect to the use of AI includes the performance of the AI system, the models used for AI, the adoption of AI and its impacts on the supply chain, and the impacts of use of AI at scale. These concerns highlight the need to ensure that AI systems are trustworthy and used responsibly. So with this thought in mind, my first question is to Feng Yuan, in respect of AI, why is there an imperative for responsible AI and managing the risks of AI? It'd be great to get your thoughts to get the discussion started. You know, I, I was listening to the previous um, uh, uh, talk and, and I think as, as data and, and AI is used more ubiquitously in society, I think the, the consumers and the citizens who are you know, in some ways, the subjects and the beneficiaries of this um, uh, are going to, you know, have you know concerns over how technology is used. Uh, and I think the imperative for lots of organizations and enterprises using this technology is to reassure them, um, both as a as a kind of moral imperative, but also because it's I, I think good for for gaining growing your business and growing more users. And I, I think it's useful to set the context if you look back at, at new technologies. Right, every time there's a new technology that's being used in a widespread way. There are always concerns about trust. Who could imagine that um, you know we now go on the internet and, and sign up to stay at a at a place uh, halfway across the world without having viewed that house or that property? And and we have Airbnb. If you go further back in time when eBay was first out, who would have thought that you go and buy something you know almost sight unseen and get it shipped, you know, um, all the way across the world? And and I think it's just a constant evolution of of new technology, um, particularly with with AI. There's a certain mythology. 
um, unfortunately, with with uh, how it's been discussed in, in popular literature, there's also a lot of complex, you know, algorithms and technology and data that are non-linear in various ways. And, and so there is a, a kernel of, of, of true complexity there. And, and how do we make the right explanations or, or the right transparency to the right audiences? So I think, yeah, it's just a confluence of so many different um, aspects where, where trust becomes uh, even more of an, of an issue. Uh, so that's, I, I think, um, my take on the, on the imperative. Thank you, Feng Yuan. Um, now over to Zikin. Zikin, it'd be great to get your thoughts on how the issues of responsibility and the trust issues that Feng Yuan's just highlighted and governance come together. How do you, how do you tie that all together? Well, uh, thanks. Actually, uh, this is one of those areas we've been looking at, um, or, or rather, this is this this has been the theme, right, uh, in the development of uh, data protection practice in Singapore over the last three years, moving from a uh, a um, a model, right, that emphasised uh, getting consumers to consent, right, or working on the assumption that consumers. Uh, will be able to understand what exactly you want to use the, the data for, how exactly you're going to use it, right? And it is, and also on the assumption that it is possible, right, to foresee all future users of data, right? And capturing that in in a in a comprehensive uh, consent clause, right? And then and then to be able then to uh, to to make use of, of the data uh, as the uh, as the company has co uh, has uh, has collected it and uh, and governs it well and makes, uh, makes good use of it. Now I think we've we've seen over the last few years that this is uh, this this assumption uh, is not true for in all cases, right? There are certain situations where it, this is eminently possible and encouraged, but uh, for especially for uh, companies that want to make uh, use of new technology, to make better use of the data that they have harnessed, right? Uh, they need something a bit more than consent, and uh, without getting into uh, into a discussion of why consent actually uh, uh, hobbles that kind of use um, uh, as it comes comes up, we realize that actually uh, uh, to build trust right in the in the ecosystem around data and data use, you you can't just have the spotlight focused on consent. You need to throw a spotlight right, uh, focusing on the internal governance structures within the company as well, right? It is with that. Uh, with that um, uh, beefed up, right, then you can have uh, better reassurance that data is not on, uh, is is a well managed, right, internally within the uh, within uh, within a, a company after it has been collected, right, and there are uh, there are processes, governance structures in place to make sure <coughs> the data is well managed. So that has that has been the emphasis and 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 um, the the theme for data protection. And the use of data in, an, in a data-driven technology like artificial intelligence is one example right, of why this approach is eminently uh, appropriate right, and the right one to do. Right? Uh, it, uh, the, the way we look at uh, trust building in, in AI uh, is, is that it is essential because you are working with data right, very often. You can we, we can put in compliance uh, uh, um, measures like anonymization of the data before you use it, right? Data minimization, all those things you can put it in, right? But fundamentally, you are using data, right? And very often the case, it is personal data. But the other important thing is also right, to realize that many of the applications of this data is really to make uh, more personalized services available to your consumers. Granted, there will be situations where you're actually using it to improve operational efficiencies, you're improving your, 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 um, your processes within uh, uh, factories and all that, right? But a large number of UK use cases we've seen affects individuals, touches individuals, right? And uh, how do you build trust? You need to build trust by one, having communication. Consent, right, is, has a very important role providing the right amount of information at the right point in time in digestible bite sizes so that consumers are able to understand. That's the role of consent and that's the role of notification that we see. But moving upstream, right, when you are using data to start uh, work, uh, training your models, testing and selecting the right ones, the focus must be on good accountable practices. And that essentially boils down to three things, right? One, having uh, governance structures in place to make sure that Decisions are taken at the right level of management so that the corporation itself is, uh, is uh, taking this seriously and taking responsibility. 
Second, having the processes in place to make sure that data is sourced from the right sources, right? That handled in the right way. The right, uh, the right data set is used, right? Uh, properly, uh, a, a representative one collected properly, right? And then you, you, you are testing it properly, right? So the second area is really around how you handle the, the, the model training, right? Uh, and a deployment process. And the third one really is, uh, is what I, I, I spoke about. After you've deployed, are you monitoring per performance of the, the model? Are you providing sufficient explanation so that a consumer who is using it understands that the AI, AI is being deployed, how it is being deployed, how his, how his user experience will be affected, right? Uh, and how recommendations and personalization will be affected by his uh, uh, input data as, his, as he uses the data. In, uh, the, that amount of information has to continue. So these are the things that we thought we need to put together, right, in order to build trust, so that consumers will will, will be willing to use this uh, this new technology, and uh, enjoy the benefits, and also uh, uh, start this virtuous cycle, where this will also uh, lead to continued investment to improve in uh, this technology. That's great. M many thanks, Seekin, and of course, Singapore has very much been at the forefront. Um, leading the thinking and approach on uh, supporting the development and innovation of AI in the regulatory space. Um, on that note, um, Navrina, it'd be fantastic to hear your views as to how you're seeing companies grapple with these issues and how you're supporting them. Absolutely, Stella. So it's interesting, um, you know, thinking about artificial intelligence, uh, certainly a technology that is completely going to disrupt the way we work, learn, and play, I, I think the challenges that we found um, for the past five to six years was that most of the enterprises were treating it as certain key components. So for example, some companies were just paying attention to data. Some people and enterprises were just thinking about the black box problem. Some were just thinking about how do you bring a little bit accountability to it? And I think that is a big problematic area for artificial intelligence, which is not a technical problem only. It is a socio-technical issue that really needs multi-stakeholder diverse inputs. So at Credo AI, what we've done is we've really taken a step back and started to think about how do you bring oversight and accountability to these systems? And honestly, it is way beyond the black box paradigm that a lot of companies are trying to tackle. A big question we started to ask ourselves is how is this box, which is considered the brain, attached to the rest of the organization where a lot of these decisions are getting made? So if you think about you know, the way we define trust, especially in the context of an enterprise uh, that is building, deploying at scale these artificial intelligence systems, uh, we started to sort of learn patterns from how humans build trust. And I loved uh, David Chan's uh, um, you know, uh, uh, panel before this where he spoke about you know, the way humans build trust is through interrogation, uh, through introspection, and really to do after that impact analysis. And so at Credo, what we've done is we've really brought in the same thinking back to enterprises, and I'll give you some examples of the companies we are working with, but it really falls into three core layers of trust. The first layer of trust is how do you build trust with the people and processes, as Zekin just mentioned, that is a critical component because again, who are the decision makers? Who is trying to act on the risks uh, that we are trying to understand from these ML systems? Uh, these are the people and the processes that we put in place. The second layer of trust is really with the technical components. This is where not only your data governance, your machine learning uh, development come into place, but how do you interrogate and, and be intentional about the impact of these systems, not only within your enterprise and its business context, but also how it is going to show up in society, especially in service of humanity. And then the last layer of trust is with the environment. And this is where, you know, Credo AI, but just, uh, you know, the ecosystem we are building, we partner extensively with regulators, standard setting bodies, because when this live system is deployed in an environment which is constantly changing, either because of, you know, monitoring, either because of the new standards that are emerging, either because of the context in which that particular use case has been deployed, you know, everything changes. 
So one of the things that we encourage the Global 2000 companies that we work with is it is not just about the, you know, the algorithms that you're using. It's not just about the data. It's really stepping back and being very intentional about how this brain is going to connect to your organization and how it is going to influence the use cases, the, especially in the regions that these use cases are going to be applied to. Um, so really happy to you know, share a couple of more use cases, but as we think about AI governance, I think it's really important for enterprises to think beyond just the technical aspects and start thinking holistically in terms of the socio-technical challenges, as well as the multi-stakeholders that are absolutely needed to make this a reality. Thanks, Navreen. And I absolutely love that imagery of the brain and the holistic approach that needs to be taken to manage the risks and really engender trust um, in the use and implementation of AI. That's, that's fantastic. Um, Jason, over to you now. It'd be great to hear your thoughts from the private sector just on what you're seeing as companies are scaling AI across multiple use cases, products, and markets. If you can share some of the pain points that they're experiencing and what you've seen around some of the issues that we've discussed today. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Stella. Um, I liked what uh, Narita said about uh, it being a social technology issue. And um, I think uh, companies already have processes in place to scale technology. Um, and responsible AI is kind of new, but uh, good governance is not. And I think really the issue is that the delta between uh, the existing um, governance structures and what is AI specific risks and how do we get our, our head around those. So um, we have this thing uh, that you can't scale uh, an AI system like you scale a mobile app. You know, you can't scale chatbots and recommendation engines the way you scale something like uh, productivity tools and video conferencing and so on. And uh, from an implementation perspective, um, we, I think I have quite a similar view to what uh, Zikin mentioned earlier. Uh, we have like, we look at it in different buckets of concerns. We have that the use case itself, then you have the data, then you have uh, the model, and then like the downstream operations. And all, all these aspects uh, have their own challenges. So if I can just um, give a couple of examples uh, on, the, on the use cases. Um, the use cases that are permissible uh, varies by region. So um, our company, MSC, operates in over 140 countries, but there is no way our team would simply like press a button and release a system to 140 countries without going through these uh, governance processes. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in the US, um, as you can mention, uh, personalized advertising. And I think the US is quite free in terms of uh, allowing personalized advertising. But many parts of Asia um, have uh, different levels of uh, compliance and comfort with that. And so we would have to tailor use cases by market. I think that's the first layer. Um, the second one is uh, simply the, the data. So um, uh, AI models, uh, as you know, are driven by data. And the data sources that are relevant in different countries also vary widely. Um, in our region, uh, some countries use, for instance, uh, WeChat very extensively. But again, you move to a European market and you hardly find any WeChat users. So um, because the data sources are different, um, the data models need to be different as well. And then um, you have lots of configuration uh, at that level. Uh, and finally, we have um, um, the, the idea of models being trained in one level, uh, as for in one location, uh, often not scaling to another because simply the, the, the world is different. And uh, to give an example uh, in healthcare, uh, there was recently a Canadian company who uh, used uh, speech patterns to detect uh, Alzheimer's. And uh, it turns out they trained their model on uh, native English speakers. And so, so you know, you could kind of guess what happens next. Um, when they tested the model, and this is a Canadian company, when they tested, they tested the model on people where English is their second language, uh, the model got confused that um, someone who is not so fluent in English, maybe because they spoke French as the first language, uh, they labeled those people as having Alzheimer's. So this is a case of some a place where you um, you train a model in one location, but it doesn't quite translate to a different operating context. So we need to be very careful um, in um, the whole the whole pipeline from the way you um, you, you train the, train the model, the lineage of the data, uh, as well as all the way through to the way you apply it, the operational context where you deploy it. And also uh, like downstream aspects and, and hence the need to take a lens to address these AI specific issues and, um, 
and like mature internal governance. I also say that um, for people who are like in, in this call, like, you know, speaking about AI governance, I think um, it's also important to not be in a bubble because we think about these quite deeply. And I think uh, for the broad organizational uh, leaders, um, some of them are just grappling with AI, let alone AI governance. And so, you know, it's, um, we want to not commit to being perfect like at the start, but we want to commit to, to progress. And I think, uh, yeah, that's a good tactic to take to kind of start assembling these cross-functional teams, uh, do the hard work of getting teams to, to work together and then just commit to progress. That's great. Many thanks, Jason, for sharing those thoughts. I'm now going to move on to the, the next session and topic for discussion, um, and that's around the regulation of AI. And Zekin has already uh, very coherently given a great overview on the approach that's been taken in Singapore. And indeed, Singapore has really been at the forefront and one of the first movers in this space. Um, and interestingly, now we've seen some developments out of Europe with a new draft regulation in place for AI, which is going through the legislative process, which really takes quite a prescriptive approach around regulating the AI ecosystem um, and also a risk-based approach. Um, my first sort of question um, is to Zee Kin. Um, Zee Kin, in terms of the next steps for governance of AI, what, what, is the, what is the Singapore PDPC looking at? What is, what's the sort of focus area now that there's been the AI governance framework, there's been the changes to the PDPA around consent to support innovation? Where, 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 where are the next sort of areas for development in Singapore? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Stella. Uh, so um, uh, we, we are looking at um, uh, taking the next uh, couple of steps uh, 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 with our model framework. So uh, we had our model framework first, we had a second edition a year later after we got lots of comments and we refined it. And, we, and you notice that we haven't really made many changes to it since then because you need to stabilize that. But what we've done is actually did, uh, two things, right? We, we've uh, compiled two uh, volumes of uh, what we call a compendium of use cases to demonstrate that it is possible, right? To comply with these principles in different ways. And we, uh, we had like almost 30 companies uh, who shared uh, their, their, their practices, large, small, local, multinational companies, really just to send the message to say, it is possible. These principles can be translated. The second thing we did, of course, was a, a self-assessment guide that translated the principles into a very detailed questionnaire. The next step that we're doing, <coughs> which is something that we disclosed uh, uh, just a month back uh, during our um, ATX uh, uh, summit uh, by our, our minister, is that we are, we are converting these, uh, these um, uh, 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 self-assessment guides and principles into a uh, testing and certification framework, right? Uh, we hope to develop a, a, a minimum viable product, right? And we're uh, collaborating with uh, some others. Now, I won't go into the full details of that because it's still a work in progress. We're working with partners to do so, but it's really looking at how can we develop, right, uh, tests, right? Uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, you have got the principles in place, you are quite sure you have got it implemented by going through the self-assessment guide, then can you, right, actually have some independent uh, person come in, take a look at it, right? And to give you the reassurance as well, right? So, so that's, that's kind of a tra trajectory. And, and, and um, it is, it is um, motivated by a uh, fundamental uh, perspective that we take to this area. Now, we believe that AI is a horizontal technology. It is a building block, right? So it's going to crop up in very uh, different um, uh, places, right? Many different places and, uh, and, and uh, but sometimes you, you trace it back, it's actually the same, uh, same uh, AI, AI model, different training uh, uh, data, um, data sets, a different uh, intended application. It, 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 it looks different, right? But a lot of very common uh, data uh, things, right? So, uh, but the risks that are associated is tied more to the use cases and the sectors and its application than to the model, right? So, uh, so uh, as a starting point, right, when you want to take a risk-based approach, uh, you can't start articulating and identifying the risks, right, until you know how the, the AI is going to turn out, right, uh, where it's going to be applied. And, and, and uh, take, I, 
if, if you take the next logical uh, steps uh, in this uh, in this uh, um, uh, uh, analysis, right, then uh, you, you are actually looking at uh, identifying which are the more risky sectors, right, uh, and then formulating a, uh, the, uh, a, a framework around identifying the risk that needs to be managed, right, what needs to be managed at a pub, at, at what I would say a public policy level, what needs to be managed within an organization at, as a good uh, uh, governance practices, right? And then you can start translating that into things that you can actually look out for and test and control, right? Control and test, right? So, uh, so, so this, is, uh, this has been the typical um, uh, trajectory for uh, regulation of technology, right? And uh, we do believe that this is probably the same approach that we should be taking for a, for a horizontal technology like AI. Hence the emphasis to first develop this from as a framework for um, testing, right? And then working with willing partners, uh, private sector partners especially, right? As well as public agencies to identify what are the risks and how we can start uh, testing, right? To make sure, all right, some of these risks are, 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 kept, uh, are taken care of, right? Uh, in different sectors. And uh, you follow this trajectory, you can end up with a sector-based approach, right? To regulating AI, uh, which uh, will be built ground up, uh, risk based, right? And that's the kind of uh, approach that we think is probably most useful for now. Hence the the steps that we are taking. Now, um, uh, uh, I'll end up with a few comments about the draft uh, uh, AI Act coming out of EU. EU. Uh, in the early days, you no, know, there were uh, there, there was some uh, consternation about oh, what's what's it going to look like? But actually, if you take a step back, right? Ignore the title, right? Actually, all they did is, uh, all, all they have done is actually uh, uh, say uh, essentially two things, right? We've identified a list of, of around a dozen or so risky sectors, risky applications, right? High risk applications. Those those need to be regulated. Second, they've essentially taken the uh, the uh, EU AI principles, right, and and identified selected portions of them to say that these need to be tested, and then they've established a system to say we need to have a system for conformity tests. I would say that we are probably trying to solve the same problem, but looking at it from different directions or approaching it or building towards the solution from different direction. Uh, we believe that uh, it's probably, uh, we're, we're gonna end up in the same, same place, right? Uh, but uh, may, maybe the starting point is a bit different, but the intention and the objectives are the same. So it is essentially risk-based, selected sectors, right? And then um, identifying which are the areas that need to be uh, regulated from a public policy perspective that needs to eventually go into regulation. But then the rest of the, the other uh, risky areas, we have the work already done through the model framework, through other frameworks, the EU, uh, EU AI principles, those need to be implemented within the organization as well. So, so that's my, my take. No, that that that's great, Zikin. Um, absolutely fascinating. Just to see that you know that, that the the goals and the objectives are the same, um, but just the differing approaches. With the EU having this more horizontal approach, um, and it will be interesting to see how other countries follow suit. But it will be more of the verticals, the sector by sector, as opposed to um, the approach that we've seen come out of Europe so far. Um, but that's got obviously ways to go through the legislative process in the EU as it goes through consultation. So it will be interesting to observe where that lands. Um, in the interest of time, I'm sort of conscious that um, we've got about 15 minutes left or so of discussion. Um, I may sort of shift on now to really discuss in a bit more detail just some of the governance and solutions that we're seeing um, being adopted and implemented um, in this space. Um, and we've already touched on the issues and concerns around the use of AI. And we've also had some discussion around the sort of drive to be able to implement some of the ethical principles that have been proposed for AI. Um, and really the challenge is implementing those principles and trying to take a holistic review, uh, sort of a view in terms of making that happen. Um, so my next question, really sort of focusing in a bit more detail around governance, is to Feng Yan, and it would be great to get your perspectives, Feng Yan, on just what you're seeing companies do in order to be able to provide assurance of trustworthy AI practices while navigating standards and regulatory requirements and frameworks and approaches that are still 
evolving and are highly dynamic. How, how to sort of operate, how do companies look to operate in that environment? And uh, it'd be great to get some of your insights on that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Stella. And it's a, it's a great question. And, and I would say that everybody's still figuring it out to some extent. I think they're, they're watching, you know, um, what regulators are, 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 are the indications. They're also looking at best practices. But I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I maybe make some observations about um, uh, the kind of conversations we're, we're seeing. And I wouldn't um, underplay this, this point that it's almost like many different conversations in many different languages. You go into a conversation about AI ethics and responsible AI, and you're not really sure what you're going to be talking about, right? It, you know, because is it a, a philosophical discussion? Is it a policy discussion? Is it a data science? Is it a site reliability engineer type of question? Um, and, and people all think they're talking about the same thing, but when you actually get down to it, it's, it's quite different, right? So if you're talking to, to corporate governance, they're worried about risks, they're worried about auditability. You talk to data scientists, they're worried about version control, the right ML ops practices, you know, what kind of explainability methods are they using, counterfactuals, lying, you know, shapely values, you know, you know and, and, and when you talk to site reliability engineers, they're trying to figure out uh, once these models get to production, how am I going to make sure that they're going to continue to perform with the right SLAs, you know, the right availability? And, and you can see already the, and then not to mention when you're talking to, to communications professionals, they're worried about how do I explain all this to my customer, my consumer? Uh, and you really don't want to get into a lot of the technical details when you're uh, overwhelming your customer you know, with, uh, with all this. So, so I just make that observation that the language, the jargon, the, the types of conversations, even within one organization, um, is is so different, and and I think it, it will still be some ways to bridging that, that that conversation. So so what what we're very interested in at Basis AI, and I'm very fascinated by, is how do I bridge that policy or that legislative discussion uh, with the actual data scientists and engineers who are building these systems? Because to be honest, um, uh, and, and I think you know, IMD has has taken a lot of steps, you know, to make this a lot more concrete. But in, you know, when when you ask a data scientist to read some of the stuff that's coming out of legislation, it's like gibberish to them, right? Um, they're worried of model artifacts and, and code reviews and technical methods, um, but 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 what are they supposed to do? And either it's a checkbox that they say, well, I I think I kind of do this, but but I'm not really sure. Um, whether that's going to satisfy the, 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 the frameworks. Um, and, and I think what Zikin has talked about is really bringing it the testable criteria, bringing it kind of closer to something that a data scientist can understand and implement, that the communications uh, professional can implement, that the risk professional who's in charge of audits can, can handle. And I think that's, that's how, how I, I, I you know, think about it. That, that's fascinating. Thank you, Fen Yuan. Um, Navrina, um, when we spoke last week, we sort of discussed some of the issues that you're seeing your clients grapple with in terms of dealing with the frameworks in the US versus the EU and how to sort of navigate um, this sort of myriad of um, different principles, approaches. Um, it would be great um, to get some further insights from you around that. Absolutely. Um, one, I do, um, you know, want to give kudos to PDPC. Uh, they really have served as an inspiration uh, to multiple, obviously, government organizations across the world, especially U.S. And when we started on Credo AI journey, I would say that we did, we, we did clear, you know, very deeply look at uh, what PDPC was building. Having said that, I also want to share some observations with, uh, you know, the clients that we are working with. Um, just for the context of this uh, audience, most of our customers are global 2000 organizations uh, coming from finance, uh, banking, retail, healthcare, um, a lot now from talent management and a lot from government as well. Um, and, you know, what's been fascinating to see across this diverse set of sectors is two core things that are like emerging for us. One is really this oversight deficit that has been uh, created in artificial intelligence. And I think this sort of builds on what Feng Yuan was saying, that you know previously you had this technical stakeholders and then you had these oversight professionals coming from risk, audit and compliance, and all of them speaking very different language and incentivized by very different uh, outcomes. 
So how do you basically bridge that AI governance chasm? So at least within our client base, one of the biggest, I would say, first step is how do you bring the oversight professionals together with the technical stakeholders? And this is where Credo AI is building, um, I would say, the industry's first translation layer, which basically converts the st statistical view into a risk view. Because as you can imagine, the statistical view around are my, what is my model doing, whether it comes to precision or recall or F1 scores, et cetera, is understandable by certain sector. But then if you start thinking about how is a compliance manager or audit person really going to construe that in the context of the regional deployment, in the context of the use case, it is um, showing up in, it's a very different conversation. So, you know, most of the organizations we are working with, uh, I would say the first core focus right now is really bridging that oversight deficit uh, using this multi-stakeholder approach. And then the second thing, which I am super passionate and excited about, uh, and I, I think this is another potential of artificial intelligence, is we are seeing something called this persona metamorphosis. So previously, when you would go into an organization, you would see that you know, a policy person is heads down focus on their areas. The compliance manager is just heads down focus on their areas. And one of the things that we are seeing in all the enterprises that we are working with is that there is this understanding and empathy towards the other stakeholders and really trying to recognize that if I am coming from a risk person, how can I better understand where the data was sourced from? What were the characteristics of this data? How was this data tested? What were the modeling techniques used? Did we choose the right modeling technique? Where is the system deployed? How is it validated? Did we do fairness testing? How are we looking at the explainable outcomes? Um, is this uh, you know, system prone to adversarial attacks? So what we are finding, which is very fascinating, especially um, in the more AI mature organizations, is this metamorphosis around personas and roles that has already started to shape up and so um, I would say our goal at Credo AI is to really accelerate that because again, the faster we can get these different stakeholders with very different incentives to align on a common goal, the better it is going to be not only for the enterprise to manage risk, to build customer trust, which obviously unlocks a lot of sales opportunities and innovation opportunities. But I think again, going back to you know, serving the humanity in the right way uh, with the right use cases, I think that's becoming really paramount for us. That's great, thank you, Navrina. Um, and just you know, as you were discussing that, the sort of thoughts and reflections I was having was really, are the regulated industries like financial services, pharmaceuticals, are they already because they've had to have risk management frameworks in place? Do they almost do they have that added advantage that they can leverage? those frameworks already. And indeed, that's what the PDPC framework contemplates, leveraging the frameworks you already have to help um, identify the new risks that AI presents. So with that thought, Jason, um, and obviously your background in pharmaceuticals um, and that world, it'd be great to get your perspective on the practices that you've seen adopted to uh, set up these uh, frameworks to manage these risks and have that multi-stakeholder conversation and discussion to identify and manage these risks. Um, yep, yeah, uh, thanks for that, Zella. I think what you say is very true, that um, governance is uh, not something new. And I think many of us, uh, we work within these environments where um, like having uh, large compliance and ethics teams are our way of life. And I think uh, the way to think about it is not, um, AI ethics and governance as a completely new isolated beast, but really you want to embed it uh, into the different parts of the organization and uh, mature, uh, mature the way that we think about it. Um, I, I think in particular, I will pick on a couple of, um, of teams which I, which I found very useful in practice. And um, the, the, the ideas are very basic, but I think in, in practice is still very hard. And coming from a bit more of an AI engineering kind of a background, uh, I think uh, we need to not be tribal. Uh, and I think a team that's coming across today is uh, the need to, to translate and be very collaborative. Uh, in particular, we work uh, closely with uh, the user experience and design thinking uh, disciplines. And uh, the previous uh, speaker, David, was talking about how there are actually decades of um, expertise in these areas already. And I think uh, we absolutely want to tap on these things. 
So uh, we've been talking a bit about the technical aspects as well as the kind of policy, regulatory, risk management aspects. But I think I'll insert the third one, which is the design aspect. And I think in uh, driving towards human-centric solutions, um, our team has close partnerships with uh, the user experience groups, and we often go to engage our users together. And I must say, it's um, it's very, uh, it's just like marvelous to watch the way they they elicit different aspects of a user journey, uh, bring empathy, draw different viewpoints, and so on. So I think uh, one simple way to to start is just to acknowledge that, um, uh, our team, whichever our team is, doesn't have the full picture. And to yeah, um, start to 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 work with people groups which are very different from myself. Uh, the other one is I think uh, a bit more of a nuanced uh, danger, and I think it is um, the idea that having governance processes uh, are enough. Um, to take an example, uh, there is sometimes a temptation to like uh, implement technological solutions uh, on behalf of, of people. And this often works in, in some, some areas, but doesn't work in, in, um, in modeling and, and AI areas. To give an example, uh, we have this uh, AI ethics pillar of fairness. And um, there are many, many defini definitions of fairness, and no one definition is right. So you know, depending on who you talk to, some people might want an AI model to, to take a concept of equal opportunity. Another one might take um, a concept of equal treatment. And another group might say, you know, there's actually a case for affirmative action here. So in these uh, governance processes, uh, it's, it's very uh, tempting to say that, you know, please um, implement fairness into your program, into your system. But actually that doesn't quite work. Uh, and we need to think about these things as a conversation, uh, not as code. So um, uh, in that aspect, we would uh, double down on things like explainability, transparency, auditing, testing, all those good things but also be careful to not um, uh, implement technical solutions that take ethical positions on behalf of other groups. Uh, and I think just to, to bring it together in terms of like practical things, um, I personally find that uh, the work uh, involved in all these things is, uh, is a lot. And uh, we, uh, we hired a full-time AI ethicist and there's also a talent aspect to this. So um, I think um, uh, this uh, unique intersection of skills is something that uh, I see emerging. And um, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, the talent aspect of having new roles dedicated to this uh, specific intersection of AI ethics and governance is also something that's very interesting. Uh, we, we, we did experiment to hire an ethicist and it turned out really well. And I think um, this is something that organizations could also start to, to consider because it's just, um, it's just so useful to have someone dedicated to bring these different views together. That's great. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm conscious of time. We've got a few minutes left. Um, um, so I'd just like to invite each of the panelists just to give us a closing comment on how you see ethics and governance for AI evolving for the years to come. Um, Feng Yuan, I will ask you for your view first, if that be. Great to hear. I, I think it's, it's one of those things that, that's incredibly important, but you'll see progress over a, a, a longer period of time. And I think, uh, um, I think there's a lot of, rightly so, a lot of interest in it. Um, I think there's a lot of work you know, to, to take place, both you know, contributions from regulators, from organizations internally, you know, some of the anecdotes that, that Jason was sharing and, and what Seekin is doing. Um, and then technology providers, you know, like what the uh, Navino was sharing and what we're doing at Embraces AI. And I think all these need to come together. And, and there's still many different threads of conversation, which hopefully will converge uh, into something that, that has a real impact on, on how AI is being used, but not slow it down at the same time, right? Um, I, I think it's always important to make sure that everything that we do in the kind of pursuit of um, AI governance and innovation uh, go, go hand in hand. Great, thank you, Feng Wan. Si Kin, it'd be great to get your closing comments too. Yeah, thanks. I think that um, I, I've already spoken about how we need to take a sector-centric uh, approach, right? To develop the framework, and we've been, uh, as you rightly pointed out, we've been working with our sector agency partners, like uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, their key principle, our governance framework, how they interlock, right? And we continue to, uh, we are, and we do continue our work in, in the in the MVP I spoke I spoke about. But I think if there's anything that I would like to see, right, is that uh, this whole discussion of uh, AI ethics disappear from public discussion. 
discussion. Because if you look at the other areas that are regulated, right, nobody discusses this kind of stuff. It gets into the background. It's a, it's a B2B a business partner supply chain discussion or uh, uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, it's a regulatory requirement for those that are regulated to speak with um, the regulator to make sure it's done, right? But in the public consciousness, what do you see? Uh, you trust the brand. You trust the, the, the entity, the, the company that you're dealing with because you know it's regulated and it's in compliance, right? And, and you don't question so much. And I think that that probably is um, the end state we should be aiming for, for something like AI as well, right? That these discussions will actually be taken on by the, the I would say, um, the, 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 the professionals in both the technical side as well as the risk and regulatory side, right? And for the public, it's really back to an easier um, means of identifying and working with companies that have built that history that you that enables you to trust them. That's great. Thank you, Zikin. Navrina, over to you. Absolutely. So I, you know, I think we are still in the very early innings of what good looks like in AI governance. Uh, however, having said that, um, I'm of strong belief that AI governance is going to be the frontier that's going to power the next wave of trustworthy economies across the world. And this is going to be the bedrock that is going to help you build trust with your end customers, with the regulators, with the investors, with all the stakeholders. And our strong belief is that the companies and policymakers and the governments uh, that adopt and champion good governance, uh, especially for artificial intelligence, are going to sort of uh, end up as front runners uh, in the race for trusted brands. So, you know, for me, one of my um, guiding adages in my life has been what we make is makes us. So, and artificial intelligence is something that we are building is going to build our futures. So we better do it intentionally and with good governance. Fantastic. Thank you, Navrina. Jason, over to you for final comments. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll take a more like uh, people view of the topic. And um, uh, just before this morning, I, I did a quick search on machine learning papers to see uh, how many papers are being published today. Uh, and I just like took a week at random and I found that uh, there were 535 papers published, which is uh, over 100 a day. Uh, and that is an uh, insane amount because uh, just a few years ago, it was like a less than half that amount. And um, so I think what I see is the is AI is uh, uh, advancing very quickly, but the, the organizational thinking uh, is, is uh, advancing not so quickly. Uh, and so uh, to put it a different way, uh, doing things is getting easier and easier but doing the right things uh, is, as, uh, is as difficult as ever. So from a people perspective, I see a, a new breed of this um, multidisciplinary cross-functional uh, professionals uh, grow up uh, that kind of bring together um, these uh, traditionally softer, um, maybe for philosophical governance, artistic aspects to it, as well as the, the technical uh, aspects to it. And uh, we don't see lots of this today, but I think uh, that is um, certainly a growth area. Uh, embedding values in technology uh, will, will grow in the future. That's great. Um, many thanks, Jason. And I'd just like to thank all of our panelists for contributing such a great discussion today on just how important all of these issues and solutions are to really driving trust in the use of AI across, across the globe. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stella. Thanks. Thank you, Stella. Uh, for moderating this very interesting discussion. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists also, Navrina, Sikin, Pangyan, and uh, Jason for providing you insights. Uh, very interesting discussion. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing more of that topic uh, as we go along today. Uh, we're now turning to our second panel discussion, focusing on the topic of AI adoption, ethics, and governance in financial services. And as our moderator, we have uh, Sopnendu Mohanty, uh, no other than the Chief FinTech Officer of MAS and uh, three esteemed panelists from leading financial institutions, CBS, Standard Chartered and OCBC. Uh, first, allow me to introduce our moderator. Uh, Sopnendu Mohanty serves as the Chief FinTech Officer for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Mr. Mohanty joined MAS in 
August 2015, responsible for creating development strategies, public infrastructure and regulatory policies around technology innovation. Since 2015, Singapore has become one of the top global fintech hubs covering a wide range of financial asset classes, including adjacent technology innovations in areas like insurance, digital assets, blockchain, AI, reg tech, and green finance. Before MAS, Sotnendu spent uh, over 20 years in various roles, in various leadership roles in technology, finance, and innovation with most of his career in Citigroup. Sotnendu is a member of multiple advisory committees of multilateral global agencies, associations, universities, and governments. And of course, he is an avid speaker. Uh, so that's why we have him today, a global thought leader in fintech and an advocate of accelerated transformation of uh, digital economy for solving financial inclusion and sustainability cha challenges. So Nandu, I'll, over to you. Okay, thanks for a long introduction. I should have cut it, cut it smaller so that if we could have saved some time. Well, uh, welcome to my panelists. I think, um, uh, I would not spend a lot of time introducing yourself. Mary from SCB, Donald from OCBC, and Samir, I think they're from DBS. Together, they share 60 plus ex years of experience. In, if I had mine, I think we'll get very close to 80, 90 years of experience. So I think among four of us, we should be able to see this subject through. And I was just joking on the chat that you have a regulatory co coverage to answer questions in a very bolder way as, a, as otherwise. Uh, well, um, I was um, debating in my head what question to ask, and uh, historically, in fact, I had to tone down my this particular phrase. The bank has been cautious in adopting technology. I didn't actually want to use what cautious, but I had to be respectful to the sector. Uh, have been uh, challenged when it comes to handling new technology, and AI in particular is far, far away. Uh, for uh, for sector to to adopt uh, due to various reasons could be structural talent adoption regulatory so maybe what would be good for the audience is to just lay out a very quick given we have 40 50 minutes uh, to talk to just level set uh, looking at your respective institution and um, and and give us a sense where are you in the state of ai adoption uh, as much candid reflection would be appreciated. Uh, why don't I start with uh, Mary and then go to Donald and end with Samir. Uh, Mary, all yours. Thank you very much. Um, a pleasure to be here. And um, I, I think you're right that, uh, that banks technology adoption has typically focused on um, security and risk issues and, and potentially being a little bit more cautious. Um, but I feel that they have ignored social technology adoption factors such as um, the role of user experience, the performance, the expectation of um, uh, you know, uh, social influence, uh, the effort. And FinTech has um, lately identified these gaps and they have really developed um, exciting new opportunities to close these gaps with, with new offerings. So I think this is motivating banks to catch up. Um, and every single organization right now is uh, is really looking at new ways of using AI. Um, AI, uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's advanced data science. And like all technologies goes through um, a cycle of, um, of hype and productivity. And I think um, in our case at Standard Charter Bank, um, I mean, I'm confident that we are starting to reach these uh, productivity uh, stages with, uh, with uh, really interesting cases around maturity of, uh, of AI uh, productionalized at scale. So, I think we are now catching up and getting into a really, really good place. Okay, so you you have you have uh, you have to put in a short description. You are in a catch-up mode to get AI to a place where you want to be. Uh, uh, OCB. <laughs> I think everybody uh, is in a catch-up mode. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Donald, OCB, local bank. Uh, where do you see yourself? Yeah, like I wouldn't use the word cautious adopter. I, I would say banking has been a measured adopter. You know, I, I think we, oh, we, look, we look at some other industries start first and we see how it goes and then we, we rapidly follow. So I'd say the banks have been fast followers. 
Um, I think historically banks have had challenges because we are very complex environments. We've been bogged down with a lot of legacy systems. You know, if you go back 10 years, we were all using large kind of mainframe based systems. And I think uh, integrating AI with those systems was, was challenging 10 years ago. Um, but if you look across the banks, you know, there are a lot of areas of inefficiency. AML, marketing, fraud detection, areas like that. So I think certainly at OCBC, what we did was we tackled the low-hanging fruit first. We focused on those areas that were big issues. We generated value from those use cases. And that's really how we then managed to, to build the business case to take AI to the rest of the organization. So um, I think we're in a good place now. I think we have about 30 AI projects that are running in production. And we're managing some uh, large-scale material processes uh, using AI. In parallel to that, we've been transforming our, our back end. So in future, when we want to do more AI projects, we can do it much, much faster than would have been possible many years ago. So I'd say we're, we're well positioned for the future. Well, I'm going to now, given both of you have uh, given a very um, a broad uh, uh, perspective on where you are, I would have asked you on scale of 10, but I'll come to that scale of 10 very soon. Samir, uh, let me see whether I can push you further. Uh, unlike global banks, by the time they get an approval for a version of a technology, it's a 10 year cycle. Now, you go to bank, uh, you look at uh, the op even the operating system which they run, runs on a multiple year, year backlog. By the time it gets approved, yeah. you get authorized, you get update, it's already two cycles back. In many cases, it can be eight to 10 years behind. And here, here you come with the AI working on very latest tech stack, and you're trying to put it on top of the bank. There is a clear mismatch there. Uh, being a, a kind of a, a regional bank, we should have more flexibility in pushing this faster. Your thoughts on the adoption of the bank? So I, I agree with you, Supendu. I think one of the things that we do, which is also, it's probably our size and also speed of decision making. And I think that's that's a big advantage. And that's why you see a lot of the globals retreating from spaces uh, around that and regional. It does give us an advantage uh, around being faster, being able to try it out. And DBS has tried it out. I mean, we we went and launched DigiBank when nothing was there in India, where you didn't even never need to go. Local banks would not ha sign up a bank account with that. So, and again, it was somewhat successful. Some areas we learned from and did that. But what that helped us do is bring that all the learning back and apply it whole scale into our main markets. And that, that's been a big transformation around the game. I do think banks, I won't say cautious, I think all incumbents face a lot of challenges. I, to me, that's the honest answer. There is a lot of legacy system built in, uh, which is not ready for AI. AI is not just about, I mean, I think, and a lot of banks in the past have looked at done peripheral stuff on the AI. I will have a model and suddenly that model will work wonders and I will solve world hunger has been the kind of the approach that people have. Uh, for us, fundamentally, it is unless you change the way you operate, fundamentally, every decision, every way, every review, how you operate, you change it. Uh, it's, AI is not going to help you. you. You're not good. So that takes time. It's a big transformation. You have to change your technology. You have to change the way people operate. You have to change 30, 40 years of banking experience people have and say, look, you have to do it differently. So and to me, it's an incumbent thing. But having said that, banks are more cautious. We can't afford to be mavericks, one one shot, uh, one mistake, and then, you know, uh, there'll be like a huge audit and all that. So we've got to balance it. We can't live with a mistake that Facebook made and say, okay, nothing matters. So could, before I go to the next question, a quick uh, uh, measurement on a scale of 10. Mary, where are you? I'm always optimistic. I think we are a seven. Okay. Donald? Yeah, I would have said seven too. I mean, uh, to me, I think a seven and an eight, but our aspiration is to be a go to a 20. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, it's, a, it's an average out seven. So now, given you are an average of seven over a scale of 10, I think uh, the next question is the heart of the question of the whole panel, governance and ethics. In my way, uh, I would frame that AI to be responsible is a social, is a non-negotiable social contract is a non-negotiable consumer contract is a non-negotiable business contract non-negotiable in many senses non-negotiable many far from a public uh, stance perspective i want all of you to reflect the whole responsible ai is something you don't need to be told it is a contract you carry to your customers to your society 
Uh, this time I'll reverse the order. We'll start with Samir, Donald, and Mary. Sure. Um, so, Supendu, you're absolutely right. To me, as a banking industry and as a bank, trust is of utmost importance. And that trust comes from how we operate, how customers feel about it. And to me, what, what responsible use of AI or responsible use of data is all about continuing to further the trust and make sure that we continue to maintain and build on the trust that customers have. At the end of the day, they're, they're putting their money with us and therefore trust is paramount. Given that, we have always felt that the responsible use of AI, responsible use of data is a non-negotiable. Um, it, is, it is something that we build in in every use case whether you use AI or whether you use even traditional marketing, how do you make sure that there is a, what we, we built a pure framework two, three years ago in which every use case in the bank goes through. And it, it talks about what's the purpose of your use. Is it unsurprising? Is it explainable? Uh, is it responsible and respectful in how it's being used? And we actually run through all our use cases across the bank through that framework every time. And there's a healthy debate happening all the time as to where we are. And it's not so black and white. You could say this is there or this is not there and, and what mitigants we could do around it. Now, one of the things we have to do in, I, to me, in the long run, this will be a competitive advantage for us for sure. I think for the short run, we have to figure out how do we how do we balance speed with some of these things? How do we make sure that it's not just the banks which are slowing down because they're thoughtful around it, but we are also have a level playing field and we don't miss out on that. And that is where the big piece of work we are doing is it's easy in a bank to create a lot of governance, but how to balance the governance with speed? Both are important, but what's the trade-offs? And for us, we think about it from a materiality perspective. Well, uh, I mean, you know, Samit, just, just pushing you in a little more here because you, I the first part of the response was trust. Consumer trust on you makes a whole, whole lot of sense. But the moment you switch the gear to competition, uh, to growth, to business opportunity, the social contract becomes, start becoming conflicting. And then it starts uh, going against that, that, that principle, that, that desire. Where do you see that balance where you have to start denying your customer certain service because it is a conflict against the social responsibility? So, so I think that this is the biggest trade-off, Supendu. It, it's, there's no black and white here, right? I mean, these are the trade-offs that we have to make and we have to be make very conscious trade-offs around both because both are important. We can't say, okay, to, we don't care about the social contract. We don't care about this trust. We can't say we don't care about business growth and speed. We, we care about both. And this is where the tough decisions have to be made, the tough challenges. And there is no universal one way or the other. And you do these three things and they're okay. Every situation has to be looked at from a trade-off perspective. The second thing is, I think we also have to be cognizant of the changing social norms. And I give you an example. Uh, everyone says privacy and including me, privacy is very important. Privacy is very important. But, and then if I ask people, okay, do you use Google map? And I say, yes, I go cycling and I use Google map. Then, then what happens to privacy in that perspective? Uh, so I'm oh, okay. I'm okay because I'm getting value out of it. So for the younger generation, that value equation, win-win situation, the social ethics, what's acceptable, what's not, is also changing. So we've got to keep in mind what's the trade-off, what is the value you're providing, how can you create a win-win situation, continue to build on the trust, but keeping in mind that these things are changing over time. Good. Uh, well, uh, Donald, while you reflect on the main question, I will have an additional question on top of that. With all these things Sami spoke, does the industry need an extra governance to be loaded on what you have today? Well, answer the first question and reflect on the second part. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm I, a little I, worried I, when you, when, when, I'm, personally, I'm worried that when you put governance uh, early, it may destroy the very purpose of the existence of that new idea. So yeah, just, just yeah. keep that in mind. Yeah, agreed. Like I'm, I'm with Samir. Like I think trust is, is critical. Banking is built on trust, and it, increasingly it's going to be a differentiator for us in the market. You know, as, as the new tech providers come in, one of the ways that we're going to be differentiating from them and from the fintechs is that we are a trusted brand with hundreds of years of history and you know a good solid principles behind the scenes. You know, OCBC solid as a rock. Um, when, when AI first came out, people were saying, you know, are we holding AI to a higher state of accountability? You know, should we really be doing this? And um, initially, I, I also felt it wasn't right. But 
as we we deploy these use cases at scale, you know, I, I see that the the potential for harm from AI is actually quite considerable. You know, in the old days, we might have had someone sitting in a credit risk department making ten decisions a day, but now the algorithm's doing it and it's making thousands of decisions a day. So uh, the the degree of harm is magnified by using AI, and I think that's why we need to to take, uh, treat it seriously. You know, we, we're using in OCBC AI for material use cases, things like uh, AML. Uh, alerts, uh, auto closure. You know, if we get these things wrong, then there's potential for OCBC to be fined hundreds of millions of dollars or, or potentially even lose its license. So the harm to the bank of getting AI wrong is, is considerable. Um, and then if you take it to the other end of the spectrum, you look at the individual decisions being made, you know, the harm to the individual is also potentially, you know, quite great. You know, if I deny you access to insurance and you have a medical condition, if I deny you access to credit and it means your business is going to fail, you know, all of these things can materially harm your life. And so it's critical that we actually take uh, risk uh, seriously and look at the, the make sure that our, our models are fair. Um, do we need extra regulation? Uh, I, I personally would say no. You know, I think um, we, we've had strong model governance regulation in place for 20 years. AI is really just another form of model. You know, all that's changed is we're using slightly different algorithms. Um, so I would say we build upon what we already have. We shouldn't have one form of governance for traditional models and one form of governance for AI models. We should combine the two into to one framework. Um, obviously, AI, there are some new elements that traditional models may not have touched on. You know, if I'm using, you know, um, unstructured data, for example, the explainability gets much, much harder. And so I think we need to amend the policies to take into account those kind of differences. But uh, I personally wouldn't create a whole new framework. Uh, good. Uh, no new framework. Risks are serious. We've got to manage it. Well, Mary, while you reflect on the core question, I just randomly thought a question right now. And recently the question came to me because I was uh, I work with an uh, with organization which focuses on uh, developing financial product for women. And uh, we found out through a study, uh, not a, uh, almost every financial product are not designed by women. And it ends up creating a wrong outcome. Uh, not as a charity show, but more as an opportunity, uh, opportunistic uh, loss, because as we know, significant portion of wealth resides with women in the household. Uh, so the reason I'm asking this random tangential question is we can talk about risk, but there are things beyond risk, which you don't see. There are things from a governance perspective is the societal uh, biases it may, we may create, and that's very hard to regulate because how can I tell you you in your team, you should have an equal representation of, of race, uh, uh, gender, so the outcome of the AI engine is balanced. I, mean, I can't just frame a law like that, which is quite tough. So risk, some reflection on, on the gender bias we have in this space. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, and this is a very important question, right? So. We know that AI um, is different from traditional systems because it's data hungry. And that means that um, by developing and deploying AI and ML systems, it requires a lot of data to identify, formulate the rules, train the systems, um, and then to validate them. Um, and there's a causal link between the inputs and the outcomes is not usually apparent. Um, you know, there can be conscious as well as unconscious bias reflected in the historical data. And this is something that um, that it's um, traditionally been very hard um, to identify. I think there are systems now that uh, that can help us do that at scale. I think it's been a long journey around uh, helping us um, solve this problem uh, using technology and, and improving our models. But um, if AI systems are not governed, uh, they could potentially scale and uh, and uh, and drive bias, um, like uh, like Donald shared. Um, at Standard Charter, we have adopted uh, a risk-based approach, and um, we have, have defined the standards for the responsible use of AI, um, including core principles of accountability, uh, data suitability, explainability, uh, fairness, transparency, uh, among others. And we focus not just on the internal standards, but also on education and tooling, um, enforcement of the guidelines and standards, and also at advocacy. Um, I don't think anybody has a 100% answer today. I think it's a journey. And the journey comes as um, a collaborative approach across from regulators, from industry, and from researchers as well. So we need to continue to drive um, more opportunities for collaboration where we can, whether it's through sandboxes, whether it's 
you know, uh, more opportunities to work together on open source systems. You know, uh, given uh, just uh, thinking, just you know, to share, my worry always has been that um, while we have historical laggard in adopting technology for all the good reasons we spoke, and same time we are historically very fast in putting regulations ahead of time. So it's a double whammy in many, many ways. You get caught up in the two opposite end for a very, very poor outcome. Uh, and uh, and uh, so regulation runs faster. The risk, risk, the portrayal of risk seems to be over magnified of a sometimes genuine many sense. But same time, the adoption of technology runs three decades behind. Uh, so do you, uh, do you worry about this thing? Because this is always a struggle. Uh, a quick, quick reflection before we go to the next question. Uh, anybody can pick up. This is an open question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, Supendu, and I'm, I, that is one of the biggest worries we have of really scaling up AI. You know, and it's not just regulation. I would say even internal risk practices. Because, that, uh, you know, it, it is really how do we, and that's the continuous balance and evolution and iteration that we need to do. And I don't think anybody has, an, has a perfect answer around it, other than the way we are trying to approach it is be very use case focused, be iterative, look at what is it from a use case and the consumer perspective, rather than, you know, a blanket approach across all of that. We are also very focused on trying to do it on a materiality basis. What is, I mean, a, a contextual marketing offer very little materiality you can try a lot of stuff compared to you know other things that you're doing so how do you differentiate between the two and do that but this is this is the big debate and the big trade-offs and i think to me this is the biggest thing if banks get this wrong they will be far behind they will never catch up to the tech guys and those that get it right will will accelerate well quickly on the use case based approach do you agree donald Mary? quick quick response yeah, um, we are exactly the same at OCBC. You know, you, you could um, over-regulate internally all of your models to the nth degree. Uh, we take a use case-based approach as well. We look at the material impact and material risk of different uh, models. And based on that, the explainability, the data lineage, et cetera, um, we vary it depending on the, the potential impact. Um, we also look at the, the impact to the customer as well. You know, what's the degree of harm of doing this model. And if the customer is going to be harmed, obviously we put more controls in place, but if it's a model that's not going to harm the customer, then we're a bit more lenient. Okay, very quick. You're saying yeah, I, completely agree. I completely agree on a use case um, approach. And, um, and it's very important that we start with the needs first. And um, we tend to start with the data. Uh, people sometimes come and say, we have all these data, what can we do? And I say, that's the wrong question what is the problem that we are trying to solve? And let's first focus on the use case, focus on the problem, and let's identify what's required. And then we go through, you know, an eight step approach where we go through the needs, you know, the law, the data, the limitations, best practices, transparency, and we go so on and forth and uh, through deployment and, uh, and test and learn. And, uh, but focusing on the problem first, it's, it's extremely important. I think we are too uh, obsessed with AI. Sometimes we see people deploying AI just because they want it on, on their CV. And uh, it's not the right tool for every single problem. Uh, and we have to just be very honest about uh, the limitations it has. Agree, agree, agree. Well, uh, now I'm switching my to the third question. And before I frame this question, my apologies to three of you. I didn't want that we will create a new regulation for AI, but we wanted to create a, uh, a, an experimental framework uh, to see, again, I still say to see, and I'm still experimental in that nature, we create a program called Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency Framework. No, no intention to burden more regulation, but to, to, to examine, is there a need for a public good which will allow a national institution to have a safe place to experiment and quickly adopt changes? And, uh, and perhaps get over this challenge of individual for competitive needs, rapid testing, getting approvals and, you know, and get through the process or there are certain common goods which can come together where there's a need for a public good like, like Veritas, which runs on in Singapore, runs on the free principle. So the intention is very simple. You take a use case, you get the industry to participate, write a piece of code and check whether certain uh, framework can be tested within the scheme of the code uh, for fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. Uh, a reflection on 
how far we can go there is it a good thing or we should stop it ah, well i should uh, call out uh, donald you start uh yeah, i'm a big supporter of the current mes approach to be honest I, I was one of the parties party of five banks that initially developed the feet principles the fairness ethics accountability transparency i thought it was a great exercise because it was probably the first time you brought the uh, heads of ai together from the different banks too so we could learn from each other um what i like about the approach is that um it gives a common playing field you know we all have the same understanding now of what's required um but it's guideline focused it's framework focused rather than being overly prescriptive so i think it gives you some flexibility inside to still um innovate um i think it's been the same with the imda ai model governance framework as well you know they they, they give everyone the, the guardrails but they don't tell us explicitly what we need to do so innovation is still possible um we, we're also a supporter of the uh, regulatory sandbox because there are certain use cases we may want to do that, um, you know, it's 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 easier to get them approved if you collaborate with the regulator and you work through the sandbox so that you can actually see what we're doing as we're developing and iterating these things. So I think that's a good environment for for building out uh, new initiatives. Um, Veritas, we we. Uh, contribute to Veritas. I, I think Veritas is a good exercise because it goes beyond just having uh, regulatory principles and it tries to codify it into actual open uh, source software. Um, I think for the big banks that are on the call today, I think we'd already all built our own frameworks. So for us, it maybe is just another angle or way of enriching what we're already doing. But if you're a smaller bank and there are lots of sol smaller banks in Singapore, you probably can't afford to have a team to build your own framework. So I do think Veritas is an accelerator for people like that as well. So good initiative. Maybe um, your thoughts around this. Um, yeah, you can be a little more critical also if you want to. It's no, absolutely. This is me, so it's okay. I can take it. <laughs> so Standard Charter has been um, also one of the, uh, the the banks that has been working very closely with uh, with MAS from uh, from early on and. Uh, um, we see lots of um, different approaches across. We, we play, uh, we operate globally. We see different approaches. I think, you know, personally, um, MIS for me is, uh, is is one of the best and more balanced um, approaches um, today. And I think it has really influenced and led the way across um, all the other regulators um, uh, globally by having a very a structured, balanced approach, collaborative approach around balancing innovation with a set of um, standards which are. Um, easy to implement and really guide um, in a very, um, uh, you know, um, use case uh, experience based approach to really driving and, and implementing technology. Um, we, we do need to balance um, innovation with regulation uh, and we continue to do that in the future. And Project Veritas, I think it's a, it's a very good example of that. Samir, uh, your views? Yeah, no, I... Um... Okay, let me say it I, two ways. One is I do think that the MAS and the PDPC approach uh, is quite balanced. Um, I do think that the whole framework approach, principle-based, creates the guardrails but gives flexibility to do. And that's how we have created our own uh, frameworks within the guardrails that's there. So that's been very positive. Having said that, the one thing that I worry about and with the Veritas thing, and I would be controversial here, is that in that while... There is a lot of work going on on various techniques to, let's say, take fairness and say, OK, you run these 15 tests and then you can do that. The, some of the unintended consequences could be that we could create false confidence. We could say, OK, anybody who has done those 15 techniques doesn't matter to me. That's not the answer. The answer is really reflective and thoughtful thinking around the use case and doing that. That's one area that I worry about that, I mean, it becomes a tick in the box exercise rather than a thoughtful in the use case perspective. Second area I worry about because for if I look at for each principle, if you have 15 techniques or for four principles, you have 60 techniques, uh, even though it's not prescribed, but when it comes to the banks and when something is coming from the regulator, they would then say, okay, show us all, all the 60 techniques for everything that you do. So that could be the other unintended intended consequences. I hope not. I don't think the intention is there. But I do think that all of us here on the call have to keep pushing and uh, doing that because that those are genuine uh, worries that I have. Well, Samir, that's a very good point. In fact, one of the things, the, the worry you two express uh, is an operational challenge for us. So it's a mutual that way. And uh, my thinking on Veritas has been it is a living product. It doesn't die away with the conclusion. 
because if, if that happens, then if you're right, it end up in a pro, in a in a regulation which which will take years to unwind if it if it starts behaving differently. So it will be a living product. It will go through that the constant uh, checks against changing understanding of AI, and uh, and it is a public good. It is supposed to reflect the state of the moment uh, you are in at any point of time. Well, before I go to the final big uh, final blue sky question. Let me try to summarize in my mind a few things for the audience. First thing, all of you rated yourself very high, very good. Uh, I think it's quite optimistic in that sense. Uh, but I would not mind if you are rated yourself lower because I understand the challenges you are facing. Second, I think uh, this responsible AI as a non-negotiable contract it seems to be a common understanding, and I agree that there's no need to. Be over stretching on extra governance as long as this becomes part of the design principle, and all the risk and ethics we spoke is absolutely spot on. Then we switched switched to this whole idea of public good. I think generally generally speaking, coming together, common experiment, having common terms of references, uh, having common understanding how we should validate our own ethics and governance standard using a public good like Veritas. Welcome. But don't make it a, a, a one one off effort so that you end up in a, an unintended consequence of regulations which will be perceived and it will become real in that sense. So I have five more minutes to go on a, uh, before we close it. I'm going to blue sky something for all three of you. We all spoke uh, about AI and reason I was I, I would rate all of you to think rethink and bring your numbers back for seven to five is because. What runs below this? What runs below this AI engine in every bank is very an outdated tech stack, and the world is going to move to a future tech tech stack called Web 3.0, which is an essential of AI machine learning, IoT devices, distributed ledger technology, endpoint computing, and embedded finance. So finance is not going to be uh, something you are going to control within your uh, online banking or within your premises. And of course, the most crazy one, the decentralized finance. And every component of this new finance structure comes with an understanding. These are all self-operating financial product, which can be abstracted as an AI being the center center of this whole discussion. A quick reflection, or not quick, can take a little bit of time. I was told that we started late, so take your time. Just reflect on if we move to the future stack. And then I think you can proudly call yourself a seven. What are what what's going in your mind? What is your understanding or look in your in-house technology colleagues? Where do you think we should be going? Because our bet is ten years from now, that will be the competitive reality. Uh, this time, Mary, you go first. Thank you. I think it's a great question, um, and I completely agree that once a tech stack changes, uh, we have to be ready to adapt. And I think the most important thing that we have to adapt is our talent and culture. So by cultivating the right elements and the right skills for our talent and culture will continue to catch up. But the tech stack needs to catch up too, and we need to continue to invest in it. And at Standard Charter, we have been investing on quantum computing. And, uh, and uh, this year, uh, through our consortium, and this year, we're going to have the first uh, quantum computer uh, in the UK together with, uh, with the UK government. Um, we are starting to look and, uh, and prepare financial uh, use cases to test on this uh, quantum computer. And it, it looks uh, extremely, extremely uh, exciting. So I completely agree. We have to adapt to what's coming in the future. And as we look at horizon um, data and analytics technologies, we need to continue to invest in learning in all of them. Well, uh, somebody is writing something. Uh, Donald, you. Uh... I think we've I think we've come a long way, you know. I think when we started the, the AI transformation five, five seven years ago, um, it was a challenge because I think historically, you know, we were bogged down with legacy systems, 
uh, monolithic core banking and integrating with those was a challenge. Um, I think in the last five years, OCBC in particular, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money modernizing the tech stack. You know, it's allowed us to open up a lot, um, collaborate with partners, innovate internally much, much faster. You know, everything now is horizontally scalable, it's container-based, it's modular, and that allows us to, to, to do things much, much faster than we previously could. And so we're designing all the systems these days around microservices, which makes inter internal integration much, much easier. Um, I think we've also changed our ways of working. So the, the whole kind of waterfall SDLC days are long gone. You know, everything is agile squads now. So we can, we can again work much, much faster than we used to. I think our mindset has also changed. You know, in the old days, OCBC and probably the other banks, we were very internal focused. You know, we were looking at ourselves or maybe we'd look at DBS or we'd look at what the big banks are doing in the, the US. These days, we're not looking at what the banks are doing. We're looking at what the tech companies are, are doing in China, for example, and that's where we're trying to learn from. So I think uh, mindset has also changed. Um, that definitely makes us much more prepared uh, for whatever the future uh, throws at us, whether we're a, a seven, in some of those areas that you mentioned earlier on, I'd say probably not. Things like uh, blockchain, for example, quantum computing. Yeah, three, four, I would say, is where we are now. But we've we've put the building blocks in place in terms of culture, in per terms of technology stacks. Mm -hmm. So we should be better than we were. Thank you. Samir. Yeah, so I guess my answer for that seven was on a, uh, and the, I said going to 20, right? So there was that uh, aspiration. And it's really like Donald said, it's, our aspiration is really in comparison is the 10 firms and they are obviously way ahead and their flexibility. But to me, what will succeed in the long run is not specific tech stack because three years from now, we will be talking about five different newer tech stacks, which are the future. Um, and therefore, this idea of modular structure, swap in, swap out, continuously being able to do that, continuous improvement fast, to me, that part of the process thinking mindset is going to be the long-term differentiator because the tech and do being able to so flexible architecture, all of those things are going to be the big differentiators as we go forward. Uh, we have come a long way in how we approach it and uh, with the Digibank experience that we had in India, we built it totally separately outside with an agile methodology. Now we have incorporated. Are we there? No, not yet. There is There are significant legacy systems that we are working on. We are trying to extract the complexity from those systems from a user perspective because the future for me perspective will be about frameworks that makes it easier to do a lot of people, whereas the complexity is hidden. And only a few people know the complexity and even there you're able to swap in, swap out. So it is it is not just only a tech stack thing. It's a mindset thing, a continuous improvement thing. And those are the things that will start to differentiate. Good. And given we have some extra time to, I'm going to take advantage of this. Nothing to the topic, nothing to the panel headline. You know, one of the, you, you all somehow reflected that your rival tech companies are doing much better. But one of the product which says they're not doing much better is their irritating bots. And that chat bot is the most horrible thing the world has developed. Uh, it, is, it is useless, it is incompetent, it irritates people. Is there any product in your mind, three of you, which says that AI is still not there? Random, anything, doesn't matter. My, my is that whole chat bot. I just, it just drives me nuts. So I, I think Supendu, you, you've spot on and right. I mean, right now, AI is thought of the answer to everything. Actually, to me, fundamentally, AI and even chatbot works when it's a very narrow problem and you have a very you have a very prescribed way of saying, okay, you, you do this, you do. So one of the chatbots I used was a swap uh, swap in uh, this thing. So I have this uh, thing uh, insurance with my mobile phone with Singtel. I dropped it uh, and then I had to call them. They didn't they didn't take my call. They said, here is a chatbot. But it was very structured and I was actually quite impressed because because the answers that what they needed to know was very clear. What I was providing then the next question was very clear. So the flow was very clear and they actually I didn't do a human interaction with five minutes. I got that. But when we start to extrapolate and hope that this AI would learn like a baby, it will have answers to everything that we can throw at it. A complexity, it doesn't. I mean, it, it solves narrow problems really well right now. And that's where a lot of the expectation management is as well. Exactly. Very Samir, different. I would be very impressed if Singtel would, could have detected that you drop your phone and actually send your replacement <laughs> because they realized your phone was broken, right? I think that would be... I, I think it's a bit too much to ask, but yeah. <laughs> so very a quick, any, any quick thoughts which just tells you we are not ready yet? Any, any product coming to 
technology evolves, but but we don't have um, we are not investing enough in our critical thinking around understanding this makes sense and this doesn't make sense. I see a lot of people learning coding. I don't know if everybody needs to learn coding. I think we need to learn critical thinking around what use cases make sense and how do we think about data driven problems because there will always be new technology. There will always be faster and it will always be uh, easier to deploy and we will always continue to be able to, to solve bigger problems, um, not just uh, on our side, but collaboratively as a society. And we're gonna be able to solve things that are much more complex, but are we ready um, with the right critical thinking and the right um, cultural mindset uh, in place? And I think technology will always catch up, we'll always get there, but, but I think it's the humans that I'm mostly worried about. Sure. Well, Donald, any quick thoughts? Your irritation, your frustration? With yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with you on the chatbot thing, to be honest, because uh, the whole conversational AI, there's so many vendors out there promising the world, and uh, none of them have yet managed to deliver it. And, and sadly, it's the one that everyone sees in the movies. You know, they always see the AI talking to them with a natural uh, voice, understanding the questions, having a sense of humor. And then they deal with our chatbot and they ask a basic question like, who's your CEO? And it can't answer that. And people are always like, this chatbot's rubbish. Um, and so that, that's the one. If we can track, if we can crack that problem and we can get the AI to actually do conversational correctly, then everyone will suddenly have a completely different perception of what AI is. So whoever does that is going to be, you know, a billionaire. <laughs> Good, good. I, well, I, I think we're at the top of the time. And I, you know, I'm going to end with one little thought here. I think one thing AI needs are good human beings. And our response to society has to be at the highest level. And I personally believe that in our lifetime, depending on where we are in our life, life cycle, we have an opportunity to build a machine out best uh, outcome with good mind, good intent. What AI needs is a lot of good people, strong empathy. If one thing we have not discussed today is not people who can code, but people who have a strong empathy for just inherently being a good person. If you can get, and banks must hire people with strong empathy to build great AI. With that, we can solve the governance ethics challenges we talked about. Thanks for joining me in this panel. It was lovely talking to three of you and hopefully our audience got something out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. AI yeah, needs good people. I think that was a perfect closing to a, a very exciting discussion there. Thanks, uh, Sopnandu, for moderating this high energy panel discussion. Thanks, Mary, Donald, Samir. 80 to 90 years of experience. Uh, super impressive, right? Uh, we've heard from, I, I wanted to say, cautious adopters that uh, trust is critical, risks are serious. Uh, and we have the need to balance governance with the speed of innovation all while we have to adhere to a non-negotiable social contract. I think uh, this is a super exciting, uh, I think, conclusion to this panel. Thanks, thanks again for, for uh, your contribution today. And for our international audience, I hope also you found it very intriguing to hear kind of a good Singapore example of a close collaboration for uh, between leading banks and regulators. And you see that this can be extremely productive, open discussions, um, and hopefully leads to many uh, good outcomes for AI, uh, AI ethics and trust in the future. So now this, this ends our morning session. And uh, at least in the Singapore time zone that is. And uh, we'll take a short lunch break of uh, roughly 53 minutes until the top of the hour, 1 p.m. Singapore time. Uh, we have an exciting afternoon session, three more talks, one more panel discussion. So I hope I will see all of you uh, back here again after lunch. Thank you. So I'm Feda Zhu. I'll be moderating for the, uh, the next half of the day. Now, I'm sure all of you have enjoyed this morning with all the wonderful speakers and the panelists. And in the afternoon, we also have very nice talks and a panel for you to enjoy. Uh, let's welcome our first speaker, uh, Professor Wei Zhang. Now, Professor Wei Zhang is the Associate Professor and Associate Dean of School of Law of Singapore Management University. Um, Prof Zhang is a good friend of mine, and he is really a world-leading expert on corporate governance. He's the author of two very popular books, Law of Capital, um, and he really got the best education in law from both the East and the West. 
Um, he got the bachelor's degree from Fudan University and then the master of law from both um, uh, Wasada University in Tokyo and the Harvard Law School. And then he got his uh, PhD in law degree from UC Berkeley before joining SMU. So let's uh, welcome Prof. Zhang Wei to share with us public trust privately enforced, building trust in corporate governance. Uh, Prof. Wei, um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Feida. Uh, let me just try to share my screen with you. Uh, sorry. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be a speaker at this uh, uh, Trust Day uh, event KDD, uh, of KDD conference. So my topic today is about the corporate governance, the trust, especially the uh, trust uh, in the corporate governance uh, realm, how to build up the trust. Uh, we will see interestingly, you know, corporate uh, trust, of course, it has a very you know, public implication nevertheless, our most effective way to enforce it uh, still counts on the private actions. So let me just start uh, by, you know, uh, briefly go, uh, going over the history of the corporations. Uh, in history, maybe many of you uh, know that the corporate entities, corporation is a man-made, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a fictional, uh, you know, sort of a fictional entity, right? Uh, initially, it was uh, considered a corporation, essentially is considered as one part of the public sector, one part of the uh, government agency. So uh, every corporation um, is, you know, uh, uh, incorporated or established based on a particular piece of legislation. Uh, in England, of course, uh, initially that legislation was, uh, uh, you know, sanctioned by the Crown, but later by the Parliament. When the uh, purists, they uh, went to the US, they brought the uh, British system, right? So initially uh, in the US, we see the state governments the US states or colony government, they just uh, will issue those special charters, essentially as a piece of uh, government legislation to endorse uh, the establishment of uh, companies. So in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, structural, uh, you know, uh, uh, environment, companies are very reasonably are naturally considered uh, as a type of uh, entity that entrusted with all the public interest. Actually, there is a uh, literally a legal doctrine called public trust doctrine to describe this type of you know, entities like corporations. They basically are entrusted by the general public. Of course, uh, uh, they're supposed to do the good, uh, the, uh, the good things for the general public. Right? Um, and uh, um, most famous of those type of uh, corporations in history probably as we all know is the British uh, East India uh, Company. So in that, as I said, so in that kind of environment, the trust uh, eventually of the corporation is eventually guaranteed by the sovereign. Um, but soon thereafter, uh, especially uh, when you know a lot of business activities uh, uh, boomed in the new continent, and the demand for these corporate entities uh, rose exponentially in the 1800s. For a couple of reasons, uh, because uh, the uh, corporate you know, entity is uh, you know, especially popular and useful uh, to business people to do business. Uh, one feature of this type of entity is its perpetual existence. The people, human beings, we all die, but companies, they don't have to die. Of course, you can voluntarily dissolve it, but uh, at least in theory, it can last forever. And the second very uh, you know, attractive feature of the corporate entity is, of course, evolved later uh, as uh, the limited liability. Right? So uh, the investors, the shareholders in particular, when you invest a certain amount of money into the company, your uh, largest amount of uh, legal liability will be capped by the amount of money you invested in that entity. And last but not least is the transferability of uh, the stocks, essentially your stake of your investments in the corporate entity. So these features makes this corporate entity very attractive to business people. The demand for this entity, of course, this type of entity, of course, uh, rose. So the special chartering by you know, the government, uh, uh, by the parliament or by the crown, uh, obviously uh, could no longer meet this increasing demand. 
And most importantly, however, it's not just because they cannot meet the demand, but more importantly, it's the cost of uh, issuing license of chartering companies one by one through the legislative process. The reason is actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 I would say a well-known one now, nowadays well-known one embedded in any government, uh, you know, uh, uh, behaviors, actions, that is the rent-seeking problem. So when the government monopolizes uh, the process of incorporation, then they're back to see the corruptive behaviors, uh, or more generally we use to uh, somehow, you know, academic terminology, rent-seeking activities. This essentially is the cost, a tremendous amount of cost, sometimes not so uh, obvious, uh, or maybe it's a hidden cost, but it's a tremendous cost in any type of centralized trust provision. Uh, then uh, in the 19, uh, sorry, in the 19th, 19th century, in the early 19th century, starting from 1811, uh, those type of special legislation, government uh, a sanctioned type of appropriate entity gave its way, gave its stage to uh, so-called general co corporations. So uh, in New York, the state of New York uh, is the first, uh, I would say the jurisdiction in the world that sanctioned this type of general incorporation law. So the difference between the general incorporation law and the previous you know, specialized uh, chartering process of cooperation is Essentially, the government has no longer no longer has the discretionary power to decide which uh, group of people can be you know empowered to form their corporations. So, remove the discretionary power from the legislature, from the government in general. So, uh, instead of you know those kind of uh, uh, um, uh, approval based uh, incorporation process, now incorporation process becomes register-based. So you just need to file a piece of paper with, uh, in the case of US, the state uh, secretary of the state, then you're okay. So basically the states, uh, the government has no power to refuse uh, to your incorporation requests. That's number one, the most important. And number two, uh, the corporate entities, uh, they can just do any uh, legitimate business. A wide variety of purposes, not limited to whatever you know specific purposes uh, uh, you know are provided in those legislation, as previously uh, the case was. And the third feature is there's no more guarantee, of course, because you're no longer something you know just guaranteed by the states. There's nobody, no sovereignty to guess to, uh, to guarantee the trustworthiness of those companies. So we see those you know so-called uh, shell companies. Uh, you know, arise. Right? Um, and uh, uh, last but not least, also very important, those uh, general incorporation laws or what we call the company laws, company acts, or corporate laws, they are basically a set of what we call enabling rules. So it allows you to do, choose to do various, you know, uh, business activities. But in never forces you to do any of these activities or very seldom it forbids you from doing a certain kind of activities. So the law there, there what we call actually, I think the word probably is coming from the uh, computer science world. The legal rules there, we call them default rules. So only if you don't have your own voluntary arrangement for your own business uh, entities, then those uh, legal rules will come in. And so that is uh, what uh, I think the general incorporation will differentiate itself from the uh, previous uh, scheme. And then comes the question. Now the sovereignty is no longer the safeguard of the corporate trust, but nevertheless still, especially when it comes to the public companies, the listed company we see, it still is entrusted with tremendous public trust, right? Although from the legal perspective, now we no longer say the corporate is a public trust, Nevertheless, from the economic perspective, things haven't changed because we have so many, you know, different people, different, you know, parts of the general public to put in their money, put in their essentially their assets and give their assets, give the control of their, their, those assets to a small group of people, which is the corporate management. So how to solve to build the trusting modern corporations? 
And the answer is corporate governance. So in this regard, corporate governance essentially is a trust building mechanism. It is to fulfill the promise or the promises made by the corporate management to the shareholders. The shareholders are those who entrust their money, entrust their assets to the corporate, whereas the control of these assets entrusted are in the hands of the corporate management. So it is the promise of the uh, management to the public investors. And the essence of this promise is to advance the long-term economic value for their shareholders. So this is the ultimate purpose of the corporate. So uh, very famous, I think uh, many of you here probably are familiar with uh, Milton Freeman's uh, words that the only uh, you know, social responsibility for profit making companies to make profit for your shareholders. And that actually is embedded in a fundamental corporate governance doctrine as well. Uh, in order to safeguard, to make the promise credible, we need to have some legal mechanisms. Otherwise, the promises made will just be cheap parts, right? cheap parts. So uh, under the law, the fundamental legal rule to buttress this promise made in corporate governance is what we call the fiduciary duties of the of management. So basically the lawyers think of the corporate management as the fiduciaries of the corporate shareholders. So what exactly is the corporate uh, fiduciary duties? Uh, essentially, there are two types of duties. One uh, is uh, so-called the duty of loyalty. What it refers to is the avoidance of conflict of interest. So in this regard, we in particular see uh, a lot of stress on the independence of the board, of the corporate board, essentially it's the management or the, uh, the corporate entity, uh, the, the entity inside the corporate that oversees uh, the corporate management, the officers. Right, so to enhance the board independence is a very important agenda to safeguard the loyalty of the corporate management. Second is uh, to avoid uh, or when there is unavoidable conflict of interest, how to clean, cleansing the, uh, to cleanse the uh, conflict of interest between the directors, the board of directors and the shareholders. So one uh, mechanism that is used is to seek uh, two layers of, uh, you know, depend, uh, the uh, approvals. The first layer comes from those directors who are not uh, interested. So we say that the, the ultimate uh, purpose is to avoid conflict of interest. Then what about we let those judgments be made by those the corporate uh, directors who are not interested. So that is the first layer of, uh, you know, uh, so-called the cleansing mechanisms. We let the disinterested and independent corporate uh, board directors to decide in a case where certain part of the corporate directors are somehow uh, uh, has some conflict of interest. The second layer of this kind of uh, uh, planning mechanism rests on the approval by the shareholders themselves, because ultimately the governance is for the benefit of the shareholders. So why not just let the shareholders be? And uh, uh, apart from the conflict of interest between the corporate board and the shareholders, another important conflict may arise between the minority shareholders and the controlling shareholders. The big shareholders may exploit uh, the uh, minority shareholders. Uh, the way the law that considers to, uh, uh, to resolve this problem, again, counts on two layers of uh, approvals, as I just mentioned. Then the second part of the corporate fiduciary duty is the duty, so-called duty of care. What it means basically it is to uh, require the management, the officers and directors of the company to make diligent and rational decisions. When you decide whether to sell your corporate assets, when you decide whether to buy another company, you need to make decisions diligently and uh, you know, with good solid business uh, you know, uh, justifications. 
So uh, in particular, it applies the inform, a, an informed decision-making process. Uh, and the decision must be made in the interest, in the business interest of the company. What this means actually uh, is somehow related to another topic of this KD conference, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ESG. So business purpose means, uh, pretty much means the long-term, that's the long-term economic interest of the shareholders. When you make a decision completely detached from that long-term economic uh, benefit of shareholders, you are likely to be breaching your fiduciary duties. Uh, even if you say, I can, actually I'm pursuing some even greater and more noble kind of uh, uh, goals of a society such as E or S, probably will not pass the muster uh, under the law. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry. However, this type of legal setup has its limits, I think from very early on. Uh, it's inherent in the uh, judicial process, I would say. Because in order to enforce those type of law mandated, uh, you know, uh, rules, uh, we have to count on a somehow centralized entity that is the judiciary system or the courts or sometimes uh, the enforcement uh, regulators. So, uh, the, but the problem here is the courts are not very good at uh, evaluating the substantive merits of the business decisions made by the corporate management. Although the courts usually are probably are better uh, situated at uh, reviewing the procedures leading to that kind of business decisions. So uh, in the realm of duty of loyalty, what we see is duty of loyalty is enforced roughly through the layers of approvals as I just described. Ultimately, it is just procedures, right? One layer of approval basically means comes down to one uh, step of the procedure. And two layers then basically there's another uh, you know, a procedure. And sometimes you know, the judges have to you know, face some more substantive questions they have to an answer. In that case, we see often unsatisfactory, the judges have to use their own discretion, sometimes, oftentimes actually ad hoc discretionary powers to judge uh, certain uh, merits of the business decisions in order to tell whether this decision actually was made out of uh, loyalty. And so um, I think, uh, um, uh, a lot of efforts, especially in the uh, starting from the 21st century, have been put into uh, raise the independence of the board in order to improve the uh, corporate governance, corporate uh, governance qualities. Uh, interesting thing is, you know, uh, oftentimes a very a seemingly very independent board cannot solve the problems of corporate governance, and the court cannot tell whether to what extent the board is independent. A very famous case is the Aaron case. In the interest of time, I cannot describe the Aaron case. But the interesting thing is all those legal rules uh, installed after the collapse of Aaron, the Aaron scandal actually just requires what already existed in the corporate governance system of Aaron itself. In other words, Aaron is an exemplary uh, you know, a case of corporate governance. This is something uh, uh, quite ironic, but it's just a manifest itself that those independence-oriented uh, corporate governance mechanisms didn't work, didn't work very well. Uh, the duty of care is even more kind of, you know, lack of, uh, you know, uh, constraints, uh, honestly. So the judges, they cannot tell whether Actually, they should not tell whether a business decision made by the corporate management is a good decision or bad decision because they simply are not uh, the experts of the business world. So therefore the courts often use the very differential rule called the business judgment rule. Basically whatever rule, uh, sorry, whatever decision reached by the corporate boards will be respected by the courts as long as so forth, there's no conflict of interest as long as there is so-called kind of informed uh, procedure in this decision-making. 
The courts here, again, counts very heavily on the procedure of decision making, which inevitably leads to a lot of emphasis on the formats instead of the substance of business decisions. A natural result outcome is the corporate decision making cost rises significantly because the courts just want to see those procedures in place. They just spend money. One typical example is so-called fairness opinions issued by investment banks. Uh, oftentimes we see the investment banks is willing to issue whatever fairness opinion they want. They would like to say whatever deal is fair to your company's shareholders, as long as the company's management hire them and wants them to say so. So it's uh, a lot of you know, format without too much substance. And so even if those type of very minimal level of judicial review was considered as too uh, uh, kind of you know, uh, 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 negative to the talents uh, so that those talents will be deterred from serving on the corporate board. One uh, good example in the US is the so-called transunion case. It is a you know, corporate M&A case. What happened is you know, the board very easily agreed on a price to purchase another company. The transunion is the buyer. The buyer's board very easily you know, uh, agreed on the a price uh, proposed by the CEO of the company to pay for another uh, company, the target company. Uh, the shareholders didn't like that price. They think they overpaid. So they uh, brought the case to the court and the court uh, essentially said, okay, uh, the boards, they did, you didn't uh, um, you know, uh, uh, exercise enough diligence. You were not well informed to make that decision. Then the uh, corporate board was held liable for a breach of the care of uh, duty of care. The aftermath of this case is the whole you know, business world you know, was shocked. What happened is we see a lot of people just no longer want to uh, serve as independent directors of corporate boards. And we see the so-called DNO, the uh, director and officer insurance. Uh, uh, they just, uh, you know, the premium of the insurance arose significantly. And a lot of insurers, insurance companies simply just pulled out of the DNO insurance market. So the uh, legislators, because it is the court's decision, then the legislators moved very swiftly to install a new piece of legislation, basically says the corporate directors, you just uh, stay assured, you will no longer be required to pay monetary compensations if the court say, you are not careful enough in making your decisions. So basically this is kind of, you know, get out of the jail free card, you know, uh, given to the corporate managements uh, when it comes to the duty of care. So all these, you know, Zagreus or, you know, uh, stories just shows the centralized the way of enforce the corporate fiduciary duty doesn't seem to be very helpful, very helpful. So the real tease of the corporate governance, uh, I think uh, uh, it rests not in those centralized entities like courts or judicial system or the legislators, but instead rests in the market. Uh, I call these market forces the barbarians at the gate. Some of you may know this is actually a very famous, I think the New York Times bestseller uh, novel, the title of that uh, novel. So uh, the outline, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, idea here is the courts are not able to decide whether the corporate uh, management made a wise uh, business decision or whether even uh, the management is loyal to their shareholders. So let the market make the judgment. So this is essentially a more like decentralized type of enforcement. So in particular, there are three pieces of I call the super weapons in the corporate governance that uses this decentralized mechanism. Number one is uh, the so-called hostile takeovers. A hostile takeover is basically uh, are, uh, um, you know, sponsored or launched by oftentimes those uh, private equity firms. So those are the barbarians initially uh, as you know, that book referred to. Uh, so that book, uh, The Barbarians at the Gates, uh, in particular described the early, in the middle and early uh, 1980s, attack of uh, R.J. Nabisco, the producer of uh, Oreo biscuits. 
by a very famous U.S. private equity fund, uh, KKR. So after this uh, uh, KKR, the barbarians attacked the uh, uh, huge corporate conglomerate, Adria Nabisco, and they succeeded in taking over the control, the old corporate management had to resign, had to be basically squeezed out. So this is a multiple force that can ride in, ride those kind of management in uh, to work diligently for the shareholders because otherwise the shareholders will kick you out. And second piece of super weapon here is the shareholder activism. This becomes more and more important uh, since the turning of the century. The shareholder activist as a sort of, you know, filling the gap of hostile takeover because the hostile takeovers uh, need a huge amount of money to take over a whole corporate conglomerate. But the shareholder activism can use a small amount of money by mobilizing the fellow shareholders and coalescing the fellow shareholders to cause some, you know, challenge to the incumbents of the board and to, uh, uh, you know, cause a shake to the uh, you know, makeup of the board. And third piece is for uh, the short selling. The short sellers, what they do basically is to driving down the price of those companies with significant, usually significant corporate governance problems. Once the price of those companies, the stock price of those companies goes down, what will happen is it makes it easier for the hostile takeovers or the shareholder activists to attack, attack those companies, either to take over the control completely or try to shake up the makeup uh, of the corporate board. So um, on the other hand, we also see, you know, while I'm the champion of those markets, decentralized markets force to uh, enforce the trust uh, in, you know, uh, corporate governance, there are also people uh, take the opposite positions. They often say the market is short-term based. So the markets, they only look at the short-term benefits. And hence, very famously, those people were like to champion the so-called new class you know, mechanisms. Essentially, it's a tool, a piece of tool to entrench the management or the insiders. Uh, unfortunately, however, we see those blames laid on the markets. Oftentimes, they're more kind of rhetoric than uh, solid evidence. And uh, ultimately, from a very theoretical uh, perspective, even if we don't look at those empirical evidence, which oftentimes is not favorable to the blamers of the market, theoretically, yes, the market can go wrong. We all see the market went wrong in this rate. The problem is what is the alternative? Because after all, nobody is consistently much righter than the collective wisdom of the market. So ultimately what really matters in corporate governance, this actually is the title of a very influential uh, article published by three uh, leading experts in corporate governance, uh, one of which is uh, Lucien Babchak of Harvard Law School. So they found empirically what actually matters in corporate governance is these things, uh, the mechanisms to facilitate the barbarians attacks. In particular, they figured out this, uh, one, two, three, four, five elements here. One is called the stack of the board, the second the limits to the shareholder bylaw amendments, third point and pills, fourth golden parachutes, finally the supermajority approval for mergers and the charter uh, amendments. What these things are. In a nutshell, these are all legal mechanisms embedded in corporate charters in order to entrench incumbent management to inhibit barbarous attacks. So what these experts, the uh, scholars found is once a company removes these type of entrenching mechanisms in their corporate articles, the corporate value can significantly can be significantly improved. So here probably is an important lesson we can learn uh, from you know, how to install uh, corporate uh, the trust in the corporate governance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Wei Zhang. Thanks for the sharing on this uh, very interesting topic. I think this is a very new but very insightful 
sharing for people from KDD community as we are discussing about trust from a more techno technological perspective. It is equally important to understand what trust means and what really matters in trust uh, in terms of corporate governance. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we will need to move on to the next talk. But if any of one you in the audience are interested in the topic, please uh, reach out to Prof Wei Zhang and please also um, uh, read his book, uh, Law of uh, Capital. Okay, so next, let us let me introduce our next speaker, Prof Han Yu from uh, NTU. Now, um, Prof Han Yu is, uh, is a Nanyang System Professor in the School of Computer Science Engineering, and he is very prolific in terms of research. He has published over 150 research papers and in top venues and, and conferences and journals, and he um, worked, uh, he has joined, uh, uh, he also uh, held the prestigious Lee Kuan Yew postdoc fellowship uh, at NTU. Now let's welcome Prof Han Yu on the topic of towards a trustworthy federated learning system. Thank, you, to thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zhu. Uh, let me start to share my screen. Uh, okay, I suppose uh, everyone can see my screen now. Uh, I'll start the presentation and turn on my pointers. Okay, uh, good afternoon to you, uh, anyone in Asia time. <laughs> uh, it's my great pleasure today to give you uh, a sort, sort of a, 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 a discussion, a discussion about uh, some of the current works we are doing related to federated learning, in which we try to build a trustworthy ecosystem uh, based on this technology. Okay, so uh, as you have, uh, as uh, Professor Zhu has already introduced, uh, at least some of my information here, in case any one of you uh, wish to reach out to me. Okay, so federated learning uh, is a new paradigm of machine learning <coughs> based on the principle of preserving privacy. Okay, this is uh, in contrast to traditional machine learning, where uh, the common practice is we first gather data into a centralized location try to store the data, and then based on the, the gathered data, train models also in this centralized location to achieve certain uh, objectives. Okay? Of course, uh, uh, as many of the panels have discussed so far today, uh, due to the emergence of new regulations such as GDPR, as well as in Singapore's case, PDPC, uh, we, uh, uh, the machine learning community face a lot of uh, challenge in terms of continuing this practice, okay, which uh, inevitably exposes data privacy. Okay? So in response to this, AI researchers are trying to produce, uh, trying to propose a new uh, paradigm of machine learning based on previous ex experience in terms of uh, the study of distributed machine learning, uh, other concepts like mobile agents, in which we try to move the training of the model to where data originate, instead of collecting data first and gathering them into one location. In this way, uh, once training has finished, uh, consuming the local data, the local data never leaves where they originate, never leaves their uh, rightful owners. And in this way, by design, such an architecture will be less drawn in terms of uh, exposing privacy. Of course, it open, also opens up new uh, attack surfaces for people to try to compromise the privacy with some more advanced techniques, but uh, uh, it is an evolving process. Okay? So far, uh, federated learning is already starting to gain its upward trajectory in the hype cycle, as reported uh, recently. So it is still a very active area of research. We still have a lot of uh, problems remaining open, and we see rapid development in this field. Okay? So uh, nowadays, based on the situation facing uh, federated learning, based on how data are being divided, federated learning can be divided into different categories. The most common one is what we call horizontal federated learning. In this scenario, we'll, we'll be facing uh, scenarios like uh, a lot of similar businesses or similar data owners from very similar business verticals. Uh, they try to pull data together or, or air quote, share their data together through federated learning uh, to train a model. So, so in this case, 
they have a very large overlap in terms of the features of the local data they store. But uh, in terms of the overlapping samples, uh, there's very few overlap. Okay? You can imagine several hospitals try to come together to train a, a common machine learning model, possibly to help them improve, say, diagnostics for cancers. Okay? So in that case, uh, there will be, it will be a typical horizontal federated learning situation. Okay? Uh, there are other situations as well. For example, there is vertical federated learning uh, in contrast to horizontal. In this case, the things are reversed. The shared features, there are very few shared features, but uh, uh, we assume there are a lot of shared samples. You can see an example like here, uh, we have multiple businesses from different, different sectors trying to come together to build a model, okay? Possibly, uh, say in this case, the bank is trying to leverage people's shopping behavior as well as uh, ride sharing behavior to ascertain who are potentially uh, high quality customers. Okay, so in this case, uh, the different companies they are collecting data about uh, different aspects of people's daily life. So the feature space are very different, uh, but if they all operate in the same city, uh, in, uh, for example, in this case, we will see a very large overlap in the sample space, which will be helpful for us to try to transfer useful label information to the other parties in order to facilitate training. But if we make this even more challenging, if we assume that under this scenario, we don't have enough overlapping samples. Okay? So that would be uh, the third kind of uh, uh, scenario of federated learning, which is uh, Professor Qiang Yang's term is federated transfer learning. So in this case, instead of directly relying on the common samples, we may need to rely on transfer learning techniques to try to create, to try to leverage the non-overlapping samples from different companies through more advanced techniques to facilitate, facilitate training in this case. Okay? okay, so these are the common themes of transfer learning, uh, sorry, uh, federated learning. Uh, taking into, uh, putting that into a context of uh, uh, a long-term visions for uh, data exchange, uh, taking Singapore as an example. So this is uh, one of the uh, uh, possible future visions of trust, trusted data exchange that uh, uh, several agencies from Singapore has uh, uh, proposed before. So in this case, we were looking at, uh, if we were trying to build up an ecosystem to facilitate the sharing of data in, in order to build new models, to support new businesses, we may be looking at situations like this. Okay? We may have uh, data providers uh, in, in, the, in the lingo of federated learning. These are different data owners or participants uh, who may own data of different types based on their business, uh, based on their interactions with the customers before, and such data are potentially sensitive in nature uh, with privacy that need to be protected. And these, these data providers may need to be linked to data consumers who need to build models based on such useful data. And uh, of course, without exposing the privacy involved and we will have uh, authorities involved in the middle trying to provide oversight. Okay? It, is, it, it is relatively straightforward to come up with regulations about what kind of compliance that the different parties need to follow but uh, of course, we also need technical tools to enable the authority to really uh, carry out such oversight with the proper tools. Okay? So in, in, in NTU, we have recently set up a uh, research initiative focused on trustworthy federated learning in which we view uh, the concept of trust from different perspectives. In the context of uh, uh, privacy preserving model building based on distributedly owned data, uh, we can see that such a process can be perceived uh, as a travel between the data layer all the way to the other layer through different efforts okay, that involves different parties. Okay? Along the way, we will need to provide things like data valuation. How do we value the uh, data owned by different parties without directly looking at the raw data? Okay? And during model building, how do we ascertain the actual contribution from the data owners uh, towards the model building. You can own such quality data, but during model training, how much of such data are you really committing to building the models? Okay? 
And based on that, how do we ascertain the incentive that we need to give out to the different participants in order to motivate them to behave in certain ways that are uh, conducive for the long-term well-being of the ecosystem? Okay? Such incentives can be in the form of monetary incentives, or in the cases where people don't really uh, care too much about receiving extra income, but rather care a lot about receiving useful models, how do we use non-monetary incentive to motivate behavior as well? Okay? In terms of security, of course, we want to deter uh, uh, misbehavior uh, from whether from uh, legitimate participants in this process or from outsiders. Okay? And of course, we need to provide robust training uh, of large scale AI models uh, as these kind of models are often useful for our actual industry applications. Okay, okay. So, so that's an overview of the kind of framework that we target to build. And uh, from here onwards, I try to uh, show some of the recent work that we have been doing based on such a framework. Okay, okay. so uh, let me share with you a bit on the participant contribution evaluation research that we have carried out. Uh, and this research is uh, mostly focused on the common, the, the most common type of federated learning, which is horizontal federated learning, where everybody is trying to build the same kind of model structure. They're trying to train a model of the, uh, of the same structure, but with their own locally stored data. And there is a centralized uh, federated learning server trying to coordinate the uh, the update of the local models as well as the ag aggregation of the models produced by each of these participants. Okay, so the model parameters being sent back and forth between the servers, so that the server and each data owner and backwards. Okay? So under this scenario, we can see there are a lot of decisions a data silo or data owner in this case is trying to make. Okay? So they may be faced with different choices of data federation they can join. So they could uh, make a decision of which federation to join. And this is not a zero or one uh, discrete decision. Okay? By making such a decision, you are trying to decide how much of my local data I am trying to share, uh, uh, trying to contribute towards training of a particular model under a federation, how much of my local computational resources I'm committing to support the training of that particular model. Do I simultaneously join several data federation in order to uh, enhance my uh, potential gain without compromising the perceived quality of service, okay? without compromising my long-term reputation among the different federations? So there are a list of uh, quite nuanced decisions each data silo is trying to make. Of course, after they decide to join, a particular federation, the normal federated learning model training processes will be carried out. And of course, currently, uh, we, st we, we still need to devise contribution evaluation techniques, and we need to decide where to put these techniques. Do we evaluate the contribution of everyone towards the end, and then decide how much contribution we have and divide the whatever incentive we have among them? Or do we decide such contribution along the way uh, of uh, federated model training, which we can use such information to say, optimize the kind of uh, model aggregation we perform, or even try to decide, do we need to, do we want to continue uh, uh, engaging certain data silos or not based on the perceived contribution so far? Okay? And in the end, in order to divide the payoff among the different uh, data silos, we need to look at what kind of payoff we have. Do we have a set budget of money to be divided among the participants? Or do we have other schemes, say we have an arrangement with them to say, okay, uh, whenever the, uh, the, the eventual model, once it's pr produced, uh, whatever revenue is generated, we then share the revenue with you so that uh, uh, we can potentially make you a sort of a shareholder of a model that you built, or if uh, money is not the subject in this instance, uh, do we decide on what kind of uh, uh, version of the final model uh, you get on your hand in order, in order to compensate for your contributions? Okay? So there are different uh, kind of techniques being considered for this whole process here. 
Okay. So in terms of uh, uh, contribution evaluation, mostly people are leveraging previous research from uh, coalition games where uh, uh, the subject of uh, division of uh, incentive has been studied for quite a long time. So basically there are different uh, major uh, versions of division being considered here. We can consider assessing people's marginal gain by observing if a newcomer is being incorporated into an existing federated learning uh, data federation. What kind of improvement in terms of model performance we can observe? Or we can think from the perspective of marginal loss. Okay? What if we already have a federation formed and uh, maybe towards the end, we try to remove the contribution from uh, the, the, the local uh, model shared by each participant and see what kind of reduction in terms of the model performance that we can observe. Sometimes removing people may actually increase the model performance. If the person's actual contribution is negative, the person can potentially be attacking the model through some mechanisms. Okay? So there are these are the main different uh, types of uh, 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 thinking based on assess, assessing contribution based on observation. Okay? Assume we don't have uh, uh, other information. There are also other categories of thinking, for example, through sort of self-report or commitment. Under this kind of uh, situations, we are assuming that we are dealing with uh, uh, trustworthy uh, participants. Okay? We're dealing with uh, uh, reputable organizations and we can through contract theory or through uh, uh, of trust that we have already established to allow them to self-report the kind of uh, uh, data resources, computational resources, and other resources they wish to commit to the federated learning process. And based on that, to pay them out uh, after the model has been built. Okay. So uh, if we were talking about the uh, category of uh, techniques based on observation based assessment, the most commonly used technique currently is based on uh, Shapley value. Okay? Because during federated learning model training, there are different ways of uh, uh, aggregating local model updates into sub models. And during this process, uh, the sequence of adding people in different, adding up people's uh, model updates in different sequence may result in their perceived performance appear to vary, although it is the same set of uh, uh, model updates that we, we receive. So, uh, Sharply Value's main principle in this case is they try to understand under different permutations, under different combinations, what kind of perceived contribution one person uh, is displaying. Some, uh, summarizing this over multiple different, uh, in fact, all possible permutations uh, that we can make up different submodels and then divide that by the number of potential uh, combinations that there are. In order to make a fair evaluation based on observation, uh, to guess how much contribution that a person uh, is making towards the uh, federation. In this case, the challenge is still the same as before. We cannot directly perceive their private model. We can only, uh, sorry, directly perceive their private data. We can only perceive their model performance. Okay? The main problem here is that the calculation of pure uh, Sharply value is it, it, very complex. It is an exponential computational complexity. We have run uh, preliminary experiments before under different configurations of uh, evaluation. And you can see uh, it, it, the majority of the time being spent here is uh, evaluating the different combinations, the different sub models that can be generated. Okay? Uh, the actual Recon reconstruction of the model and the actual training of the uh, federated learning model following the, uh, the, the, the normal way of training actually make up a very small percentage if we want to uh, incorporate evaluation into model training, okay? So the cost of incorporating uh, model training, uh, sorry, model eva uh, contribution evaluation into model training is very high if we were to calculate the actual Sharply value. So the current uh, research focusing on this area is to study what kind of technique we can put in place in order not to actually calculate the real Sharply value, but to 
estimate that value as accurately as possible while improving efficiency. Okay? So there are different ways of doing this. Make the, the majority of current uh, the majority of current uh, approaches that are focusing on these two uh, ways of speeding up. One is accelerating single round of evaluation by avoiding retraining. So this is currently quite a well-established approach based on analyzing the gradients directly rather than putting the uh, combination of different data owners together and then ask them to retrain the federated learning model. So that's part of the acceleration. The other part is that to, to see what kind of pruning we can have in order to avoid calculating all these 98.5% of the evaluation uh, different combinations. Okay? Can we drop some of the combinations which are not important or which we know that uh, do not uh, uh, add much to the perceived contribution of uh, different uh, uh, participants in order to speed up this process. Okay? The current state of the art is mostly focused on random uh, pruning, so the Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, what we propose here is that we, based on the observation of certain intuitions that we can see from uh, empirical studies to guide such a sampling process, in order not to, to reduce the randomness involved and uh, preserve as much important information as possible while still significantly drop the amount of uh, evaluation. Okay. So based on such a uh, design principle, we can see now we can divide the horizontal federated learning into two parts. Okay. One part is the original model training process. There's no change about this. Uh, everybody submit their local training uh, model updates to the server, and then the server does something extra, which is to, to perform a uh, sharply value calculation based on the proposed approach. Okay? And uh, in, during the process, they can recall the actual sharply, uh, the, the estimated sharply value of the different participants, such information, uh, how to use such information is up to the decision of the system designers, whether they want to use it to uh, improve model aggregation, whether they want to make it, uh, make it uh, a basis to distribute different versions of the intermediate models to the different participants, or whether they just want to make use of it at the end in order to divide a budget to motivate people. That's up to them to decide. Okay? Okay, so this work is currently in revision in ACM TEST. We are actually performing a deployment testing with the, in the healthcare company, uh, the healthcare industry, uh, with our collaborators in China now. The situation is basically a pharmaceutical company is trying to build uh, models that can help them investigate the efficacy of different drug designs uh, by leveraging data. Uh, stored in different hospitals. Okay? So in this case, the pharmaceutical company, they are responsible for providing the incentives. But of course, they want to know uh, what kind of contribution uh, the different hospitals' local data is for making on the eventual model performance. Okay? So this falls very nicely uh, into the uh, horizontal federated learning with evaluation, with contribution evaluation situation. Talk about just now, so we deployed our GTG Sharply server together, uh, uh, actually in parallel with their current model training facilities, in order to help them determine exactly what kind of sub model reconstructions they need to make uh, during the process of evaluation and uh, report to them the actual, the actual contribution made by different hospitals during the intermediate training steps. Okay? Uh, due to the uh, Restrictions currently, we cannot show the actual company logo here. Uh, uh, we're still not at a stage that we want to release such information. Uh, it's currently being uh, under trial in three provinces in China. Okay. Based on such a, uh, that's the first step of uh, evaluating the contribution from different participants. And based on that, we can have different schemes of uh, uh, distributing the payoffs to the different participants. And within in, in this case, we need to consider fairness. Okay? During the discussion for the panel this morning, uh, we have panelists talking about there are different notions of fairness involved. In fact, there are more than 20 different notions of fairness being proposed either in AI literature or in psychology or social uh, sociology literature. So uh, it, we, we also need to look into different situations 
what under different situations, what kind of fairness principles we need to adhere to in order to maximize the benefit that we, need to, we can bring about to the federated learning ecosystem. Okay? So here I will discuss two different schemes that we have uh, proposed uh, supporting different configurations of uh, system architecture we are looking at. Okay? Although there are more of the vast majority of the models you see nowadays uh, in federated learning that are based on uh, uh, having a centralized server to coordinate uh, the collaboration, there are nevertheless uh, the fully decentralized versions of system architectures. Okay, so we'll see an example for each of them. The first one is a monetary incentive distribution mechanism under the uh, server-based uh, horizontal federated learning situation. Okay, so in this case, we are talking about a more challenging uh, situation where where we are looking at the uh, uh, distributing the uh, uh, long-term revenue from different uh, generated by the by the model okay so in this case we're looking at uh, a situation where we not only need to ascertain the contribution from the different data owners like before but we also need to estimate the kind of cost they incur okay the cost of preparing a data data set we can rely on uh, if we trust them we can rely on self report but there are other costs involved because of the nature of the generation uh, that we are distributing not a fixed budget, but the future earning of a model, there's inevitably the, the length of waiting people need to take into account. If someone joined the data federation earlier than others, then they would wait longer. So in this case, we need to model that, take that into account to model the long-term regret that they are facing when they are waiting for longer to, to be compensated for their contribution. Of course, under that situation, well, uh, we need to consider several different notions of uh, fairness. Of course, we need to consider contribution fairness. Your payoff is related to your contribution. We need to uh, consider the regret distribution fairness, okay, how long you have been waiting. Uh, of course, you, if you wait longer, you have a higher priority to be compensated. When we are reducing people's regret over time by paying them out, we also have a choice to make. Do we pay off one person in full, let him go, and then let others to wait longer for all their regrets to continue to rise before com compensating others? Or do we try to reduce everybody's regret uh, equitably over time? Okay? So there are also the expectation fairness that need to be uh, considered. Okay? So these, this is the kind of a scheme that we are proposing that jointly consider these three notions of fairness in order to pr produce a long-term uh, 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 profit sharing mechanism uh, in place. Another example would be a non-monetary federated learning incentive. In this case, we heavily relies on the uh, uh, concept of uh, trust. So in this case, we are facing the situation where businesses from the, uh, the same sector, say all banking businesses, when they are trying to build a model together, they are simultaneously trying to collaborate, while at the same time, they are competitors in the business, okay? So in this case, there may be concerns uh, that uh, they want to differentiate the uh, versions of the models they eventually each receive, okay? For example, larger banks will not want to see that the smaller banks who don't contribute as much as they are eventually receive the same model and leveling the competition field. So in that case, how do we do that? We cannot follow the current way of training, which give out all the same models at the same time. So in that case, we try to, through uh, generated small data sets, try to let them each establish how much they trust each other first. Okay? Once this stage is passed, they can each follow their local list of trustworthy counterparts to see whether they can establish uh, a two-party federation with each of them, finish training, and then look for others to continue training. Okay? They, they would stop when, once they cannot find partners who want to accept them anymore, or, or they don't have uh, other partners they want to look out for. Okay? And uh, at the moment of stopping, they would have received a version of the model which reflects how the community perceives their trustworthiness. Okay? And uh, that would differentiate uh, the, the version of the model they receive, thereby providing them with a non-monetary incentive. Okay? Finally, we'll quickly go through uh, the, the last point, which is 
uh, currently uh, uh, an area in family learning which receives very little attention is to study how the data owners react to the different uh, incentive schemes facing them when they are making their decisions. Uh, at this moment, we are trying to propose a game-based platform which help us first to collect some data on the kind of uh, uh, reactions from the different people under different conditions when they are facing uh, different uh, incentive schemes. Under such a gamified framework, we hope to build a data set which later on we can share with the research community about uh, how uh, the potential impact that can be estimated based on the different proposed federated learning uh, incentive schemes. Okay, okay. so in, in view of this, we would have, uh, once such a research, research is being carried out, we would have pro proposed the, the necessary tools to facilitate such a trustworthy federated learning data exchange to emerge, and hopefully that will help us uh, improve our future data exchange. Okay. I put some related books here if you are interested, and thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Han Yu for the wonderful talk. Yes, indeed, uh, federal learning has been really hot nowadays, but a lot of the research has been focusing on the underlying uh, privacy issues. Uh, but Prof. Han Yu has shared a lot on the on the upper level, the incentive and governance level, I think, which is very interesting. Now, interestingly, our next talk is also on federal learning. It is coming from Dr. Uh, Yun Chen Wu uh, from SBIP on the secure and interpretable vertical federal learning. Now, let me briefly introduce Dr. Wu. So Dr. Wu is a research assistant professor at the School of Computing at NUS. And he was a research fellow in database system research group under the supervision of Ben Jing Wei and Xiao Kui. And he obtained his PhD from computer science from Renmin University in 2018. All right, so let's welcome Dr. Yun Chen Wu for his talk. Hi, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, no problem, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Yun Chen Wu, I'm from National University of Singapore. And uh, it's uh, a great honor to be here to share our recent work on credit learning, uh, which is an emerging area that uh, attracts many attentions from uh, both researchers and industries, um, as Prof. Han Yu uh, just uh, mentioned. So uh, the title for my presentation is Secure and Interpretable Vertical Faculty Learning. So uh, here is the outline of this uh, presentation. Uh, first, I will briefly talk about what is uh, faculty learning and why use it. And then I will focus on the vertical faculty learning scenario and talk about uh, two main challenges in this scenario, uh, which are data security and uh, interpretability. Uh, next, I will present our recent uh, attempts on these two challenges, followed by the conclusion and the possible uh, future works. Uh, so what is uh, fair learning and why use it? Uh, the underlying need is uh, data collaboration among different parties. Um, and uh, the intuition behind data collaboration is uh, simple algorithms with lots of data will outperform sophisticated algorithms with uh, less data. Uh, as we know, data is very important for building machine learning models. Um, therefore, many parties wish to incorporate uh, more data into their uh, machine learning pipelines to improve the model accuracy. So uh, motivating examples like uh, different hospitals want to build a more accurate model for healthcare analysis, uh, like a COVID-19 diagnosis, or a bank wants to use more data from a FinTech company to improve its uh, like a credit card application model to uh, optimize profits. Um, a straightforward solution is to let these parties send their data to a trust, uh, trusted third party or to one of the parties and, and run the centralized machine learning training algorithm. However, uh, there are several concerns that uh, makes this solution invalid. One is that the strict privacy regulations such as uh, GDPR and uh, CCPA may forbid sharing uh, patients or, or clients' sensitive data because uh, it can reflect users' health condition, finance condition, et cetera. And the other is that um, parties uh, are not willing to disclose their data. 
because it is a, a valuable asset for a company. And once it is shared, um, it may lose uh, unique advantages. Uh, so uh, federated learning uh, was proposed to solve this problem, um, enabling data collaboration without uh, sacrificing uh, parties' data privacy. So in federated learning or FL, uh, multiple parties collaborate uh, in solving a machine learning problem. And each party's raw data is stored locally and not, not exchanged. Instead, usually some focused updates are intended for intermediate aggregation are used to uh, achieving the learning objective. Um, there are two main settings uh, in federated learning. Um, one is horizontal FL, um, as shown uh, in the left figure, uh, where the two parties have the same features, but uh, with different samples. And the other is vertical FL, uh, as shown in the right figure, uh, where the two parties have uh, disjoint features, um, but with the same samples. So uh, today I will focus on the uh, vertical FL scenario. Um, in vertical FL, the packets have uh, disjoint features uh, with the same samples. And usually there is only one party holds the label, uh, which we often call the, the active party. And the other parties only contribute features, uh, which are called uh, passive parties. For example, in the previous bank and uh, FinTech company example, the bank owns age and income features um, and whether the historical application is approved or not. And the FinTech company has additional features such as deposit and uh, the number of online shopping times every month. Then the bank is the active party and uh, the FinTech company is the passive party. And then they can build the model to improve the prediction accuracy for the bank to uh, reduce the cost. Uh, we, we mainly identified two, main cha two challenges in vertical FL. One is data security, uh, which means to protect parties' sensitive data. Although the uh, raw data is not exchanged among parties, uh, most approach uh, assume that uh, some intermediate information can be disclosed to other parties or server. Um, however, there are many works show that the intermediate information can also disclose parties' private data, which should be uh, protected properly. And on the other hand, uh, the secure multi-party computation approach, uh, which can guarantee that only the final model is released and uh, no intermediate information is disclosed to any party, but uh, its communication complexity really is very high. And uh, Besides um, the secure hardware, such as Intel SGX, uh, which allows the parties to upload their encrypted data to a cloud server, and uh, the training is performed inside the enclave uh, created by the secure hardware, uh, such that no one, uh, including the cloud server, can learn what each party's data is. But uh, this approach uh, usually um, rely on the assumption that to trust the hardware vendor, for example, the Intel, uh, which sometimes is not acceptable to the companies. And the, the second challenge is to interpret the prediction output um, because interpretability is very important to applications such as healthcare and the finance because uh, it is related to people's health and money. So um, for example, after a federated model is trained, the active party may use it to serve new uh, inference requests. Uh, therefore, the active party must understand um, the, pre the prediction. Otherwise, uh, um, she cannot trust the prediction result. Uh, however, it's not straightforward to compute the interpretability in the uh, vertical FL scenario because um, the active party cannot see the full data. Uh, also, we need to ensure data security such that no sensitive information is disclosed uh, when computing the uh, interpretability. Uh, next, uh, I will mainly present our uh, data security protection approach, uh, which was published in last year by LDB. And uh, mm, 
So uh, to better protect the intermediate information, we uh, proposed a solution called Pivot. Uh, the basic idea is to use uh, a hybrid of uh, threshold partially homomorphic encryption, or uh, TPHE for short, and uh, secure multi-party computation, or MPC for short, which can ensure that only the trend model is re revealed. Uh, and this guarantee can satisfy the MPC definition. So basically the MPC technique can support uh, uh, arbitrary computations, but it's uh, inefficient, uh, while TPHE can support some local computations given the cipher texts, but uh, the functionalities are restricted. So uh, we use TPHE for computing uh, some necessary statistics at local and uh, use MPC only when TPH is insufficient. So this can reduce uh, the communication complexity uh, in MPC and speed up training as we'll be shown later. So um, the protocol mainly consists of uh, three stages. In the initialization stage, uh, the parties generate TPH public key and uh, secret key shares. And in each uh, state, each iteration of the model training stage, uh, every party first executes some local computations by TPHE, and then convert the encrypted statistics to MPC for um, a secure multi-party computation. And after that, the parties can update the model jointly. Then, uh, in the model prediction stage, the feature values of an input sample is distributed among parties uh, such that they have to jointly compute the prediction based on uh, the trend model. So um, the two cryptographic techniques we use um, as threshold uh, paria crypto system for the homomorphic uh, encryption and additive secret sharing for MPC. So uh, in threshold paria crypto system, uh, every party has a public key and a partial secret key. The public key is used for encryption and the parties have to combine their partial secret keys together to uh, decrypt a cipher text. Um, in addition, this, this scheme has several homomorphic properties. One is homomorphic addition, uh, which means given two cipher texts, uh, A and B, um, the, uh, the a party can compute the ciphertext of uh, A plus B directly. Here, the brackets denote um, that this value is a ciphertext. And the other is uh, partial homomorphic multiplication. It means that given a plain text A and a ciphertext B, a party can compute the ciphertext of uh, A, B. So um, the homomorphic properties can allow uh, each party to do some local computations given the, the desired ciphertexts, um, but the functionalities are, are restricted. So for example, we cannot compute exponential uh, based on this scheme. Um, another is sec uh, additive secret sharing for MPC, uh, where a value can be uh, secretly shared um, by, for example, A1 to AM, and each party has a, uh, has a share, for example, uh, 10 can be divided into two, three, five, and uh, each party holds one piece. And uh, it requires all the parties to uh, involve uh, to reconstruct a secret. Given these secret shares, um, the parties can compute secure addition, multiplication, division, uh, comparison, and uh, et cetera. Uh, another important uh, a characteristic is that uh, TPG and uh, SS can be converted be between each other. Um, these are the fundamental uh, primitives, which uh, I skip here. So I, I will first use a logistic regression model training as an example, and uh, then briefly talk about the tree-based models. So um, the objective function of the LR model is uh, like this where n is uh, the number of samples in the training data set, and fwxt is the, the predictable uh, label given with w and the sample xt. And yt is uh, the ground truth label of the sample xt. f is the logistic function. And usually we use uh, 
stochastic uh, gradient descent or STD to update the model weights iteratively. So uh, where the formula is like this, where J denotes uh, the weight corresponding to the jet feature, and the alpha is the learning rate, and uh, uh, B is the batch size. So uh, in vertical FL, the data sets uh, usually looks like this. Um, and we, we do not require the active party to directly share its pen text label. Uh, assume there are M parties and uh, each party has DI features and only party one has the labels. Then the update formula can be reformed uh, uh, as this equation where the, the green item belongs to uh, party one and the purple item belongs to uh, party two. And the item inside the F function is actually the inner product of the model weights and the uh, sample XT, uh, where XT is distributed among M parties. And uh, YT minus FXT is the loss for sample XT. Uh, so to train the LR model, initially, party one uh, has two feature values uh, of sample X say x1 and x2. And uh, similarly, party two has the other two feature values, x3 and x4. So at, at first, uh, each party can initialize an encrypted uh, weights for uh, each feature, say w1 uh, for x1, w2 for x2, and uh, similarly, uh, w3 and w4. Uh, here, the brackets represent the cipher texts. Um, these uh, encrypted weights will be updated in the whole training process according to uh, the homomorphic properties, such that no party knows what the plain text weights are until uh, the model is finally released by threshold decryption. So to compute the loss, for example, uh, we need to compute the weighted sum. Uh, now uh, each party can do some local computations. For example, party one can compute the ciphertext of uh, W1X1 plus W2X2 by uh, partially homomorphic multiplication and uh, homomorphic addition. Suppose the result here is uh, encrypted A and uh, for party two, the result is encrypted B. Then the two parties can exchange the cip their ciphertexts and compute the ciphertext of say uh, by homomorphic addition. Here C is actually the dot product of W and X. So after that, the two parties can jointly convert the ciphertext uh, into additive secret shares using the, the crypto um, primitive mentioned before. And then uh, party one can have a share C1 and party two have another share C2. At the same time, party one uh, also provides its label Y as a secret shares such that party one can obtain uh, a share of Y1 and the party two obtain another share of Y2. Uh, next, given these secret shares, the two parties can run the MPC protocol to compute the, the loss of this sample. And after the computation, party one um, obtains a share L1 and uh, party two obtains L2. Then the, the two parties can jointly convert secret shares back to the cipher text using the primitive. And after that, each party can uh, update the cipher text of local weights accordingly. Um, here's a, the formula, which can be done by homomorphic properties. Uh, notice that uh, the updated local weights are also cipher texts which means the parties know nothing about the weight change during the training process. Then the parties can start the next iteration uh, until reaching the maximum number of uh, iterations. And finally, the parties can jointly decrypt the weights to get the final model. So uh, this solution can ensure that uh, no intermediate information is disclosed uh, during the training process. Uh, now let's see the, uh, the decision tree training. Uh, for this model, we need to iteratively build the tree nodes. And uh, for each tree node, we need to find the best split uh, with respect to the information gain, uh, whose form is like uh, this. 
uh, which uh, is based on a number of statistical information. Uh, and in this protocol, we assume that the, the trend tree model can be public to all the parties. Uh, so to, to uh, prevent the party knowing uh, from knowing which samples are available on a tree node, uh, which may link a lot of private information, we use an uh, encrypted mask vector alpha to protect the sample set that falls, uh, falls into each tree node. So the size here, the size here is uh, uh, n, uh, which is the number of total training uh, samples. And each element in this vector is either an encrypted uh, uh, zero or encrypted one. By encrypted one, the corresponding sample is available on this node and otherwise not available. For example, here alpha uh, denotes that the false sample uh, is not available on this tree node. Then the active party can compute R1 and R2 for the two classes and based on alpha and the plain text label information. For example, R1 denotes that uh, sample one and sample three are with class one uh, on this node. And uh, R2 denotes that sample two and five are with class uh, two or in the encrypted form. And after that, uh, the active party can broadcast R1 and R2 to uh, all the parties. And each party can do some local computations to compute the encrypted statistics. For example, uh, given a speed value 15,000, um, this party can compute uh, a plain text split in, uh, indicator vector of the left partition. For example, it showed that uh, samples are one, two, and four are, uh, are on the left partition if given this split. Then uh, it can compute some statistics like uh, based on this uh, VL and R1, it can compute uh, the encrypted number of samples that belongs to uh, uh, class one on the, on the left partition. And similarly for uh, the encrypted number of uh, samples belong to uh, class two. Um, after obtaining this uh, encrypted statistics, similarly, the parties can convert them into secret shares and uh, compute uh, Gini impurity based on MPC protocol and designed uh, the best split. Finally, the party who owns the best split can update the encrypted mask vector um, and broadcast this vector to all other parties uh, for uh, iteratively tree building. So uh, basically the number of statistics is uh, much smaller than the number of samples. So most of the computations can be done by uh, a local and the MPC uh, only involve involves uh, less uh, inputs, which can improve the uh, communication efficiency. And also all the intermediate statistics are either in encrypted form or in MPC form, can, which can ensure uh, strong data privacy. So uh, in the basic protocol, we assume that the trend model can be public to all the parties, but uh, given the trend model, uh, there are some privacy risks. Um, we investigate more in this work and, and demonstrate that the public uh, trend model can link sensitive inf information. So to prevent this kind of linkage, uh, we further uh, do some additional computations to um, protect the, uh, the data. But I, I would like to skip the details here. Uh, and uh, this protocol can lead to a higher privacy protection but uh, incurs uh, additional costs. So also the product, the, this solution can be extended to uh, ensemble tree models, such as uh, random forest and GBDT, but, we, uh, but they all need some uh, extra computations to ensure the uh, privacy protection, which I'm, uh, I'm also going to uh, skip here. So uh, we, evaluated, we evaluated the tree model training uh, performance uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, period is comparable to some non-private baselines implemented uh, using SKLearn. And uh, the main reason for the slightly accuracy loss may come from the fixed point integer representation to denote uh, the float values in TPH. And for efficiency, we compare the two protocols, uh, which show that 
the basic protocol is more efficient, but uh, uh, because there are two uh, additional computations in the enhanced protocol, but uh, its privacy level is lower than the enhanced protocol. Uh, we also compare period with an MPC baseline, uh, which showed that the proposed protocols can be much faster than uh, the, that baseline. Uh, so this is our solution for vertical FL, which uh, provides uh, strong privacy guarantees. Uh, now I briefly introduce the interpretability calculation that we are going to integrate uh, into this work. So uh, re recently, there are many works um, <clears throat> considering the interpretability of model predictions um, to make the predictions more trustful, which is important, <clears throat> especially for critical tasks. Uh, such as in medical field and uh, financial field, and uh, to ensure uh, safety uh, if there is a shift in distributions uh, where the interpretability can help diagnose the problems earlier. So uh, existing uh, interpretable methods can be generally classified into model-specific and model-agnostic. Simple models such as linear model and the decision tree are often model-specific as the model parameters can already explain the predictions. And other recent works like uh, Lime and uh, Sharp um, are model agnostic methods, which can be applied to uh, explain and in classifiers. We consider the model agnostics uh, methods. Specifically, we are working on supporting Lime in vertical FL with uh, privacy protection. And the intuition behind Lime is to build an interpretable model, for example, linear regression, given a set of points that are sampled at the nearby of uh, the predicting sample. So uh, the general, uh, general steps for this method is to uh, first sample points around the predicting points and build the model and interpret the model. So correspondingly, uh, in, for Lime in vertical FL, we first need to sample data points on multiple parties. And meanwhile, uh, when training the interpretable model, uh, we apply a variant of the previous privacy preserving method to ensure that the interpretability calculation uh, does not link uh, inter intermediate information. And finally, as the calculation is time consuming, uh, we also devise some optimizations to improve the uh, efficiency. Uh, we will um, include the, the, the interpretability in our factored learning system, which co uh, called Falcon, which can be found uh, in this link if you are interested. Uh, so uh, to conclude uh, in this presentation, uh, we first showed that uh, factored learning is used to protect uh, parties' privacy in data collaboration. And uh, we introduced uh, two main challenges that, are, that we are considering in vertical FL. One is to protect intermediate results for strong data security. And the other is to compute the interpretability for uh, reliable model predictions. And for data security, we proposed a hybrid of uh, TPC and MPC protocol. And uh, for model interpretability, uh, we are going to support line uh, based on the hybrid protocol. Uh, there are still a lot of work can be explored in this problem. Uh, here, here I list uh, several uh, directions, uh, mainly under the vertical FL setting. Uh, firstly, uh, pure work considers a neural network training, um, so uh, which, uh, which is actually a difficult problem as the training process is much more complex than uh, the other models. And second, uh, uh, although there are many solutions are proposed, we are not sure if uh, there are any privacy risks in uh, vertical FL setting. Uh, so uh, we, we explored the linkage recently, uh, but still need more investigations. And third, um, the cryptographic techniques, uh, you already have a high privacy level, but uh, expensive. So uh, we need to further uh, optimize the protocols to improve the performance. And of course, also we can incorporate more interpretability methods for uh, with privacy protection in vertical FL. Last but not least, uh, because 
FL is uh, executed in a decentralized manner, uh, it's very natural to combine with uh, the blockchain technology. For example, to ensure the, the accountability such that parties can verify their rewards are uh, correct and fair, or automatically distribute the rewards uh, by smart contracts. So uh, combining blockchain with FL could make uh, data collaboration more reliable. Uh, for the uh, combination with blockchain technology, uh, I would like to adv advertise a little bit about our programming. Uh, it's the Singapore uh, Blockchain Innovation Program, or as BIP for short. So uh, the main goals are to research on the uh, next uh, generation blockchain to address existing issues like uh, performance and security. And also we aim to facilitate more companies to adopt the, the blockchain technology properly in their uh, real world applications. So the projects uh, we are working on uh, that may related to uh, FL problem can include uh, like a fabric shop, uh, which is a distributed ledger system with many enhancements, uh, such as sharding, uh, real-time provenance query, con and concurrency control for uh, smart contract parallelism. And uh, the other one is a contract, uh, which is a rigorous uh, analysis tool to perform full verification for the safety and the correctness uh, of smart contracts, uh, which can avoid a lot of security risks on blockchain. And the third is uh, decentralized uh, digital identity management, which we are going to do. Uh, and it has the potential to automatically manage the reputation of the identities in federated learning. So um, you can take a look at these links uh, to explore more about our projects if you are interested in. So thank you. I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Yun Chen, for the nice sharing. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we will move on to our next panel. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank now, you. um, next is our last panel of today, which is a very interesting one. It's panel three, Responsible Business, SME, Enablement through AI-enabled hyper-personalization in the privacy-first world. And we have a, a full fleet of uh, wonderful panelists, and I'll let the moderator to introduce the panel. Uh, sorry, we cannot hear the sound. Please share the sound. Hello everyone and welcome to this round table, which is part of the 2021 KDD Trust Day. Thank you very much to Temasek for organizing this discussion. It involves speakers from time zones all over the world, so it's an impressive feat to bring so many brilliant people together in one place. I'm Alexi Mostras, a partner and editor at Tortoise Media. Uh, Tortoise uh, is a slow news company and we try and see beyond the headlines uh, to focus on what's driving the news. So I'm delighted to moderate an event like this, which also seeks to go beyond some of the headline news coverage around AI and data and drill down into the issue a bit further. And what we're going to be focusing on today uh, is the tricky but crucial question of trust and how businesses, both small and large, can make sure that trust is central to the adoption and the implementation of AI and other data heavy and potentially transformative technologies. So over the next 50 minutes or so, uh, we're gonna be talking about trust, personalization, data, and privacy, not only in respect of consumers, but also crucially in terms of businesses. And the end goal, and the last question I'll ask all the panel, is how we can get to a win-win balance 
between personalization and privacy. Okay, now I'll hand over to each of the panelists to let them quickly introduce ourselves, and then we'll get right down to the question. So Mike, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, certainly, thank you, Alexei. Um, my name is Michael Zeller. I, I lead AI strategy and solutions for uh, Tomasek, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here on this uh, very esteemed panel. Um, Tomasek is a global investment company headquartered in Singapore uh, with about uh, 13 offices in nine countries around the world. And uh, we consider ourselves a provider of catalytic capital. And we seek to enable solutions that are really um, solutions to key global challenges. But uh, recognizing that certain mega trends really influence um, virtually any industry in the world, we've formed special in initiatives around AI, around blockchain, cybersecurity, and digital transformation. And in AI, for example, we've launched a global center of excellence to really help our, uh, our portfolio companies uh, to be resilient and to be ready for uh, future growth and opportunities. And trust, I think, is, is one of the important elements that we put um, really at the highest priority of Um, adoption, development, and delivery of AI solutions. It's really paramount to our identity as a global AI solutions provider. Uh, and not just only to, to have better business outcomes, but really to also uh, implement those more responsibly and ethically, um, really taking AI ethics into account at the core of everything that we do. So incorporating trust and governments at the very beginning, not as an afterthought. So I'm very excited to be here to join the discussion today and uh, uh, looking forward to, to really debating uh, this very important issue. Thank you, Michael. That, that, that's great. Nadia, do you want to have an introduction? Yeah, my name is Nadia Tan. I'm based in Singapore and I run partnership and business development for Facebook in Asia Pacific. I've been at Facebook for almost a decade now and throughout this whole time I have dedicated myself to a single mission of and of my our team a so single mission of building many, meaningful connection within business and people. And a lot of that is a, a founded on trust, right? Like without trust there's no meaningful connection. We have gotten a few things right. The first thing is shift to mobile, building that meaningful connection and leading the way on personalized advertising. And what Facebook wanted to do now is to uh, lead the way on uh, a lot of the privacy enhancing technology while maintaining personalization. We believe that personalization and privacy can coexist and should coexist. And with that, I hand it over to you back, Alexi. Thank you very much. And I'll hand the baton straight on to Ryan Warren. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan Warren. I'm the vice president of our data strategy teams here at Salesforce. We make investments with our customers, uh, studying their data to help them really rationalize their technology roadmaps. Also dealing heavily with uh, uh, data privacy, data ethics, those types of things. Um, all in all, I've been with the company for about 15 years. I came through an acquisition called uh, Exact Target which is now the marketing side and the B2C side of Salesforce. And most of the customers that I work with in my day-to-day -day world typically live in the consumer goods um, or the retail sectors where we're just helping them navigate this really complicated world of AI, um, how best to leverage it and how to find that balance between a personalization strategy and, um, and the customer's uh, desire. Um, I think a lot comes down to uh, the value exchange that brands have with their customers and how they get that right. Um, and so we use data science to be able to find up and find ways to help our customers tap into that. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and last but not least, Daryl. Thank you, Alexi. So is Daryl here, uh, Daryl here. Uh, I, lead the, I lead regional initiatives across Lazada Group. So we're an e-commerce company that really focuses on increasing uh, trade between buyers and sellers. So helping buyers to, to buy more easily and helping sellers to sell more easily. So like, like you know, what Nadia mentioned earlier, trust is at the heart of what we do. Uh, without trust, there would be no transactions. So what we do here at Lazada is really to try and engage regulators early, as well as partners like, like you know, private corporations like ourselves 
and really try to push that envelope forward in terms of how to find that middle ground between privacy and also in terms of data uh, usage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, look, what a stellar panel uh, we've got uh, to discuss uh, these issues. Uh, Michael, um, Zella, let, let's, let's start with you if we, if we could. Let's talk about consumer engagement in this new privacy first world that we're living in. And, and by privacy first, I guess what we mean is that uh, over the last few years, um, the knowledge base for many consumers has, has, has increased exponentially in terms of how they understand companies uh, are monetizing uh, their data uh, in, in, in ways that ha has, has simply never happened historically before, not least as a result of films like The Social Dilemma. And I wonder if you could just talk a bit about whether you think that that um, has created a trust gap in consumers with regard uh, to data privacy and what industry can do, what are some of the steps that industry can do to, to regain that trust and fill in some of that trust gap? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's an excellent starting point. I think for our panel today, um, there there is a significant trust gap. I think between the consumer and uh, the business world. Um, while probably we've gotten used to, um, you know, and, and comfortable with companies sh uh, using our our um, data transparently, um, the numbers also show that a lot of the companies are still falling short of kind of the expectations of disclosing what they're actually doing. So while we, we, we kind of feel we have to um, on one side, um, consumers also feel very, uh, very much that uh, they're, they're still in the, in the dark about how companies are actually using um, our consumer data. And, and I, I think there's clearly a room for improvement of uh, how companies um, you know, inform the customer ideally that they are using the data and how they're using it and how transparent they can be in terms of data collection, the usage, the practices, and kind of also in, 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 in a way of what they feel about AI ethics, for example, and how um, maybe they, they're actually pushing on uh, privacy preserving technologies uh, such as federated learning down, downstream in order to preserve the privacy. Um, and I would say last but not least, um, uh, regulation is, is forcing companies to act really. Um, on one side, we're getting used to it, but regulators are really increasingly also focused on uh, protecting the, the, the consumer's um, privacy. And if you look uh, around the globe today, most companies have no privacy laws in place. In the EU, we have GDPR. In California, we have the California um, Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA. In Singapore, we have PDBA. Um, so this is really, I think, a, a massive movement from the regulation side to protect the customers. And that's good. But uh, I would also then say, uh, uh, being part of the business world, this also puts a very heavy burden on companies, which is good to some extent, you know, uh, holds us accountable, but it can also distort uh, some of the competitive landscapes between the EU, between the US, between Asia, because there's so many different um, uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, and uh, I'm just thinking if you add on top of that regulations for financial data versus healthcare data, it gets more and more complex. So I think um, we're learning kind of the first you know, baby steps of how to deal with that as a consumer and as a business world. Um, but there's much, much room, I think, to improve on how we deal with uh, trust in general and how we deal with transparency of using the data. I mean, that's so interesting on a number of levels because it, it, it deals with the substantive point around, around uh, data privacy, but it also deals with with you know, once you once you have that contract with a consumer, are companies transparent enough about explaining the the, the nature of that? And that the, the, those are two interrelated but 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 distinct points. So I'm glad you you drew a distinction between them. But on the transparency point, Michael, I just wanted to come back to you on on this. Like, I'm just thinking about how I use websites. I don't. I mean, even though I'm kind of you know in the sector, I don't read privacy privacy statements that that closely. So. If if the one of your recommendations to businesses is to increase the amount of transparency vis-a-vis -vis how they how they use consumer data, how do you in practice convey that to consumers in a way that they'll understand and uh, appreciate? 
That is, uh, I think that's the uh, million dollar question or probably billion dollar question um, because yeah, everybody clicks, okay, 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 right? Uh, yeah, are you okay? You know, there's cookies, yes, okay. And we don't ever read this again. And I, you know, if I put myself, uh, you know, in my personal opinion here is I, I, I'm accepting the facts, but I feel kind of, uh, you know, I'm giving up control because there's no way after the fact to say, okay, I changed my mind. You know, I visited your website, but yeah, I really don't want you to use my data because I'm not that interested. And then it becomes very difficult. So where do I go now? You know, I just clicked OK, you know, uh, 10 minutes ago. I don't even you know, know what you already collected you know, because I didn't read it. So yeah. I, I, I don't have a good answer here. This, this is something where um, there, there's clearly a, an opportunity, I think, for, for, for many startup companies to come in and help us, you know, I think, uh, streamline this overall process. But really, it's about empowerment of the consumer that you don't feel like you know, you're giving it up anyway. So we, we kind of take it for granted that I click OK and you know, I forget about it. It's really interesting, actually, that you said that. I, I downloaded recently a, a, a translation program, um, which kind of installed itself on my Mac. And, and after I downloaded it and accepted everything, I, I clicked in, into it. And it had a big red button saying, if you no longer agree with our policies on privacy, then click here. I, was, I mean, that's the first time I've ever ever seen that and it was quite welcome. Um, Nadia, let, let, let's turn to you. Fa look, I mean, Facebook is, is renowned, is famous for its ability to offer personalized uh, advertising and, and that has been a, a, a boon to, to businesses, both, both small and large. But are you seeing an increasing number of consumers anxious about how their data is being used, worried about trust? And if so, what are you doing about it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there, again, um, as a lot of consumers, they are all very much aware of um, privacy, right? And they are concerned about the way the data is being used. They are, and a lot of them also believe that a lot of companies, not just Facebook, aren't transparent about the way the data is being used. And I want to echo what uh, Michael said about the value exchange, right? Like there is. They, they understand that having a personalized experience is good. A lot of people are get, get annoyed when you get things that does, is not relevant to you. It's like 90%, like if 90% of my Facebook feed is things that is not relevant for me, I probably would be very, very annoyed. Um, so again, you know, this is a, this is having a, personalization and privacy is not at odds. That's, that's what we want to believe. And I think to solve this problem, back to what Michael was saying, is like it lies in technology. There, we're looking at like, this is like the next stage of personalized advertising. To be able to protect the privacy and to offer that personalized experience. And there is, there is a lot of, uh, we are in, in investing in this, uh, in this space, so as a lot of other companies, and I'm sure a lot of startups are doing the same thing. Essentially, it's about what data that we need to collect in order to still maintain that relevant personalized advertising that people find delight in and for business to have uh, good results in. And I think, uh, I just wanna double click on what uh, Michael says, like this optimal transparency and having the right to control and Facebook has done quite a bit in like providing the control back into the customer's hand. But again, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex issue and it's a multi-year project that we're investing in. And it's not one technology that's gonna solve everything. It's a, it's a portfolio of technology that will solve this. So, so do, do, you, do you think as the years and the months and years go on that Facebook will develop technology that will allow them to collect less data on its users, but offer the same level of personalization? Yeah, that's where we are trying to go into, right? Like what is the necessary and not um, like collecting data that cannot be traced, uh, that that it, that removes all the personalized and, right. and information, but still useful for that. There's there's many techniques to do this. And I think uh, like um, we, I think Mike has uh, spoke about it earlier in his uh, comment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ryan, uh, Let's let's turn yeah. to really interesting. I mean, Salesforce is so kind of enmeshed in this in this ecosystem, and you 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 obviously work with with dozens, if not hundreds, of businesses uh, that are asking themselves this question. How do you feel? How do you think about balancing consumer engagement and and privacy issues? Can you just talk uh, a little bit yeah. about that? 
Well, in, in a way, I think that we're we're on the opposite side of the customer journey as Nadia is, but yet they're really interchanged, right? Where Salesforce, the data that we will collect on behalf of our brands that we work with is typically post opt-in, right? So the customer consumer is actually opted in to a brand and then those brands communicate with them from there, but they use that data to be able to target thing, uh, media in Facebook, Google, and you know, really any media outlet. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I think like I relate this whole, uh, the balance that we're trying to strike almost to the holiday periods in my family when I go over to my grandparents and someone starts talking and then there's another person who starts talking and then everyone starts talking louder to be heard and before you know it the room is so loud that no one can hear each other anymore right and I think what's happened with brands is they've gone to the old tactics of just trying to be loud and so they try to reach out to consumers and there's so much that consumers are just being drowned in all this personalized uh, media. And I, I think it's interesting when we study the data. So I've got a uh, consumer apparel goods company that uh, we've studied a lot about their email and, and direct messaging programs, right? And if they communicate to a consumer more than twice in a seven-day period, there's a 50% increase in likelihood that that consumer is going to opt out. And I think what's happening in the space is that consumers are tired. They get bombarded with messages every single day. So their view on privacy and trust is not an explicit one. It's implicit. They, they feel bombarded every day. Therefore, trust is starting to wane, but they can't really explain why. And if you put a privacy policy in front of a consumer, they don't really care about the, the legal jargon so much. They just care about how they feel when they look at their phone every day and they get all these ads that they don't know why they're getting them. And then, you know, then you're in conversations with friends about a certain product and the next day you get an ad on that product. There's a skepticism of why they receive that ad, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I will say this from a data science perspective, my team spent a lot of time studying transactional information, right? We look at time series data and we use that time series data to try to predict the moments that matter the most for the customer. And I think as organizations try to grapple with AI, machine learning, data science as a discipline, they're ve it's very nascent at this time, right? So they don't really fully understand how to operationalize their businesses around those, those concepts. Mm -hmm. So they fall back to old ways. And I think they're, they're, they're losing the war. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just give you one example. Going back to that same apparel company, we did a lot of work with them about a year ago um, on something that we refer, refer to as post-purchase, right? We know that in the retail world, most customers will buy once and never again. And so... Uh, the answer for that retailer is let's bombard them, them with advertisements and get them back into our funnel, right? In reality, there's a lot of those customers that will never buy from them more than once. And that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they come in, it's episodic, or they come in during the holiday period to buy a gift. Um, maybe they responded to an ad at that time. But when we studied the data, we, we actually recognized that there was a large percentage of customers that weren't buying again based upon the fact that they bought a pair of shoes and the shoes, shoes didn't fit correctly. And the return process was wonky. So when I talk about moments that matter, the, one of the key moments that mattered for this brand was making sure that they can get in front of that customer and intercept them uh, before that problem will occur. So the answer to that question that we had was pretty simple. It was when that shoe is delivered, we send them an email or a push notification. We ask them if it fit perfectly. If it didn't, we connect them to an AI powered bot. We streamline the return process. And oh yeah, by the way, we increase the ability for the, that cohort of customers to buy more than once by 85%. And, and we move them into a different tier of lifetime value as a result of that. So I, I think the challenge for customers or uh, organizations in this world is to find those moments that they can actually intercept and mm -hmm. create meaningful value to the consumer in a way that they want to work with the brand and you will create loyalty for life. And then also understand that, you know, not every customer is going to buy from you and that's okay. You're not, you know, it, it's just 
this is the world that we live in. You're not going to have 100% market share. The IRS doesn't have 100% market share. So um, I, I think it's finding the balance and having the discipline to target those moments that uh, at least the brands that I work with, that's, that's what we're spending the, every day doing. That's, re that's really, really interesting, Ryan. And, and, and one of the things I, I kind of want to come back to you on is, does this mean, do you think, that, that actually, you know, the issue of, of data privacy and trust in how a company uses data is, um, you know, it generates a lot of headlines, it generates a lot of heat. Uh, but actually, are there a lot more important steps along the customer journey that are relevant for whether or not a customer will stay with with a company or not in if you're talking about yeah. a company creating creating trust is it more about creating trust that they have a good returns policy rather than trust that they're going to use you know your your data appropriately yeah, yeah i mean there's a lot of different examples but yeah i i think establishing trust is establishing a moment of surprise and delight i'll give you an example from my own experience um, there's a restaurant chain here in the United States. Um, uh, I, it's, I'm forgetting the name off of the bat, but at any rate, I, I, when I order carry out uh, PF Chang's, PF Chang's, right? And when I order carry out from PF Chang's, they always ask me if I want to order the same thing that I ordered the first time. And it saves me all just the pain of trying to remember the menu and all those things. And I'm like, what did I order? And they go through what I ordered. I pull up to the back of the restaurant. They bring it out to me in a safe way. And I, I, it's awesome. If I receive an advertisement from PF Chang's, I'm, I'm actually like, okay, that, that's a brand that I trust. Yeah. And it, it's received without a visceral, horrible reaction, right? And I, I think that um, we have just gotten so punch drunk in the business community of creating short-term revenue and, and trying to use this reach and frequency, just pound the customer, pound the customer, that if we took a step back and tried to create a couple of those delightful moments, that your mm -hmm. advertising will actually work better. As a result, and we've studied the causal effect of these things, and we show there is cause, causal effect for meaningful customer experience and um, a positive response to adverts. Okay, okay, fantastic. Well, look, let's let's turn to Daryl now, if 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 we might. I mean, Daryl, you t tell us from your perspective, running e-commerce platforms, significant e-commerce platforms, how you think about th this issue, the, the personalization versus privacy issue. So, so we utilize collaboration a lot to maintain trust across the ecosystem uh, on how data is being used responsibly. Uh, and, you know, in one part, we utilize a lot of consumer research to understand consumers' privacy concerns, uh, how those concerns vary across time, uh, maybe because of, you know, uh, trendy topics, maybe because of um, the exposure to certain key trends. Uh, so we do take some of these consumer research uh, into when into factor when you know we are planning out uh, some of the new uh, privacy issues and safeguards that we want to put in place, uh, we also actively work with regulators and you know uh, we comply with industry standards uh, certificates on the ethical use of data uh, to strengthen trust. Uh, and I think the third part it's really somewhat more interesting as well. Uh, we also utilize quite a bit of education uh, to share with the consumers on how data has been used uh, across our businesses so that they can derive value, right? They can actually enjoy value from it. Um, I wanted to bring across an example of toilet paper, which I think, you know, toilet paper has suddenly become a precious co commodity, uh, you know, over the past one year in every country that we are in, right? And, and I'm sure, you know, regionally as well, uh, even in the US. Um, and, and we realized that um, toilet paper started running out. And, and this, is a, this is a great story on how as, as we start to look at data, uh, data can be really useful to help us become more efficient, effective, and also evergreen in running our business, right? Effective meaning that today when buyers come to our platform, they want to get toilet paper, they want to get essential goods, they want to get their groceries, can they actually get access to, 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 to such products? During the pandemic, we realized that, you know, uh, our reaction timings, if we were to do a knee-jerk reaction and purchase and source for more toilet paper, meat, vegetables, milk, eggs, the list, the list goes on, right? Uh, we would not be able to react in time because there is this phenomenon called the buoy effect. 
So, so of course, then the other, the other way to look at it is, you know, how about we restock as much as we can in terms of supply? The problem then comes in with efficiency, right? Because if you were to just restock blindly, the entire process becomes very inefficient. Warehousing, there is cost involved. Labor, there is cost involved. In a lot of these essential goods that we're looking at, these are perishables. So that wastage of those products actually in turn would get priced back to the consumers. So once you take one step back and look at how data can be used as a force for good in terms of making the whole business operations more effective. Today, you wanna go and get toilet paper, you get toilet paper. It makes things more efficient, not just from a cost perspective, but also from an entire operations perspective. And I think the third one is that you look at it from a sustainability point of view, wastage has really gone down a lot by leveraging on data. And when we look at data in, in this case, do we look at specific data? Uh, I think Ryan, Ryan brought up a really good example earlier as well, right? So it's the same thing here in our grocery business. In fact, in the wider e-commerce business as well. There are some products that, that are pretty episodal, very seasonal that you would get it, right? Because, you know, all of a sudden I, I'm renovating my house. I want to get some stuff, right? I want to get a study table, for example, but I would not need it every other week. Right? And then I would have other grocery products as well where, you know, maybe there is a certain trend, like I'll, I'll never get maybe leeks, for example, right? I, I, I don't eat celery, for example, but I eat a bunch of fruits, right? And I have specific fruits that I would go for. So can, can my process then become a lot easier? Can it be a lot more convenient for me such that when I come in today, five minutes, I get my entire household grocery list done. Right? I save a lot of time. I get exactly what I want. Then on the other side, if you look at amalgamated data, right, aggregated data, data that is not specific, data that is you analyzed in bulk, you then can start to see the demand patterns, the supply patterns. And I think that has really helped us in terms of identifying which products do we want to start, start sourcing for more, more start, start, start to source for more uh, sources for those products, right? Uh, where we can get, you know, maybe eggs from an alternative sources so that in every country that we are in, uh, when you need essential items, you can get it. And that's really interesting. I, I, I mean, that follows on beautifully to, to, to the last question in this, in this section, which is about whether there's a trade-off between the volume and quality of data that consumers are willing to share and, and your ability to take that data and to innovate in order to reduce exactly what you're talking about, wastage and, and everything else. Exactly. Is, there that, is there that trade-off and how, how do you handle it? There is. So, so definitely there would be a trade-off. Uh, but I guess, again, it's not a binary uh, uh, kind of uh, topic, right? So it's not either or. I think it's somewhere in the middle, right? So today we, what we realized was that there are some products, there are some transactions that, for example, you know, consumers might, might opt out from, right? And, 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 you know, given, and I think Michael mentioned it well earlier, this, in, in this entire industry, I think digitization uh, has started to, to accelerate a lot over the past mm -hmm. year as well. Uh, a lot of companies that we have seen who were completely offline, traditional, uh, we have started bringing them onto our platform as well. Uh, a, a huge reason is because, you know, with the lockdowns across the region, I mean, today as we speak across Southeast Asia, majority of the countries are still under heightened measures, right? Yeah. So a lot of these businesses cannot operate as per normal. They have started switching online. And I think part of that would then create that, that whole process whereby Today, I think, you know, we try our best. Uh, if, if, the, if the sellers are willing, for example, uh, we can actually streamline the entire process of uploading their products onto our platform a lot faster, right? Using, using picture recognition, uh, pixel recognition as well, we can start to help them categorize their products a lot faster. And I guess the trade-off really comes in where, you know, um, how do we then find that right balance Right, between personalization and privacy, right? What, what, what products, what information, like location, for example, yeah. um, um, I, the, the, the demographic of the user, for example, I think we treat all these certain sets of data uh, with great privacy. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, just before we move on to the next session of the discussion, which is going to talk about personalization in the context of consumers, I see that both uh, Nadia and Michael have raised their yellow Zoom hand. Uh, so I'm going to go to, to Nadia first, and then Michael, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I'll keep it short. I think just to talk about the trade-off, I, I like to use a KonMari principle in collecting data. First, ask with the why. Why are we collecting? What's worth keeping? And what's not worth keeping because we don't understand the value of the data that's keeping default is don't keep it right we are not hoarding this massive amount of data and i think one area that is very important and we don't touch about this we talk a lot about data but it's actually 
getting the entire organization to understand that privacy is not something that you must do, but actually this is a um, competitive advantage for a lot of businesses because if the consumers do not trust you, they are not going to buy from you. And like protecting privacy is really important. It's a competitive advantage for the business while keeping privacy, personalization can go on as well. Nadia, how do, how do you define privacy in that context? Having, having data that you can't trace back to a personal information. Right. Right. So, and um, Michael. Yeah, and uh, I, I actually originally, when, when you asked the question, I wanted to answer it in, in, in a typical data science question. Yeah, the more data, the better, right? The higher the quality, the better, right? That's It's directly linked to the outcome. And uh, um, that's probably one way to, to look at this. So the general you know, uh, consensus is the more data I have, the higher quality my data is, the better I can kind of work with it and the better is the outcome, but there's certainly a trade-off. Um, but as we were talking earlier, Ryan mentioned, I think one other very important thing and that is the time, right? The, the time series of that data. Now the time is essential. The right message at the right time is great. The same message at the wrong time means uh, either nothing or even annoys me. So moments that matter, I think is a really nice, uh, uh, concise way of defining that, you know, looking at it, like I don't need just more data and more quality, a higher quality, but I also need to know when I can use it. Uh, and then I can take that uh, and turn it into a win-win for the company and for the consumer, because it's all about, I think our consumer delight. We're, we're so used to it. And um, um, when, when he was talking about uh, ordering food, uh, same here as we, we my, my personal experience also was in, in kind of the food ordering uh, process over the last uh, year and a half, right, which we've done probably many more times than ever before. Um, it was good. I mean, most of the time food arrives, you're happy with it. And sometimes it's like, oh, well, this time yeah, it's, it's cold, it's too late, right? And so I happened to say, well, I'm not too happy with this. And immediately I got a, you know, a refund. And then just that small little element of, well, we'll give you 50% back without even asking any further questions, just made me, I think, uh, a happy consumer. And so I, I, next time I didn't even think twice um, about using that app. So I think it's all about you know, consumer delight in turning the, 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 the sharing of data into something that's win-win that's, uh, for consumer and the business and uh, kind of becomes natural going forward. And, you know, not the lose-lose scenario where I don't like sharing, so there's no personalization, so mm. I suffer even more, and pretty much I'm going to be not using that particular app anymore. Sorry to interrupt, but on that, on that surprise and delight point, right, what I don't understand quite is why there is necessarily a relationship between offering a consumer that surprise and delight and, you know, sharing a huge amount of data. If you're on a, a food app and you ask for a refund, it doesn't need more data to offer you a 50% token. That That is probably correct. So so it may, maybe that's not the precise example, but at the end of the day, the more I think the business knows about you, your preferences, um, you know, how quickly you are annoyed as a customer, right? And how sensitive you are to bad experiences, um, that, that uh, the business can turn that into into an advantage. Um, so uh, I think uh, the more data or the more precise um, knowledge a, a business has about their consumers, the more nuanced they can be in treating that you know, individually, hyper personalized. Um, and that's that's the I think uh, uh, the, the keyword that everybody uses. But it is at the end of the day. To the benefit of the consumer, I expect a certain behavior because um, if my bank shows me the same advertisement for the same credit card you know, 50 times in a row, that's just annoying, right? And um, they have all of the information in the world about me, so they should m know much better you know, what what to offer me than than uh, than anybody else. So, uh, okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and move on now to, to because we've got to cover um, consumers and then we've got to cover businesses and it's been such an interesting discussion and you're all making two two interesting points so it, we've only got quarter of an hour to do it so um ryan let, let's let's ask you about consumer expectation because 20 years ago we were living in this linear process where we were consuming through these these big avenues television radio newspaper there was a there, there was a one-way street of, of discovery and and personalization was quite 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 difficult and now there's a lot of personalization but 
you know, different companies are using it in different ways, some more successfully than others. We've talked about the elements of surprise and delight, but let's just talk about the base level. What, what is the kind of the base level of consumer expectation today compared to what it was like in the past? Well, I mean, I, I think consumers expect their experience to be personalized and timely, right? I mean, all the research backs that up. But I want to touch on something that we probably is uh, a couple cl clicks removed from this, which is executive comp compensation. Right. And, and the reason why I think that that's a really important topic is because I think the way that we've chosen to compensate our executives have actually created the issues that we're facing. And so back in the, the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, we would compensate executives based upon the size of the data that they had, right? And so it was really about blank carpet bombing the consumer and getting the largest data set you could to be able to reach out in the most you know, big, splashy way possible. And then we started to shift that to revenue, right? And clicks. And then the, the paradigm was, let's lean on Facebook. Let's lean on our media partners to try to be able to get that awareness. And as a result, we're just fatiguing the customers. And then we got into a world where if I give you my email address and then I get 10 emails the next day from partners of yours, I know exactly what you're doing with my email address, right? So there's a skepticism from the customer to be able to give their information away because they don't trust what brands are going to do with it. And it's based on how we chose to incent our executives within those brands. And I think that's like, as you think about an organization, you need to start shifting your thought process from the size of the data you have or the clicks, the wiggles and squiggles of the revenue creation and where it's created to, are we creating lasting value with our customers? I mean, a big part of the work that my team does is create customer lifetime value scores. We predict what future value is of a consumer and in that data, we can determine when they're going to act and when they're not going to act. And we can start to try to find those moments that are important to them from that study. It is a muscle that most organizations don't have, right? And so this argument about data completeness, data integrity, like all these things, I, I think that I personally, as a consumer, am more than willing to give every little last bit of information about myself. And I'm totally comfortable with a brand tracking me across all their web properties and all these things that brands do to be able to get a leg up, I'm okay with that. I just don't want that brand to take that data and use it for things outside of what I expect of them, right? And I think that the, the, the phenomenon that we're experiencing is just going to take time because customer sentiment has built up for years. And then when an ignorant customer comes in and they realize, oh, you've been looking at every time I come to your website and, and you're using that to be able to determine what to put in front of me, like consumers that don't live in this world that we live in, they get freaked out by that. But ultimately at the end of the day, I think that's temporary. I think, I think it's gonna go away as long as we can be good stewards of the information of the, of the consumers that we work with. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's my point of view. That's yeah, that's su that's super interesting, especially the the, the exact compensation point. Now, Nadia, let, just very briefly, I can totally understand why personalized uh, advertising, personalized targeting, is is greatly beneficial to businesses, uh, both small and large. But what is the evidence that consumers on Facebook really value personalized advertising? I, isn't I mean, for example. You know, if you switch off tracking, as lots of people have, mm -hmm. that hasn't led to a particular decline in your 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 user base. What what is the evidence that they really your membership really values personalization? So I I believe that with the switch off tracking that you're talking about is about off Facebook activity, right? Where we give back control to the user to wipe off all their Facebook activity. And they can get it back at any time. Is that? I just want to clarify the question. Oh no, sorry. I was. I should have been more specific. I was referring to uh, the, the the iOS um, ability now that you have to switch off the ability for Facebook and other websites to to, to track you. Ah, okay. I think you know uh, on the iOS. I I think the numbers are still very early, so I, I can't I can't comment on that. Uh, but I think we did we did a survey uh, on one of them. Like I think one of the seasonal holiday studies last year, and we found that like 
people love getting personalized items, right? They enjoy discovering things that they kind of didn't look for, but the product found them. And, and as, as, as consumers, and as you talk to your friends, like when you get things that is not personalized to you, you kind of get annoyed. It's like the amount of information you get is, like, um, is, is a balance between getting overwhelmed or overjoyed with something. 71% of people hate it when like the experience with a brand is impersonal. I don't like it that my, I'm still, my daughter is eight years old. I'm still getting diaper ads. That is just annoying. <laughs> but if I get something that, um, that is personal to me, like I, I don't need an under sink organizer. I didn't know that I needed it until I found it on Instagram, which is amazing. I love organizing things. And like, this is a product that I never found. And like, that is like the highlight of last week for me. So like, I think people have infinite choice on the internet. In the past, when I wanted to make pineapple tarts for Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year, I pull up a recipe, right? And I pick the one that is favorite. Now I have every recipes ever on, on that ever been invented on, on the internet. There's information overload, there's infinite choice. And I want to curate that experience when I go online. And I'm, I'm sure that I'm not alone. A lot of people have this information overload and they seek for this curation, this personalized experience. Thank Wait, you. Can I say something? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm breaking the rules. Yeah, I, sure, you can go for it. The, the context is super important. Context is so important. So I go to Facebook, I go to Instagram to discover things, right? I think that's a really important concept. And if I get served an ad, I'm totally down with that because I'm there just for discovery. But in other contexts, it's different. And so now trust takes on a different life and it means something different to those consumers. And I think that brands need to recognize the context in which they're delivering personalization as the key driver for whether it's going to resonate or not. Um, okay, that's, that's great. I'm glad you butted in. That was a great point. Okay, so let's, let's, let's move on to businesses now, because I think a lot of the conversations in the media especially being focused around privacy and, and the impact on, on consumers. But, but let, let's talk a bit about the impact on businesses and how businesses and SMEs can use uh, data and AI to, to, to find customers that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to find. And, and, and maybe Michael, let's, let's start with you on that. Yeah, I think uh, especially SMEs are uh, a little bit in a disadvantage in the world today, right? So we have the the mega players, the mega platforms that that are in uh, in the pole position to to use data, and and they have also been probably on the front uh, page news, uh, you, know, um, you know, probably one more time than they than, than they really care to. Um, I mean, we have uh, Facebook here, we have Salesforce here, so those are I think strong big players, and then they have everybody else, the smaller shops, but. Um, on one side, I think they're in a disadvantage to the larger players because they're not as sophisticated in using data. They're not, they don't have the, the depth of you know, collecting the right data and making the right predictions. But at the end of the day, they, they could also turn this into an advantage to be the small guy because they know the customer most often much more precisely and much better. And then it comes back to uh, a much more nuanced you know, engagement at the right time uh, the the question is just how do they engage and, and what's the right timing um, rather than I think collecting more data in in, in mass and the the uh, the timing of the interaction there is, is probably very important and like Ryan mentioned earlier it's okay they will not gain a hundred percent of my wallet share that's that's fine a small shop is is okay in its local neighborhood but they know me much more precisely so for them it's more about the timing and using the smaller amount. So I think uh, we need to make sure that we enable the smaller players just as, as much as the larger, I think, uh, uh, organizations have already learned to, to leverage our data. And, and do, you, do you think um, that uh, technology uh, and the development of technology in this space is going to allow many more businesses to kind of achieve this have your cake and eat it type of technology, which as Nadia says, allows personalization, but protects privacy at the same time. Are we moving towards that kind of Elysium goal? 
Absolutely, I think that's the the key key question here. So how do we how do we leverage technology to be you know less intrusive, more delightful? Um, and and many consumers also have I think a, a false perception that I need to give up all of my data to get it, uh, to to gain the benefit. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And I think technology is our key. Um, to, to make that happen. There, there are certain technologies available today. Uh, we're still in early stages, like look at federated learning, for example, and, and it's kind of an AI technique where instead of you know, sending the data around, sending all the data to a central place and analyzing it, uh, the model, you know, the prediction model comes to me and uh, you learn on a smaller set of data, but you learn on, you know, with, on, on that set of data without giving the, out the control of that data, without sharing the data in, in, in the first place. So I think those are research topics that are you know, fairly early stage still, but I think that can make a significant difference. Um, there's many, many other ones in, in that context, like um, zero knowledge proofs or trusted ex execution environments. You know, everybody is used to their mobile phone you know, using the hardware for, for biometric and authentication. It's, it's second nature these days. Well, that, that's freak. So, sorry, and no, homomorphic. I'm... Maybe the final, final, final element I wanted to mention is homomorphic encryption, right? To perform computation on encrypted data rather than decrypted and you know, put it in the open. But so we have some of those elements in place today, but we haven't solved the question yet. That's really interesting, and I suppose that that that, that there's a big incentive to this technology to progress as as uh, regulatory authorities around the world step up there. Uh, their drives towards, towards privacy laws. But uh, so I want to just come to, to, to Daryl on this point, and then perhaps we could kind of go around with a closing question about uh, the trade off between personalization and privacy and how we get a win win situation uh, out of that. But Daryl, just on the businesses point, t t tell me a bit about how e commerce businesses like yours are, are, are helping particularly smaller businesses. Uh, it, as a result of offering them the ability to, 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 to personalize and to target in a way that hasn't, hasn't been uh, available before. Hmm. I, I, thank you, Alexi. Uh, I think part of, part of the, the change that we have realized as well uh, is that rather than you know, to provide recommendations directly to the SME businesses and, and kind of you know, teach them, advise them on what to do, uh, there is perhaps also value in providing them with the tools at which they can analyze their own data. Right. So, so instead of you know, us providing a more, uh, an intrusive or somewhat you know, a seemingly intrusive kind of recommendations, what we do is to provide them access to a dashboard, a dashboard that, that data is encrypted on our side. So actually even our own staff cannot uh, look at a lot of all these data, but the SME owners themselves would be able to, to utilize the tools of a larger platform, uh, which you know, they might otherwise not have access to in terms of the cost and also in terms of having the manpower to actually operate such data analytics. So, so they can then you know, uh, kind of look at some of these numbers and decide you know, what are the products that are selling better on their, on their shops. Uh, and you know, maybe from their e-commerce shops point of view, maybe some of the products that they can marry, marry condo on. Right. So yeah. That's, that's, that's really, really, that's really <laughs> interesting. Uh, um, uh, I love the idea of a, an encrypted dashboard. That's that's great. Okay, so time for the time for the final question. Can you paint us a picture of how you see the trade-off between personalization and privacy in a way that evolves towards a win-win situation for consumers and businesses? And since Nadia has her yellow hand up, uh, her Zoom yellow hand up, uh, let's start with her first. Yeah, so I wanted to jump in on the SME point because it's a topic of passion of mine. I come from a family of entrepreneurs in Indonesia, and I know how hard it is for an SME to go online in the past. Not so long ago, right? Setting up a website is super expensive. And especially like my dad wanted to go overseas to sell his furniture. We're Indonesian. And it was really hard. It was a very expensive affair to expand overseas. But today, any business can set up storefront on Facebook if they have a phone and with a few dollars target the customer that matters to them. So I see every day, you know, and I, I used to run our small medium businesses team in Facebook, and I see every day like the jobs that's being created, the economy that's being grown because of this. So I truly believe that creating pre personalization is worth preserving. And the answer lies in technology. So back to my point earlier on about like we need technology. Technology is the answer, like, like essentially like a portfolio of technology to offer that privacy while allowing personalization for the small businesses and to, and 
and also to delight the customer. And privacy enhancing technology can actually bring enhanced performance, right? With one of the Facebook technology, I don't want to go into the technical detail of it, but we have what we call conversion API. It's a tool designed to help business maintain data privacy while uh, developing personalized ads. So the businesses that is tagged into this uh, CAPI is able to co control what data they want to share. And actually, uh, uh, we have a lot of case studies. One of it is uh, Malaysian case studies where they actually get 10% lower costs by employing this particular technology rather than a pixel based technology. So I just want to, I just want to, you know, push the point here that like privacy and personalization can exist and privacy enhancing technology does not mean a lower performance. It can actually be better. Yeah, the holy grail. Okay, um, Ryan. Yeah, I, I think we're punch drunk on the concept of AI right now. And, and we're applying it in ways that we don't fully understand. I think at the end of the day, consumers are looking for either intimacy or convenience, right? Amazon is obviously winning on the convenience battle, but for a small business, that intimacy is really a competitive advantage. And when we study data across the entire consumer journey, whether it's a, you know, an advertising piece on in, in the open web or it's direct to consumer communications, we find that there's typically four to five things across that journey that are really gonna move the needle for a customer and, and the business. And so my, my take is, is that the idea of permission, idea of hyper-personalization is going to start to settle down over the next decade as consumers and businesses start to educate themselves more and more. But I will go back to my original point. If you can find the moments that matter most to your consumer in the time that's, that's contextually relevant, um, you can really uh, expand your business pretty quickly. And to do that, I, I think you just have to have people that do some math behind the scenes and because they will inform how to implement the technology versus have the technology inform you how to run your business. I think those are, you know, turning over rocks to figure out where revenue is at versus turning over rocks to figure out where it came from. You got to find the balance between that um, uh, as you work every day with your consumers. So my plea is understand your customers, right? Understand them deeply. And as a small business, you can ask them. As a bigger business, you have to look at data and then use that to create a hypothesis to, again, ask them. Ask your customers. They'll tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl. Yeah. So very quickly, um, I think the data ecosystem of the world is one that relies a lot on collaboration. Collaboration between private companies, between regulators, and also between the consumers. Right? And, and I think you know, a lot of communication is warranted to really help people different parties to understand how personal information is being utilized so that there is also that value creation and value communication. I guess at the at my, my final point would also be the citizens themselves would definitely, the, the online citizens would definitely start dividing themselves between those who prefer convenience and those who value privacy a little bit more. And I think to each their own, right? And I think let's give them a choice. Let's continue to collaborate, communicate. And I think perhaps, you know, that would be uh, somewhat when the when the entire dust kind of dies down yeah. thank you so much and 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 lastly uh michael so uh, yeah i think this this was already a, a very very good summary of of our panel and maybe i'll i'll, I'll take the the data science angle being being kind of a data scientist and uh, kdd being one of the, the the top data science conferences that i've uh, personally been involved in for many many years I think the technology will be coming to the rescue here. Um, that doesn't have to be a trade-off between privacy and personalization um, if we get the tech in the background right. Right. Uh, I'm sure everybody here remembers the early days of the internet, uh, where you know we we didn't really think twice about going on a website without HTTPS, without SSL, and you know put in our information, right? Even putting in credit card information, because people didn't really have any other choices, right? Um, today, this is unthinkable, right? Today, you have encryption all the way. Nobody is hopefully uh, uh, um, uh, careless enough to, to save passwords in an unencrypted database. You know, it still happens once in a while and it, and it usually ends up on the front page news. But we've, we've gotten used to encryption and data um, protection online quite quite a bit. And I think we'll, we'll have the same trend for personalization and privacy in, in terms of your personal data. 
today we're kind of sharing it, um, you know, more of a laissez-faire uh, environment, kind of the Wild West still, early days. Uh, in 10 years from now, we'll probably have privacy preserving uh, measurements in place and everybody's going to take for granted that the, the businesses behind the scenes will also adhere to that fact. Um, I think the regulators will force that act. Uh, the consumers will become more educated and will force the businesses to, to adopt. Um, so uh, I think I'm an optimist and I'm a data scientist. So technology in this case to the rescue, AI to the rescue, hopefully. And uh, we'll, we'll have a, a much more delightful future with the right interaction at the right time and not too many annoyed, annoyed consumers at the end of the day. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Michael, and to, to, to everybody that, that joined this panel. Thank you to Temasek and, and KDD. Technology to the rescue is quite a good message to end uh, in a data conference. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a it was a fascinating discussion. Five different time zones. We heard about Nadia's uh, parents' business. We, we we heard about Ryan's grandmother and uh, the the loud discussions that his family had. And we, you know, it is it, it was peppered with interesting observations about a, a crucial uh, topic for both businesses and consumers. So thank you very much to everybody who joined, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful panel. I think this is really insightful. And this concludes our trust day today. And I'm sure all of you has benefited a lot from all the wonderful talks and panels. And indeed, trust is um, a, a topic that is uh, growing uh, and uh, with growing uh, uh, importance. And everybody is paying attention to that. And really, I mean, people on in all the different industries on different frontier can pull together their wisdom, uh, try to improve this. And I believe Trust Day uh, will continue to be a very important popular theme day for KDD in the years to come. Um, so today I wanna to thank all, again, all the speakers and the panelists who contributed to this program. And I want to thank Tomasic for organizing the three wonderful panels. I wanna thank the staff member who's behind the scene to make all this happen. And last but not least, I want to thank all the audience for spending time today uh, to joining our uh, special day. And I wish you a very memorable experience at KDD for the rest of the time. Um, thank you and bye-bye.